Around the World in Eighty Days, by Jules Verne, Chapter One, in which Phileas Fogg and Passepartout accept each other, one is master, the other is man. Mr. Phileas Fogg lived in 1872 at No. 7 Seville Row, Burlington Gardens, the house in which Sheraton died in 1814. He was one of the most noticeable members of the Reform Club, though he seemed always to avoid attracting attention, an enigmatical personage about whom little was known, except that he was a polished man of the world. People said that he resembled Byron, at least, that is, his head was Byronic, but he was a bearded, tranquil Byron, who might live on a thousand years without growing old. Certainly an Englishman, it was more doubtful whether Phileas Fogg was a Londoner. He was never seen on change, nor at the bank, nor in the counting-rooms of the city. No ships ever came into London docks of which he was the owner. He had no public employment. He had never been entered in any of the inns of court, either at the Temple, or Lincoln's Inn, or Gray's Inn. Nor had his voice ever resounded in the Court of Chancery, or in the Exchequer, or in the Queen's Bench, or the Ecclesiastical Courts. He certainly wasn't a manufacturer, nor was he a merchant or a gentleman farmer. His name was strange to the scientific and learned societies, and he never was known to take part in the sage deliberations of the Royal Institution, or the London Institution, the Artisans' Association, or the Institution of Arts and Sciences. He belonged, in fact, to none of the numerous societies which swarmed the English capital, from the harmonic to that of the entomologists, founded mainly for the purpose of abolishing pernicious insects. Phileas Fogg was a member of the Reform, and that was all. The way in which he got admission to the exclusive club was simple enough. He was recommended by the Barings, with whom he had an open credit. His checks were regularly played, at sight from his account current, which was always flush. Was Phileas Fogg rich? Undoubtedly. But those who knew him best could not imagine how he made his fortune, and Mr. Fogg was the last person whom to apply for the information. He was not lavish, nor, on the contrary, avaricious. For whenever he knew that money was needed for a noble, useful, or benevolent purpose, he supplied it quietly and sometimes anonymously. He was, in short, the least communicative of men. He talked very little, and it seemed all the more mysterious for his taciturn manner. His daily habits were quite open to the observation. But whatever he did was so exactly the same thing that he had always done before that the wits of those curious were fairly puzzled. Had he travelled? It was likely, for no one seemed to know the world more familiarly. There was no spot so secluded that he did not have appeared to have an intimate acquaintance with it. He often corrected, with a few clear words, the thousand conjectures advanced by members of the club as to the lost and unheard-of travellers, pointing out the true probabilities, and seeming as if gifted with a sort of second sight. So often did events justify his predictions, he must have travelled everywhere, at least in the spirit." It was at least certain that Phileas Fogg had not absented himself from London for many years. Those who were honoured by a better acquaintance with him than the rest declared that nobody could pretend to have ever seen him anywhere else. His sole pastimes were reading the papers and playing whist. He often won at this game, which, as a silent one, harmonised with his nature. But his winnings never went into his purse. Being reserved as a fund for his charities, Mr. Fogg played not to win, but for the sake of playing— the game was in his eyes a contest, a struggle with difficulty, yet a motionless, unwearying struggle congenial to his tastes. Phileas Fogg was not known to have either wife or children, which may happen to the most honest people, either relatives or near friends, which is certainly more unusual. He lived alone in his house at Seville Row, with an unpenetrated. A single domestic sufficed to serve him. He breakfasted and dined at the club, at hours mathematically fixed, in the same room, at the same table, never taking his meals with other members, much less bringing a guest with him, and went home exactly at midnight, only to retire at once to bed. He never used the cosy chambers which the reform provides for its favoured members. He passed ten hours out of the twenty-four in Seville Row, either in sleeping or making his toilet. When he chose to take a walk it was with a regular step in the entrance hall with its mosaic flooring, or in the circular gallery with its dome supported by twenty red periphery ionic columns, and illuminated by blue-painted windows. When he breakfasted or dined, all the resources of the club, its kitchens and pantries, its buttery and dairy, aided to crowd his table with their most succulent stores. He was served by the gravest waiters, in dress coats and shoes with swanskin soles, 
who proffered the viands in special of porcelain, and on the finest linen club decanters of a lost mould contained his sherry, his port, and his cinnamon-spiced claret, while his beverages were refreshingly cooled with ice, brought at great cost from the American lakes. If to live in this style is to be eccentric, it must be confessed that there is something good in eccentricity. The mansion in Seville Row, though not sumptuous, was exceedingly comfortable. The habits of its occupants were such as to demand but little from the sole domestic. But Phileas Fogg required him to be almost superhumanly prompt and regular. On this very second of October, he had dismissed James Forster, because that luckless youth had brought him shaving water at eighty-four degrees Fahrenheit instead of eighty-six, and he was awaiting his successor, who was due at the house between eleven and half-past. Phileas Fogg was seated squarely in his armchair, his feet close together like those of a grenadier on a parade, his hands resting on his knee, his body straight, his head erect. He was steadily watching a complicated clock, which indicated the hours, the minutes, the seconds, the days, the months, and the years. At exactly half-past eleven, Mr. Fogg would, according to his daily habit, quit Seville Row and repair to the reform. A rap at this moment sounded on the door of the cosy apartment where Phileas Fogg was seated, and James Forster, the dismissed servant, appeared. "'The knave's servant,' said he. A young man of thirty advanced and bowed. "'You are a Frenchman, I believe,' asked Phineas Fogg, "'and your name is Jean.' "'Jean, if monsieur pleases,' replied the newcomer. "'Jean Passaporte, a surname which has clung to me "'because I have a natural aptness for going out of one business into another. "'I believe I'm honest, monsieur, but to be outspoken I've had several trades. "'I've been an itinerant singer, a circus rider, "'when I used to vote like Leotard and dance on the rope like Blondin. "'Then I got to be professor of gymnastics, "'so to make better use of my talents I was a sergeant fireman at Paris.' and assisted many a big fire, but I quitted France five years ago, and wishing to taste the sweets of domestic life, took service here as a valet in England. Finding myself out of place, and hearing that Monsieur Phileas Fogg was the most exact and settled gentleman in the United Kingdom, I have come to Monsieur in the hope of living with him a tranquil life, and forgetting even the name of Passepartout. Passepartout suits me, responded Mr. Fogg. You are well recommended to me. I hear a good report of you. You know my conditions? "'Yes, monsieur. Good. What time is it?' Twenty-two minutes after I live on,' returned Passepartout, drawing an enormous silver watch from the depths of his pocket. "'You're too slow,' said Mr. Fogg. Uh, "'Pardon me, monsieur. It's impossible. You are four minutes too slow. No matter. It's enough to mention the year. Now, from this moment, twenty-nine minutes after eleven a.m., this Wednesday, 2nd October, you are in my service.' Phileas Fogg got up, took his hat in his left hand, put it on his head with an automatic motion, and went off without a word. Passepartout heard the street door shut once. It was his new master going out. He heard it shut again. It was his predecessor, James Forster, departing in his turn. Passepartout remained alone in the house in Seville Row. End of chapter 1. Read by David Russell. For Lit to Go. Available on the web at fcit.usf.edu. Around the World in Eighty Days, by Jules Verne. Chapter 2, in which Passepartout is convinced that he has at last found his ideal. Faith, muttered Passepartout, somewhat flurried, I've seen people at Madame Toussaint's as lively as my new master. Madame Toussaint's people, let it be said, are of wax, and are much visited in London. Speech is all that is wanting to make them human. During his brief interview with Mr. Fogg, Passepartout had been carefully observing him, he appeared to be a man about forty years of age, with fine, handsome features, and a tall, well-shaped figure. His hair and whiskers were light, his forehead compact and unwrinkled, his face rather pale, his teeth magnificent, his countenance possessed in the highest degree what physiognomists call a repose in action, a quality of those who act rather than talk. Calm and phlegmatic, with a clear eye, Mr. Fogg seemed a perfect type of that English composure which Angelica Kaufman had so skillfully represented on canvas. Seen in the various phases of his daily life, he gave the idea of being perfectly well-balanced, as exactly regulated as a Leroy chronometer. Phileas Fogg was indeed exactitude personified, and this was betrayed even in the expression of his very hands and feet, for in men as well in animals, the limbs themselves are expressions of their passions." He was so exact that he was never in a hurry, was always ready, and was economical alike in his steps and his motions. He never took one step too many, 
and always went to his destination by the shortest cut. He made no superfluous gestures, and was never seen to be moved or agitated. He was the most deliberate person in the world, yet always reached his destination at the exact moment. He lived alone and, so to speak, outside of every social relation, and as he knew that his world account must be taken into a friction, and that a friction retards, he never rubbed against anybody. As for Passporteau, he was a true Parisian of Paris. Since he had abandoned his own country for England, taking service as a valet, he had in vain searched for a master after his own heart. Passepartout was by no means one of those pert dunces despised my Bollier, with a bold gaze and a nose held high in the air. He was an honest fellow, with a pleasant face, lips a trifle protruding, soft-mannered and serviceable, with a good round head, such as one likes to see on the shoulders of a friend. His eyes were blue, his complexion rubicund, and his figure most portly and well-built, his body muscular, and his physical powers fully developed by the exercises of his younger days. His brown hair was somewhat tumbled, for while the ancient sculptors are said to have known eighteen methods of arranging Minerva's tresses, Passepartout is familiar with but one of dressing his own. Three strokes of a large toothed clune completed his toilet. It would be rash to predict how Passepartout's lively nature would agree with Mr. Fogg. It was impossible to tell whether the new servant would turn out as absolutely methodical as his master required. Experience alone could solve the question. Passepartout had been a sort of vagrant in his early years, and now yearned for repose, but so far he had failed to find it, though he had already served in ten English houses, but he could not take root in any of these. With chagrin he found his masters invariably whimsical and irregular, constantly running about the country or on the lookout for adventure. His last master, young Lord Longferry, member of Parliament after passing his nights in the Haymarket taverns, was too often brought home in the morning on policemen's shoulders. Passepartout, desirous of a respecting gentleman whom he deserved, ventured a mild remonstrance on such conduct, which, being ill-received, he took leave, hearing that Mr. Phileas Fogg was looking for a servant, and that his life was one of unbroken regularity, that he never travelled nor stayed from home overnight. He felt sure that this would be the place he was after. He presented himself and was accepted, as he had been seen. At half-past eleven, then... Passepartout found himself alone in the house at Seville Row. He began his inspection without delay, scouring it from cellar to garret. So clean, well arranged, solemn a mansion pleased him. It seemed to him like a snail shell lighted and warmed by gas, which sufficed for both those purposes. When Passepartout reached the second story, he recognized at once the room which he was to inhabit, and he was well satisfied with it. Electric bells and speaking tubes afforded communication with the lower stories, while on the mantel stood an electric clock, precisely like that in Mr. Fogg's bedchamber, both beating the same second at the same instant. "'That's good. That'll do,' said Passepartout to himself. He suddenly observed, hung over the clock, a card which, upon inspection, proved to be a program of the daily routine of the house. It comprised all that was required of the servant, from eight in the morning, exactly at which our Phileas Fogg rose, till half-past eleven, when he left the house for the Reform Club. All the details of service, the tea and toast at twenty-three minutes past eight, the shaving water at thirty-seven minutes past nine, and the toilet at twenty minutes before ten. Everything was regulated and foreseen that was to be done from half-past eleven a.m. till midnight, the hour at which the methodical gentleman retired. Mr. Fogg's wardrobe was amply supplied and in the best taste. Each pair of trousers, coat, and vest bore a number, indicating the time of year and season at which they were in turn to be laid out for wearing, and the same system was applied to the master's shoes. In short, the house in Seville Row, which must have been a very temple of disorder and unrest under the illustrious but dissipated Sheridan, was cozy discomfort and method idealized. There was no study, nor were there books, which would have been quite useless to Mr. Fogg, for the reformed two libraries, one of the general literature and the other of law and politics, were at his service. A moderate-sized safe stood in his bedroom, constructed so as to defy fire as well as burglars, but Passepartout found neither arms nor hunting weapons anywhere. Everything betrayed the most tranquil and peaceable habits. Having scrutinized the house from top to bottom, he rubbed his hands a broad smile overspread his features, and he said joyfully, "'This is just what I wanted. Ah, we shall get on together, Mr. Fogg and I. What a domestic and regular gentleman. A real machine. Well, I don't mind serving a machine.'" End of chapter 2. Read by David Russell. For Lit to Go.
Available on the web at fcit.usf.edu. Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne, Chapter 3, in which a conversation takes place which seems likely to cost Phileas Fogg dear. Phileas Fogg, having shut the door of his house at half-past eleven, and having put his right foot before his left five hundred and seventy-five times, and his left foot before his right five hundred and seventy-six times, reached the Reform Club, an imposing edifice in Pall Mall, which could not have cost less than three millions. He repaired at once to the dining-room, the nine windows of which opened upon a tasteful garden, where the trees were already gilded with autumn colouring, and took his place at the habitual table, the cover of which had already been laid for him. His breakfast consisted of a side dish, a broiled fish with ridding sauce, a scarlet slice of roast beef garnished with mushrooms, a rhubarb and gooseberry tart, and a morsel of Cheshire cheese, the whole being washed down with several cups of tea, for which the reform is famous. He rose at thirteen minutes to one, and directed his steps towards the large hall, a sumptuous apartment adorned with lavishly framed paintings. A flunky handed him an uncut times, which he proceeded to cut with a skill which betrayed familiarity with his delicate operation. The perusal of this paper absorbed Phileas Fogg until about a quarter before four, whilst the standard, his next task, occupied him till the dinner hour. Dinner passed as breakfast had done, and Mr. Fogg reappeared in the reading room, and sat down to the palm mall at twenty minutes before six. Half an hour later, several members of the Reform came in and drew up into the fireplace, where a coal fire was steadily burning. They were Mr. Fogg's usual partners at Whist, Andrew Stewart, an engineer, John Sullivan and Samuel Fellantin, bankers, Thomas Flanagan, a brewer, and Guthier Ralph, one of the directors of the Bank of England, all rich and highly respectable personages, even in a club which compromises the princes of English trade and finance. "'Well, Ralph,' says Thomas Flanagan, "'what about that robbery?' Ooh, replied Stuart, the punk will lose money. On the contrary, broke in Ralph, I hope we may put our hands on that robber. Skilful detectives have been sent to all the principal ports of America and the continent, and he'll be a clever fellow if he slips through their fingers. But you haven't got to robber's description, asked Stuart. In the first place, he's no robber at all, returned Ralph positively. What? A fellow makes off with fifty-five thousand pounds, no robber? No. Perhaps a manufacturer, then? The Daily Telegraph says that he's a gentleman. It was Phileas Fogg, whose head now emerged from behind his newspapers, who made this remark. He bowed to his friends, and entered into the conversation. The affair which formed its subject, which was now town talk, had occurred three days before at the Bank of England. A package of banknotes to the value of fifty-five thousand pounds had been taken from the principal cashier's table. That functionary being at the moment engaged in registering the receipt of three shillings and sixpence. Of course, he could not have his eyes everywhere. Let it be observed that the Bank of England reposes a touching confidence in the honesty of the public. There are neither guards nor gratings to protect its treasures. Gold, silver, banknotes are freely exposed, and at the mercy of the first comer. A keen observer of English customs relates that, being in one of the rooms of the bank one day, he had the curiosity to examine a gold ingot weighing some seven or eight pounds. He took it up scrutinized it, passed it to his neighbor, he to the next man, and so on until the ingot, going from hand to hand, was transferred to the end of a dark entry, nor did it return to its place for a half hour. Meanwhile, the cashier had not much as raised his head, but in the present instance of things had not gone so smoothly. The package of notes had not been found when five o'clock sounded from the ponderous clock in the drawing office. The amount was passed to the account of profit and loss, and as soon as the robbery was discovered, picked detectives hastened off to Liverpool, Glasgow, Harve, Suez, Brisbane, New York, and other ports, inspired by the proffered reward of two thousand pounds and five per cent on the sum that might be recovered. Detectives were also charged with narrowly watching those who arrived at or left London by rail, and a judicial examination was once entered upon. There were real grounds for supposing, as the Daily Telegraph said, that the thief did not belong to a professional band. On the day of the robbery, a well-dressed gentleman of polished manners and a well-to-do air had been observed going to and fro in the paying room where the crime was committed. A description of him was easily procured and sent to the detectives, and some hopeful spirits, of whom Ralph was one, did not despair of his apprehension. 
The papers and clubs were full of the affair, and everywhere the people were discussing the probabilities of a successful pursuit, and the Reform Club was especially agitated, several of its members being bank officials. Ralph would not concede that the work of the detectives was likely to be in vain, for he thought that the prize offered would greatly stimulate their zeal and activity. But Stuart was far from sharing this confidence, and, as they placed themselves at the whist table, they continued to argue the matter. Stuart and Flanagan played together, while Phileas Fogg had Felenton for his partner. As the game proceeded, the conversation ceased, excepting between the rubbers where it revived again. "'I maintain,' said Stuart, "'that the chances are in favour of the thief, who must be a shrewd fellow.' "'Well, where can he fly to?' asked Ralph. "'No country is safe for him. Pshaw. "'Where can he go, then?' "'Oh, I don't know that. The world is big enough.' "'It was once,' said Phileas Fogg in a low tone. "'Cut, sir,' he added, handing the tards to Thomas Flanagan. "'The discussion fell during the rubber, after which stewards took up its thread. "'What do you mean by once? Has the world grown smaller?' "'Certainly,' returned Ralph. "'I agree with Mr. Fogg. The world has grown smaller.' since a man can now go around it ten times more quickly than a hundred years ago, and that's why the search for this thief will be more likely to succeed. And also why the thief can get away more easily. Be so good as to play, Mr. Stewart, said Phileas Fogg. But the incredulous Stewart was not convinced, and when the hand was finished said eagerly, You have a strange way, Ralph, of proving that the world has grown smaller, so because you can go around it in three months. In eighty days, interrupted Phileas Fogg. That is true, gentlemen added John Sullivan. Only eighty days now that the section between Rothall and Allahabad on the Great Indian Peninsula Railway has been opened. Here is the estimate made by the Daily Telegraph. From London to Suez, via Mount Sinus and Brinsdy, by rail and steamboats. Seven days from Suez to Bombay, by steamer. Thirteen from Bombay to Calcutta, by rail. Three from Calcutta to Hong Kong, by steamer. Thirteen from Hong Kong to Yokohama, by steamer. Six from Yokohama to San Francisco by steamer. Twenty-two from San Francisco to New York by whale. Seven from New York to London by steamer and whale. Nine. Total, eighty days. Yes, in eighty days, exclaimed Stuart, who in excitement made a false deal. But it doesn't take into account bad weather, contrary winds, shipwrecks, railway accidents, and so on. All included, returned Phileas Fogg, continuing to play despite the discussion. "'But suppose the Hindus or Indians pull off the rails,' replied Stuart. "'Suppose they stop the trains, pillage the luggage van, and scalp the passengers?' "'All included,' calmly retorted Fogg, adding as he threw down the cards, two trumps.' "'Stuart, whose turn it was to deal, gathered them up and went on. "'You are right, theoretically, Mr. Fogg, but practically—' "'Practically also, Mr. Stuart. "'I'd like to see you do it in eighty days. "'Depends on you. Shall we go?' Heaven preserve me, but I would wager four thousand pounds that such a journey made under these conditions is impossible. Quite possible, on the contrary, returned Mr. Fogg. We'll make it, then. The journey round the world in eighty days? Yes, I should like nothing better. When? At once. Only I warn you that I shall do it at your expense. That's absurd, cried Stuart, who was beginning to be annoyed at the persistency of his friend. Come, let's go on with the game. "'Deal over again, then,' said Phileas Fogg. "'There's a false deal.' Stuart took up the pack with a feverish hand, and then suddenly put them down again. "'Well, Mr. Fogg,' said he, "'it shall be so. I will wager the four thousand on it.' "'Calm yourself, dear Stuart,' said Fenton. "'It's only a joke.' "'Then I'll say I'll wager,' returned Stuart. "'I mean it.' "'All right,' said Mr. Fogg, and turning to the others, he continued, "'I have deposit of twenty thousand at Barrings, which I will willingly risk upon it.' Twenty thousand pounds!' cried Sullivan. Twenty thousand pounds, which you would lose by a single accidental delay.' "'The unforeseen does not exist,' quietly replied Phileas Fogg. "'But, Mr. Fogg, eighty days are the only estimate of the least possible time in which the journey can be made. A well-used minimum suffices for everything. "'But in order to not exceed it, you must jump mathematically from the trains upon the steamers, and from the steamers upon the trains again. I will jump mathematically.' "'You are joking.' "'A true Englishman doesn't joke when he's talking about so serious a thing as a wager,' replied Phileas Fogg solemnly. "'I will bet twenty thousand pounds against anyone who wishes that I will make the tour in the world in eighty days or less, in nineteen hundred and twenty hours, or a hundred and fifteen thousand two hundred minutes. Do you accept?' "'We accept,' replied Messrs. Stuart, 
Valentin, Sullivan, Flanagan, and Ralph after consulting each other. Good, said Mr. Fogg. The train leaves for Dover in a quarter before nine. I will take it. This very evening. This very evening, returned Phileas Fogg. He took out and consulted a pocket almanac, and added, As today is Wednesday, the 2nd of October, I shall be due in London in this very room of the Reform Club on Saturday, the 21st of December, at a quarter before 9 p.m., or else the twenty thousand pounds, now deposited in my name at Barings, will belong to you. In fact, and in right, gentlemen, here's a cheque for the amount. A memorandum of the wager was at once drawn up and signed by the six parties, during which Phileas Fogg reserved a stoical composure. He certainly did not bet to win, and had only staked the twenty thousand pounds, half of his fortune, because he foresaw that he might have to spend the other half to carry out this difficult, not to say unattainable, project. As for his antagonists, they seemed much agitated, not so much by the value of their stake, as because they had some scruples about betting under the conditions so difficult to their friend. The clock struck seven, and the party offered to suspend the game so that Mr. Fogg might make his preparations for departure. "'I am quite ready now,' was his tranquil response. "'Diamonds are trumps. Be so good as to play, gentlemen.'" End of chapter three. Read by David Russell. For Lit to Go. Available on the web at fcit.usf.edu. Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne. Chapter 4. In which Phileas Fogg astounds Passepartout his servant. Having won twenty guineas at whist, and taken leave of his friends, Phileas Fogg, at twenty-five minutes past seven, left the Reform Club. Passepartout, who had conscientiously studied the program of his duties, was more than surprised to see his master guilty of the inexactness of appearing at this unaccustomed hour, for, according to rule, he was not due in civil role until precisely midnight. Mr. Fogg repaired to his bedroom and called out, Passepartout! Passepartout did not reply. It could not be he who was called. It was not the right hour. Passepartout! repeated Mr. Fogg without raising his voice. Passepartout made his appearance. "'I've called you twice,' observed his master. "'But it is not midnight,' replied the other, showing his watch. "'I know it. I don't blame you. We start for Dover and Calais in ten minutes.' A puzzled grin overspread Passepartout's round face. Clearly he had not comprehended his master. "'Monsieur is going to leave home?' "'Yes,' returned Phileas Fogg. "'We are going round the world.' Passepartout opened wide his eyes, raised his eyebrows, held up his hands, and seemed about to collapse. So overcome was he with the stupefied astonishment. "'Round the world,' he murmured. "'In eighty days, so we haven't a moment to lose.' "'But the trunks!' gasped Passepartout, unconsciously swaying his head from right to left. "'We'll have no trunks, only a carpet-bag, with two shirts and three pairs of stockings for me, and the same for you. We'll buy our clothes on the way.' "'Bring down my Mackintosh and travelling cloak, and some stout shoes, though we shall do little walking. Make haste!' Passepartout tried to reply, but could not. He went out, mounted to his own room, fell into a chair, and muttered, "'That's good, that is, and I, who want to remain quiet!' He mechanically set about making preparations for departure. "'Around the world in eighty days. Was his master a fool? No. This was a joke. Then, then they were going to Dover. Good. To Callias. Good again.' After all, Passepartout, who had been away from France five years, would not be sorry to set foot on his native soil again. Perhaps they would go as far as Paris, and it would do his eyes good to see Paris once more. But surely a gentleman so cherry of his steps would stop there, no doubt. But then it was none the less true that he was going away, this so domestic person hitherto. By eight o'clock Passepartout had packed the modest carpet-bag containing the wardrobes of his master and himself, then, still troubled in mind, he carefully shut the door of his room and descended to Mr. Fogg. Mr. Fogg was quite ready. Under his arm might have been observed a red-bound copy of Bradshaw's Continental Railway Steam Transit and General Guide, with its timetable showing the arrival and departure of steamers and railways. He took the carpet-bag, opened it, and slipped into it a goodly roll of Bank of England notes, which would pass wherever he might go. "'You have forgotten nothing?' asked he. "'Nothing, monsieur. "'My Mackintosh and cloak, here they are. "'Good. Take this carpet-bag,' handing it to Passepartout. "'Take good care of it, for there are twenty thousand pounds in it.' "'Passepartout nearly dropped the bag, "'as if twenty thousand pounds were in gold and weighed him down. 
Master and man then descended. The street door was double-locked, and at the end of Seville Row they took a cab and drove rapidly to Charing Cross. The cab stopped before the whale race station at twenty minutes past eight. Passepartout jumped off the box and followed his master, who, after paying the cabman, was about to enter the station, when a poor beggar woman with a child in her arms, her naked feet smeared with mud, her head covered with a wretched bonnet, from which hung a tattered feather, and her shoulders shrouded in a ragged shawl, approached and mournfully asked for alms. Mr. Fogg took out the twenty guineas he had just won at whist, and handed them to the beggar, saying, "'Here, my good woman, I am glad that I met you.' and passed on. Passepartout had a moist sensation about the eyes. His master's action touched his susceptible heart. Two first-class tickets for Paris having been speedily purchased, Mr. Fogg was crossing the station to the train, when he perceived his five friends of the Reform. "'Well, gentlemen,' said he, "'I'm off, you see, and if you will examine my passport when I get back, you will be able to judge whether I have accomplished the journey agreed upon.' "'Oh, that would be quite unnecessary, Mr. Fogg.' said Ralph politely. We will trust your word as a gentleman of honour. You do not forget when you are due in London again, asked Stuart. In eighty days, on Saturday, the 21st of December, 1872, at a quarter before 9 p.m., good-bye, gentlemen. Phileas Fogg and his servants seated themselves in a first-class carriage at twenty minutes before nine. Five minutes later, the whistle screamed, and the train slowly glided out of that station. The night was dark. A fine, steady rain was falling. Phileas Fogg, snugly ensconced in his corner, did not open his lips. Passepartout, not yet recovered from his stupefaction, clung mechanically to the carpet-bag with its enormous treasure. Just as the train was whirring through Sydenham, Passepartout suddenly uttered a cry of despair. "'What's the matter?' asked Mr. Fogg. "'Alas, in my hurry, I, I, I forgot—' "'What?' to turn the gas off in my room. "'Very well, young man,' returned Mr. Fogg coolly. "'It will burn at your expense.'" End of chapter 4 Read by David Russell Vorlit to Go Available on the web at fcit.usf.edu Around the World in Eighty Days By Jules Verne Chapter 5 in which a new species of funds, unknown to the moneyed men, appears on change. Phileas Fogg rightly suspected that his departure from London would create a lively sensation at the West End. The news of the bet spread through the Reform Club, and afforded an exciting topic of conversation to its members. From the club it soon got to the papers throughout England. The boasted tour of the world was talked about, disputed, argued with as much warmth as if the subject were another Alabama claim. Some took sides with Phileas Fogg, but the large majority shook their heads and declared against him. It was absurd, impossible, they declared, that the tour of the world could be made, except theoretically and on paper, in this minimum of time. And with the existing means of traveling, the Times, Standard, Morning Post, and Daily News, and twenty other highly respectable newspapers, scouted Mr. Fogg's project as madness. The Daily Telegraph alone hesitatingly supported him, People in general thought him a lunatic, and blamed his Reform Club friends for having accepted a wager which betrayed the mental aberration of its proposer. Articles no less passionate than logical appeared on the question, for geography is one of the pet subjects of the English, and the columns devoted to Phileas Fogg's venture were eagerly devoured by all classes of readers. At first some rash individuals, principally of the gentler sex, espoused his cause, which became still more popular when the illustrated London News came out with his portrait, copied from a photograph in the Reform Club. A few readers of the Daily Telegraph even dared to say, Why not? After all, stranger things have come to pass. At last, a long article appeared on the 7th of October, in the bulletin of the Royal Geographic Society, who treated the question from every point of view and demonstrated the utter folly of the enterprise. Everything, it said, was against the travellers, every obstacle imposed alike by man and by nature. A miraculous agreement of the times of the departure and arrival, which was impossible, was absolutely necessary to his success. He might, perhaps, reckon on the arrival of trains at the designated hours in Europe, where the distances were relatively moderate. But when he calculated upon crossing India in three days, and the United States in seven, could he rely beyond the misgiving upon accomplishing his task? 
There were accidents to machinery. The liability of trains to run off the line, collisions, bad weather. The blocking up by snow. Were not all these against Phileas Fogg? Would not he find himself, when travelling by steamer in winter, at the mercy of the winds and fogs? Is it uncommon for the best ocean steamers to be two or three days behind time? But a single delay would suffice to fatally break the chain of communication. Should Phileas Fogg once miss, even by an hour a steamer, he would have to wait for the next, and that would irrevocably render his attempt vain. This article made a great deal of noise, and, being copied into all the papers, seriously depressed the advocates of the rash tourist. Everybody knows that England is the world of betting men, who are of a higher class than mere gamblers. To bet is in the English temperament. Not only the members of the Reform, but the general public, made heavy wagers for or against Phileas Fogg, who was set down in the betting books as if he were a racehorse. Bonds were issued, and made their appearance on change. Phileas Fogg bonds were offered at par or at a premium, and a great business was done in them. But five days after the article in the Bulletin of the Geographical Society appeared, the demand began to subside. Phileas Fogg declined. They were offered by packages at first of five, then of ten, until at last nobody would take less than twenty, fifty, a hundred. Lord Albemarle, an elderly paralytic gentleman, was now the only advocate of Phileas Fogg left. This noble lord, who was fastened to his chair, would have given his fortune to be able to make the tour of the world, if it took ten years. He bet five thousand pounds on Phileas Fogg. When the folly as well as the uselessness of adventure was pointed out to him, he consented himself with replying, the thing is feasible. The first to do it ought to be an Englishman. The fog party dwindled more and more. Everybody was going against him. And the bet stood a hundred and fifty, two hundred to one. And a week after his departure, an incident occurred which deprived him of backers at any price. The commissioner of police was sitting in his office at nine o'clock one evening when the following telegraph dispatch was put into his hands. Suez to London. Rowan, commissioner of police, Scotland Yard. I found the bank robber, Phileas Fogg. Send without delay warrant of arrest to Bombay. Fix. Detective. The effect of this dispatch was instantaneous. The polished gentleman disappeared to give place to the bank robber. His photograph, which was hung with those rest of the members of the Reform Club, was minutely examined, and it betrayed, feature by feature, the description of the robber which had been provided to the police. The mysterious habits of Phileas Fogg were recalled, his solitary ways, his sudden departure, and it seemed clear that, in undertaking a tour around the world on the pretext of a wager, he had no other end in view than to elude the detectives and throw them off his track. End of chapter 5 Read by David Russell For Lit to Go Available on the web at fcit.usf.edu Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne Chapter 6 In which Fix the Detective betrays a very natural impatience The circumstances under which this telegraphic dispatch about Phileas Fogg were sent as follows The steamer Mongolia, belonging to the Peninsular and the Oriental Company, built of iron of 2,800 tons burden and 500 horsepower, was due at 11 o'clock a.m. on Wednesday, the 9th of October, at Suez. The Mongolia plied regularly between Brindisi and Bombay via the Suez Canal, and it was one of the fastest steamers belonging to the company, always making more than ten knots an hour between Brindisi and Suez, at nine and a half between Suez and Bombay. Two men were promenading up and down the wharves among the crowd of natives and strangers who were sojourning at this once straggling village. Now, thanks to the enterprise of M. Lesseps, a fast-growing town was one of the British consuls at Suez, who, despite the prophecies of the English government and the unfavorable predictions of Stevenson, was in the habit of seeing from his office window English ships daily passing to and fro on the Great Canal, by which the old roundabout route from India to England by the Cape of Good Hope was abridged by at least a half. The other was a small, slight-built personage, with a nervous, intelligent face and bright eyes peering out from under eyebrows, which he was incessantly twitching, he was just now manifesting unmistakable signs of impatience, nervously pacing up and down, and unable to stand still for a moment. This was Fix, one of the detectives who had been dispatched from England in search of the bank robber. 
It was his task to narrowly watch every passenger who arrived at Suez, and to follow up all who seemed to be suspicious characters, or bore a resemblance to the description of the criminal, which he had received two days before from the police headquarters at London. The detective was evidently inspired by the hope of obtaining the splendid reward, which could easily be the prize of success, and awaited with a feverish impatience, easy to understand, the arrival of the steamer Mongolia. "'So you say, Consul,' he asked for the twentieth time, "'that this steamer is never behind time?' "'No, Mr. Fix,' replied the Consul. "'She was bespoken yesterday at Port Said, "'and the rest of the way is no account to such a craft. "'I repeat, the Mongolia has been in advance of the time required "'by the company's regulation, "'and gained the prize awarded for excess of speed. "'Does she come directly from Rindisi?' "'Directly from Brindisi. She takes on the Indian mails there, and she left there Saturday at 5 p.m. Have patience, Mr. Fix. She will not be late, but really I don't see how. From the description you have, you will be able to recognize your man, even if he's on board the Mongolia. A man rather feels the presence of these fellows, Consul, that recognizes them. You must have the scent for them. A scent is like a sixth sense which combines hearing, seething, smelling. I've arrested more than one of these gentlemen in my time, and if my thief is on board, I'll answer for it. He'll not slip through my fingers. I hope so, Mr. Fix, for it was a heavy robbery. A magnificent robbery, Consul. Fifty-five thousand pounds. We don't offer to have such windfalls. Burglars are getting to be so contemptible nowadays. A fellow gets hung for a handful of shillings. "'Mr. Fix,' said the Consul, "'I like your way of talking, and I hope you'll succeed, "'but I fear you'll have to find it far from easy. "'Don't you see the description of which you have "'as a singular resemblance to an honest man?' "'Counsel,' remarked the detective dogmatically, "'great robbers always resemble honest folks. "'Fellows who have rascally faces have only one course to take, "'and that is to remain honest. "'Otherwise they would be arrested offhand, "'as the artistic thing is to unmask honest countenances. "'It's no lot test, I admit, but it's real art.' "'Mr. Fix evidently was not wanting in a tinge of self-conceit. "'Little by little the scene on the quay became more animated. "'Sailors of various nations, merchants, shipbrokers, "'porters, fellas, bustled to and fro, "'as if the steamer were immediately expected. "'The weather was clear and slightly chilly.' The minarets of the town loomed above the houses in the pale rays of the sun. A jetty pier, some two thousand yards long, extended to the roadstead. A number of fishing smacks and coasting boats, some retaining the fantastic fashion of the ancient galleys, were discernible on the Red Sea. As he passed among the busy crowd, Fix, according to habit, scrutinized the passers by with a keen, rapid glance. It was now half-past ten. "'The same it didn't come!' he exclaimed as the port clock struck. "'She can't be far off now,' returned his companion. "'How long will she stop at Suez?' Four hours. Long enough to get in, in coal. "'It's thirteen hundred and ten miles from Suez to Aden, "'and the other end of the Red Sea she has to take a fresh coal supply. "'And does she go from Suez directly to Bombay? "'Without putting in anywhere. "'Good,' said Fix. "'If the robber's on foot, he will no doubt get off at Suez, "'so as to reach the Dutch or French colonies in Asia by some other route.' "'He ought to know that he would not be safe an hour in India, which is English soil. "'Unless,' objected the counsel, "'he is exceptionally shrewd. "'An English criminal, you know, is always better concealed in London than in anywhere else.' "'This observation furnished the detective food for thought. "'And meanwhile the counsel went away to his office. "'Fix, left alone, was more impatient than ever. "'Having a presentiment that the robber was on board the Mongolia, if he had indeed left London intending to reach the New World, he would naturally take the route via India, which was less watched and more difficult to watch than that of the Atlantic. But Fix's reflections were soon interrupted by a succession of sharp whistles, which announced the arrival of the Mongolia. The porters and fellows rushed down to the quay, and a dozen boats pushed off from the shore to go and meet the steamer. Soon her gigantic hull appeared passing along between the banks, and eleven o'clock struck as she anchored in the road. She brought an unusual number of passengers, some of whom remained on deck to scan the picturesque panorama of the town, while the greater part disembarked in boats and landed on the quay. Fix took up a position, and carefully examined each face and figure which made its appearance. Presently, one of the passengers, after vigorously pushing his way through the importunate crowd of porters, came up to him and politely asked if he could point out the English consulate, at the same time showing a passport which he wished to have visaed. Fix instinctively took the passport, and with a rapid glance read the description of its bearer. 
An involuntary emotion of surprise nearly escaped him, for the description in the passport was identical with that of the bank robber which he had received from Scotland Yard. "'Is this your passport?' asked he. "'No, it's my master's.' "'And your master is... instead on board. "'But he must go to the councils in persons, so as to establish his identity. "'Oh, is that necessary? Quite indispensable. "'And where is the consulate?' "'There, on the corner of the square,' said Fix, pointing to a house two hundred steps off. "'I'll go and fetch my master, who won't be much pleased, however, to be disturbed.' "'The passenger bowed to Fix, and returned to the steamer.' End of chapter 6. Read by David Russell. For Lit to Go. Available on the web at fcit.usf.edu. Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne. Chapter 7. Which once more demonstrates the uselessness of passports as aids to detectives. The detective passed down the quay and rapidly made his way to the council's office, where he was at once admitted to the presence of that official. Council, he said without preamble, of strong reasons for believing that my man is a passenger on the Mongolia, and he narrated what had just passed concerning the passport. Well, Mr. Fix, replied the council, I shall not be sorry to see the rascal's face, but perhaps he won't come here. That is, if he is the person you suppose him to be, a robber doesn't quite like to leave traces of his flight behind him, and besides, he's not obliged to have his passport countersigned. If he's as shrewd as all think he is, council, he will come. To have his passport visaed? Yes, passports are only good for annoying honest folks, and aiding in the flight of rogues. I assure you, it would be quite the thing for him to do, but I hope you would not visa the passport. Why not? The passport's genuine. I have no right to refuse. Still, I must keep this man here until I can get a warrant to arrest him from London. Ah, that's your lookout. But I cannot... The council did not finish his sentence. For as he spoke, a knock was heard at the door. Two strangers entered, one of whom was the servant who Fix had met on the quay. The other, who was his master, held out his passport with a request that the consul could do him the favour to visa it. The consul took the document and carefully read it, whilst Fix observed, or rather devoured, the stranger with his eyes from the corner of a room. "'You are Mr. Phineas Fogg,' said the consul, after reading their passport. "'I am. And this man is your servant.' He's a Frenchman named Passepartout. You're from London? Yes. And you are going to Bombay? Very good, sir. You know that a visa is useless and that no passport is required. I know it, sir, replied Phileas Fogg, but I wish to prove by your visa that I came by Suez. Very well, sir. The consul proceeded to sign and date the passport, after which he added his official seal. Mr. Fogg paid the customary fee, coldly bowed, and went out followed by his servant. "'Well?' queried the detective. "'Well, he looks and acts like a perfectly honest man,' replied the consul. "'Possibly. But that is not the question. Do you think, consul, that this phlegmatic gentleman resembles feature by feature the rubber whose description I have received?' "'I concede that, but then you know all descriptions. I'll make certain of it.' interrupted Fix. The servant seems to me less mysterious than the master. Besides, he's a Frenchman, and can't help talking. Excuse me for a little while, Consul. Fix started off in search of Passportel. Meanwhile, Mr. Fogg, after leaving the consulate, prepared to the quay, gave some orders to Passportel, went off to the Mongolia in a boat, and descended to his cabin. He took up his notebook, which contained the following memoranda. Left London Wednesday, October 2nd, at 8.45 p.m. Reached Paris Thursday, October 3rd, at 7.20 a.m. Left Paris Thursday, at 8.40 a.m. Reached Turin by Montsinus Friday, October 4th, at 6.35 a.m. Left Turin Friday, at 7.20 a.m. Arrived at Brindisi Saturday, October 5th, at 4 p.m. Sailed on the Mongolia Saturday, at 5 p.m. Reached Suez Wednesday, October 9th, at 11 a.m. Total hours spent... 158, or in days, six days and a half. These dates were inscribed in an itinerary divided into columns, indicating the month, the day of the month, and the day of the stipulated and actual arrivals at each principal point, Paris, Brindisi, Suez, Bombay, Calcutta, Singapore, Hong Kong, Yokohama, San Francisco, New York, and London, from the 2nd of October to the 21st of December, and giving a space for setting down the gain made or the loss suffered on the arrival at each locality. This methodical record thus contained an account of everything needed, and Mr. Fogg always knew whether he was behindhand or in advance in his time. 
On this Friday, October 9th, he noted his arrival at Suez, and observed that he had as yet neither gained nor lost. He sat down quietly to breakfast in his hand, and never once thinking of inspecting the town, being one of those Englishmen who are wont to see foreign countries through the eyes of their domestics. End of chapter 7. Read by David Russell. For Lit's Ago. Available on the web at fcit.usf.edu. Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne. Chapter 8 in which Passepartout talks rather more, perhaps, than is prudent. Fix soon, rejoined Passepartout, who was lounging and looking about on the quay, as if he did not feel that he, at least, was obliged to not see anything. Where, well, my friend, said the detective, coming up with him, is your passport visa? Ah, too, it is, monsieur, responded Passepartout. Thanks, yes, the passport is all right. Are you all looking about you? Yes, we travel so fast that I seem to be journeying into a dream. So this is Suez? Yes, in Egypt? Certainly in Egypt. And in Africa? In Africa. In Africa, repeated Passepartout. Just think, monsieur, I had no idea that we should go farther than Paris. And all I saw of Paris was between 20 minutes past 7 and 20 minutes before 9 in the morning, between the northern and the line stations, through the windows of a car and in the driving rain. How I regret not seeing once more Père Lachaise and the Circus of Champs Elysees. You're in a great hurry, then? I am not. But my master is. By the way, I must buy some shoes and shirts. We came away without trunks and only with a carpet bag. I will show you an excellent shop for getting what you want. Oh, really, Monsieur, you are so kind. And they walked off together, Passepartout chatting volubly as they went along. Above all, said he, don't let me lose the steamer. You've got plenty of time. It's only twelve o'clock. Passepartout pulled out his big watch. Twelve, he examined. Why, it's only eight minutes before ten. Your watch is slow. My watch. A family watch, monsieur, which has come down from my great-grandfather. It does not wear five minutes in the year. It's a perfect chronometer. Look, you. I see how it is, said Fix. You've kept London time, which is two hours behind that of Suez. You ought to regulate your watch at noon in each country. I regulate my watch. Never. Well, then, it will not agree with the sun. So much the worse for the sun, monsieur. The sun will be wrong, then. And the worthy fellow returned the watch to its fob with a defiant gesture. After a few minutes' silence, Fix resumed. You left London hastily, then? I'd rather think so. Last Friday at eight o'clock in the evening, Monsieur Fogg came home from his club, and three quarters of an hour afterwards we were off. But where is your master going? Though he's straight ahead, he's going around the world. Round the world? cried Fix. Yes, in eighty days. He says it's on the wager, but between us, I don't believe a word of it. That wouldn't be a common sense. There's something else in the wind. Ah, Mr. Fogg is a character, is he? I should say he was. Is he rich? No doubt, for he's carrying an enormous sum in brand new banknotes with him. And he didn't spare the money on the way either. He has offered a large reward to the engineer of the Mongolia if he gets us to Bombay well in advance of time. And you've known your master a long time. Why, no. I entered his service the very day we left London. The effect of these replies upon the already suspicious and excited detective may be imagined. The hasty departure from London soon after the robbery, the large sum carried by Mr. Fogg, his eagerness to reach distant countries, the pretext of an eccentric and foolhardy bet, all confirmed fix of his theory. He continued to pump poor Passepartout, and learned that he really knew little or nothing of his master who lived a solitary existence in London, was said to be rich, though no one knew whence came his riches, and was mysterious and impenetrable in his fares and habits. Fix felt sure that Phileas Fogg would not land at Suez, but was really going on to Bombay. "'Is uh, Bombay far from here?' asked Parpartout. "'Pretty far. It's ten days' voyage by sea. "'And what country is Bombay?' "'India.' "'In Asia?' "'Certainly.' The deuce. I was going to tell you there's one thing that worries me. My burner. What burner? My gas burner, which I forgot to turn off, which is at this moment burning at my expense. I have calculated, monsieur, that I shall lose two shillings every four and twenty hours, exactly sixpence more than I earned, and you will understand the longer our journey. Did Fix pay any attention to Passeportor's trouble about the gas? It is not probable. He was not listening, but cogitating a project. Passepartout and he had now reached the shop where Fix left his companion to make purchases. After recommending him not to miss the steamer, 
and hurried back to the consulate, now that he was fully convinced Fix had quite recovered his equanimity. Gang, said he, I no longer have any doubt. I've sported my man. He passes himself worse as, as an old stick who's going around the world in eighty days. He is a sharp fellow, returned the consul, and counts on returning to London after putting the police of two countries off his track. We'll see about that, replied Fix. But you are not mistaken. I am not mistaken. Why was this robber so anxious to prove by the visa that he had passed through Suez? What? Well, I've no idea. But listen to me. He reported in a few words the most important parts of his conversation with Passepartout. In short, said the council, appearances are wholly against this man. And what are you going to do? Send a dispatch to London for a warrant of arrest to be dispatched instantly to Bombay and take passage aboard the Mongolia. Follow my road to India, and there, on English ground, I'll rest him politely, with my warrant in my hand in my hand on his shoulder. Having uttered these words with a cool, careless air, the detective took leave of the council, and repaired to the telegraph office, whence he sent the dispatch which we have seen in the London police office. A quarter of an hour later, found Fix, with a small bag in his hand, proceeding on board the Mongolia, and ere many moments longer, the noble steamer rode out at full steam upon the waters of the Red Sea. End of chapter 8. Read by David Russell. For Lit to Go. Available on the web at fcit.usf.edu. Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne. Chapter 9. In which the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean prove propitious to the designs of Phileas Fogg. The distance between the Suez and the Aden is precisely 1,310 miles, and the regulations of the company allow steamers 138 hours in which to traverse it. The Mongolia, thanks to the vigorous exertions of the engineer, seemed likely, so rapid was her speed, to rather reach her destination considerably within that time. The greater part of the passengers from Brindisi were bound for India, some for Bombay, others for Calcutta by way of Bombay, the nearest route thither. Now that a railway crosses the Indian Peninsula, among the passengers was a number of officials and military officers of various grades, the latter being either attached to the regular British forces or commanding the sepoy troops, and receiving high salaries ever since the central government has assumed the powers of the East India Company, for the sub-lieutenants get 280 pounds, brigadiers 2,400 pounds, and generals of divisions 4,000 pounds. With what the military men, a number of rich young Englishmen on their travels, and the hospitable efforts of the purser, the time passed quickly on the Mongolia. The best affair was spread upon the cabin tables at breakfast, lunch, dinner, and the eight o'clock supper, and the ladies scrupulously changed their toilets twice a day, and the hours were whirled away when the sea was tranquil with the music, dancing, and games. But the Red Sea is full of caprice, and often boisterous, like most long, narrow gulfs, when the wind came from the Africa or Asia coast, the Mongolia, with her long hull, rolled fearfully. Then the ladies speedily disappeared below. The pianos were silent. Singing and dancing suddenly ceased. Yet the good ship ploughed straight on, unretarded by wind or wave, towards the straits of Babel Mandeb. What was Phileas Fogg doing all this time? It might be through that that in his anxiety he would be constantly watching the changes of the wind and the disorderly raging of the billows every chance, in short, which might force the Mongolia to slacken her speed and thus interrupt his journey. But if he thought of these possibilities, he did not betray the fact by any outward sign. Always the same impassable member of the Reform Club, whom no incident could surprise— as unwavering as the ship's chronometers, and seldom having the curiosity to even go upon the deck. He passed through the memorable scenes of the Red Sea with cold indifference, did not care to recognize the historic towns and villages such along its borders, raised their picturesque outlines against the sky, and betrayed no fear of the dangers of the Arabic Gulf, which the old historians always spoke of with horror, and upon which the ancient navigators never ventured without propitiating the gods by ample sacrifices. How did this eccentric personage pass his time on the Mongolia? He made his four hearty meals a day, regardless of the most persistent rolling and pitching on the part of the steamer, and he played whist indefatigably, for he had found partners as enthusiastic in the game as himself, a tax collector on the way to his post at Goa, the Reverend Decimus Smith returning to his parish at Bombay, and a brigadier-general of the English army who was about to rejoin his brigade at Benares. 
made up the party, and with Mr. Fogg played whist by the hour together in absorbing silence. As for Passepartout, he too had escaped seasickness, and took his meals conscientiously in the forward cabin. He rather enjoyed the voyage, for he was well fed and well lodged, took a great interest in the scenes through which they were passing, and consoled himself with the delusion that his master's whim would end at Bombay. He was pleased on the day after leaving Suez to find on deck the obliging person with whom he had walked and chatted on the quays. "'If I am not mistaken,' said he, approaching this person with his most amiable smile, "'you are the gentleman who so kindly volunteered to gain me at Suez.' "'Ah, I quite recognize you. You're that servant of that strange Englishman, Je suis Monsieur Fix.' Monsieur Fix, resumed Passepartout, I am charmed to find you on board. Oh, where are you bound? Le de Bombay. That's capital. Have you made this trip before? Several times. I'm one of the guests of the Peninsula Company. Then you know India? Well, yes, replied Fix, who spoke cautiously. A curious place, this India? I oh, very curious. Mosques, minarets, temples, fakirs, pagodas, targets, snakes, elephants. I hope you will have ample time to see the sights. I hope so, Monsieur Fix. You see, a man of sound sense ought not to spend his life jumping from a steamer upon a railway train, and from a railway train upon the steamer again, pretending to make the tour of the world in eighty days. No, all these gymnastics, you may well be sure, will cease at Bombay. And Mr. Fogg is getting along well, asked Fix in the most natural tone in the world. Quite well, and I too. I eat like a famished ogre. It's the sea air. But I've never seen your master on deck. Never. He hasn't the least curiosity. Did you know, Mr. Passepartout, that this pretended tour in eighty days may conceal some secret errand, perhaps a diplomatic mission? Faith, Monsieur Fix, I see you. I know nothing about it. Nor would I give a half a crown to find out. After this meeting, Passepartout and Fix got into the habit of chatting together, the latter making it a point to gain the worthy man's confidence. He frequently offered him a glass of whiskey or pale ale in the steamer's barroom, which Passepartout never failed to accept with grateful alacrity, mentally pronouncing Fix the best of good fellows. Meanwhile, the Mongolia was pushing forward rapidly. On the 13th, Mocha, surrounded by its ruined walls, whereon date trees were growing, was sighted. And on the mountains beyond were the Espedian vast coffee fields. Passepartout was ravished to behold this celebrated place, and thought that, with its circular walls and dismantled fort, it looked like an immense coffee cup and saucer. The following night they passed through the strait of Bab el Mandeb, which means in Arabic the Bridge of Tears, and the next day they put in at Steamer Point, northwest of Aden Harbor, to take in coal. This motor of fueling steamers is a serious one at such distances from the coal mines. It costs the Peninsular Company some 800,000 pounds a year in these distant seas. Coal is worth three or four pounds sterling a ton. The Mongolia had still 1,655 miles to traverse before reaching Bombay, and was obliged to remain four hours at Steamer Point to coal up. But this delay, as it was foreseen, did not affect Felice's Fogg's program. Besides, the Mongolia, instead of reaching Aden on the morning of the 15th when she was due, arrived there on the evening of the 14th, a gain of 15 hours. Mr. Fogg and his servant went ashore at Aden to have the passport again visaed. Fix, unobserved, followed them. The visa procured, Mr. Fogg returned on board to resume his former habits, while Passepartout, according to custom, sauntered him out among the mixed population of Somalis, Bayans, Parsis, Jews, Arabs, and Europeans, who compromised the 25,000 inhabitants of Aden. He gazed with wonder upon the fortifications that make this place the Gibraltar of the Indian Ocean, and two vast cisterns where the English engineers were still at work 2,000 years after the engineers of Solomon. Very curious, very curious, said Passepartout to himself, on returning to the steamer. I see that it is by no means useless to travel, if a man wants to see something new. At 6 p.m., the Mongolia slowly moved out of the roadstead, and was soon once more on the Indian Ocean. She had 168 hours in which to reach Bombay, and the sea was favorable, the wind being in the northwest and all sails aiding the engine. The steamer rolled a little, but the ladies in fresh toilets reappeared on the deck and the most singing and dancing was resumed. The trip was being accomplished most successfully, and Passepartout was enchanted with the congenial companion which chance had secured him in the person of the delightful Fix.
On Sunday, October 20th, towards noon, they came in sight of the Indian coast. Two hours later, the pilot came on board. A range of hills lay against the sky and the horizon, and soon the rows of palms which adorned Bombay came distinctly into view. The steamer entered the road formed by the islands in the bay, and half-past four she hauled up the quays of Bombay. Phileas Fogg was in the act of finishing the thirty-third rubber of the voyage, and his partner and himself, having by bold stroke, captured all thirteen of the tricks. This concluded his fine campaign with a brilliant victory. The Mongolia was due at Bombay on the twenty-second. She arrived on the twentieth. This was a gain to Phileas Fogg of two days since his departure from London, and he calmly entered that fact in the itinerary in the column of gains. End of chapter 9. Read by David Russell. For Lit to Go. Available on the web at fcit.usf.edu. Around the World in 80 Days. By Jules Verne. Chapter 10. In which Passepartout is only too glad to get off with the loss of his shoes. Everybody knows that the great reverse triangle of land, with its base in the north and its apex in the south, which is called India, embraces 1,400,000 square miles, upon which is spread unequally a population of 180 millions of souls. The British crown exercises a real and despotic dominion over the larger portion of the vast country, and has a governor-general stationed in Calcutta, governors at Madras, Bombay, and in Bengal, and a lieutenant governor at Agra. But British India, properly so called, only embraces 700,000 square miles, and a population from 100 to 110 million of inhabitants. A considerable portion of India is still free from British authority, and there are certain ferocious rajas in the interior who are absolutely independent. The celebrated East India Company was all-powerful from 1756, when the English first gained a foothold on the spot where they now stands the city of Madras. Down to the time of the great Sepoy insurrection, it gradually annexed province after province, purchasing them of the native chiefs, whom it seldom paid, and appointed the governor-general and his subordinates civil and military. But the East Indian Company has now passed away, leaving the British possessions in India directly under the control of the crown. The aspect of the country as well as the manners and distinctions of race is daily changing. Formerly one was obliged to travel in India by the old cumbrous methods of going on foot or horseback. In palanquins or unwieldy coaches, now fast steamboats ply on the Indus and the Ganges, and a great railway with branch lines joining the main line at many points on its route transverses the peninsula from Bombay to Calcutta in three days. This railway does not run in a direct line across India. The distance between Bombay and Calcutta, as the bird flies, is only from 1,000 to 1,100 miles, but the deflections of the road increase this distance by more than a third. The general route of the great Indian Peninsula railways is as follows. Leaving Bombay, it passes through Salsit. Crossing to the continent opposite Tana, it goes over the chain of the Western Ghats and runs thence northeast as far as Burmhapur, skirts the nearly independent area of Bunselund, ascends to Allahabad, and turns thence eastwardly, meeting the Ganges at Benares, and then departs from the river a little, and descending southwardly by Bredivian and the French town of Chandunagore, and has its terminus at Calcutta. The passengers of the Mongolia went ashore at half past four p.m. At exactly eight, the train would start for Calcutta. Mr. Fogg, after bidding goodbye to his whist partners, left the steamer, gave his servant several errands to do, urged it upon him to be at the station promptly at eight, and with his regular step, which beat to the second, like an astronomical clock, directed his steps to the passport office. As for the wonders of Bombay, its famous city halls, its splendid libraries, its forts, its docks, its bazaars, mosques, and synagogues, its Armenian churches, and the noble pagoda on Malabar Hill, with its two polygonal towers, he cared not a straw to see them. He would not deign to examine even the masterpieces of Elephanta, or the mysterious Hypogea, concealed southeast from the docks, or those fine remains of a Buddhist architecture, the Canarian grottoes of the island Salset. Having transacted his business in the passport office, Phileas Fogg repaired quietly to the railway station, where he ordered dinner. Among the dishes served up to him, the landlord especially recommended a certain giblet of native rabbit on which he prided himself. Mr. Fogg accordingly tasted the dish, but despite its spice sauce, 
found it far from palatable. He rang for the landlord, and on his appearance said, fixing his clear eyes upon him, "'Is this rabbit, sir?' "'Yes, my lord,' the rogue boldly replied. "'A rabbit from the jungles.' "'And this rabbit did not mew when he was killed.' "'Mew, my lord, what a, a rabbit mew, I swear to you. "'Be so good, landlord, as to not swear. "'But remember this. "'Cats were formerly considered in India as sacred animals, "'and that was a good time. "'For the cats, my lord, perhaps for the travellers as well.' "'After which Mr. Fogg quietly continued his dinner. "'Fix had gone on shore shortly after Mr. Fogg, "'and his first destination was the headquarters of the Bombay police. "'He made himself known as a London detective.' told his business at Bombay, asked the position of affairs relative to the supposed robber, and nervously asked if a warrant had arrived from London. It had not reached the office. Indeed, there had not yet been time for it to arrive. Fix was sorely disappointed, and tried to obtain an order of arrest from the director of the Bombay police. This the director refused. As the matter concerned the London office, which alone could legally deliver the warrant, Fix did not insist and was fain to resign himself to await the arrival of the important document, but he was determined not to lose sight of a mysterious rogue as long as he stayed in Bombay. He did not doubt for a moment, any more than Passepartout, that Phileas Fogg would remain there, at least until it was time for the warrant to arrive. Passepartout, however, had no sooner heard his master's orders on leaving the Mongolia than he saw at once that they were going to leave Bombay as they had done Suez in Paris, and that the journey would be extended at least as far as Calcutta, perhaps beyond that place. He began to ask himself if this bet Mr. Fogg talked about was not really in good earnest, and whether his fate was not in truth forcing him, despite his love of repose, around the world in eighty days. Having purchased the usual quota of shirts and shoes, he took a leisurely promenade around the streets, where crowds of people, of many nationalities, Europeans, Persians with pointed caps, Banyans with round turbans, Sindhis with square bonnets, Parsis with black mitres, and long-robed Armenians were collected. It happened to be the day after a Parsi festival. These descendants of the sect of Zoroaster, the most thrifty, civilized, intelligent, and austere of the East Indians, among whom are counted the richest native merchants of Bombay, were celebrating a sort of religious carnival with processions and shows, in the midst of which Indian dancing girls, clothed in perfect modesty, to the sound of viols and the clanging of tambourines. It is needless to say that Passepartout watched these curious ceremonies with his staring eyes and gaping mouth, and that his countenance was that of the greenest booby imaginable. Unhappily for his master, as well as himself, his curiosity drew him unconsciously farther off than he intended to go. At last, having seen the Parsi carnival wind away in the distance, he was turning his steps towards the station, when he happened to espy the splendid pagoda on Malabar Hill, and was seized with an irresistible desire to see its interior. He was quite ignorant that it is forbidden to Christians to enter certain Indian temples, and that even the faithful must not go in without first leaving their shoes outside the door. It may be said here that the wise policy of the British government severely punishes a disregard of the practices of the native religions." Passepartout, however, thinking no harm, went in like a simple tourist, and was soon lost in admiration of the splendid Brahmin ornamentation which everywhere met his eyes, when all of a sudden he found himself sprawling on the sacred flagging. He looked up to behold three enraged priests, whose forthwith fell upon him, tore off his shoes, and began to beat him with loud, savage exclamations. The agile Frenchman was soon upon his feet again, and lost no time knocking down two of his long-gowned adversaries with his fists and a vigorous application of his toes. Then, rushing out of the pagoda as fast as his legs could carry him, he soon escaped the third priest by mingling with the crowd in the streets. At five minutes before eight, Passepartout, hatless, shoeless, and having in the squabble lost his package of shirts and shoes, rushed breathlessly into the station. Fix, who had followed Mr. Fogg to the station, and saw that he was really going to leave Bombay was there, upon the platform. He had resolved to follow the supposed robber to Calcutta, and farther if necessary. Passepartout did not observe the detective, who stood in an obscure corner, but Fix heard him relate his adventures in a few words to Mr. Fogg. "'I hope that this will not happen again,' said Phileas Fogg coldly, as he got into the train. Poor Passepartout, quite crestfallen, followed his master without a word." Fix was on the point of entering another carriage when an idea struck him which induced him to alter his plan. "'Now I'll stay,' muttered he. "'An offence has been committed on Indian soil. I've got my man.' Just then the locomotive gave a sharp screech, 
and the train passed out into the darkness of the night. End of chapter 10. Read by David Russell for Lit to Go. Available on the web at fcit.usf.edu. Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne. Chapter 11. In which Phileas Fogg secures a curious means of conveyance at a fabulous price. The train had started punctually. Among the passengers were a number of officers, government officials, and opium and indigo merchants, whose business called them into the eastern coast. Passepartout rode in the same carriage with his master. A third passenger occupied a seat to them. This was Sir Francis Crummerty, one of Mr. Fogg's whist partners on the Mongolia, now on his way to join his corps at Benares. Sir Francis was a tall, fair man of fifty who had greatly distinguished himself at the last Sepoy revolt. He made India his home, only paying brief visits to England at rare intervals, and was almost as familiar as a native with the customs, history, and character of India and its people. But Phileas Fogg, who was not travelling, but only describing a circumference, took no pains to inquire into these subjects. He was a solid body, transversing an orbit around the terrestrial globe, According to the laws of rational mechanics, he was at this moment calculating in his mind the number of hours spent since his departure from London, and, had it been in his nature to make a useless demonstration, he would have rubbed his hands for satisfaction. Sir Francis Cromarty had observed the oddity of his travelling companion, though the only opportunity he had for studying him had been while he was dealing the cards, and between two rubbers, and questioned himself whether a human heart really beat beneath this cold exterior and whether Phileas Fogg had any sense of the beauties of nature. The brigadier-general was free to mentally confess that, of all the eccentric persons he had ever met, none was comparable to the product of this exact sciences. Phileas Fogg had not concealed from Sir Francis his design of going around the world, nor the circumstances under which he set out, and the general only saw in the wager a useless eccentricity and a lack of sound common sense. In the way this strange gentleman was going on, he would leave the world without having done any good to himself or anybody else. An hour after leaving Bombay, the train had passed the viaducts and the island of Salsette, and had gone into the open country. At Calvan they reached the junction of the branch line which descends towards southeastern India by Kandala and Puna. And, passing Powell, they entered the defiles of the mountains with their basalt bases and their summits crowned with thick and verdant forests. Phileas Fogg and now Sir Francis Cromarty exchanged a few words from time to time, and now Sir Francis, reviving the conversation, observed, Some years ago, Mr. Fogg, you would have met with delay at this point, which would have probably cost you your wager. How so, Mr. Francis? because the railway stopped at the base of these mountains, which on the passengers were obliged to cross in palanquins or ponies to Kandala on the other side. Such a delay would have not deranged my pans in the least, said Mr. Fogg. I have constantly foreseen the likelihood of certain obstacles. But, Mr. Fogg, pursued Sir Francis, you run the risk of having some difficulty about this worthy fellow's adventure at the pagoda. Passepartout, his feet comfortably wrapped in his travelling blanket, was sound asleep and did not dream that anybody was talking about him. The government is very severe upon that kind of offence. It takes particular care that the religious customs of the Indians should be respected, and if your servant were caught... Very well, Sir Francis, replied Mr. Fogg. If he had been caught, he would have been condemned and punished, and he would have quietly returned to Europe. I don't see how this affair could have delayed his master. The conversation fell again. During the night the train left the mountains behind and passed Nasik, and the next day proceeded over the flat, well-cultivated country of the Kandish, with its straggling villages, above which rose the minarets of the pagodas. This fertile territory is watered by numerous small rivers and limpid streams, mostly tributaries of the Godavery. Passepartout, on waking and looking out, could not realize that he was actually crossing India in a railway train. The locomotive, guided by an English engineer and fed with English coal, threw out its smoke upon cotton, coffee, nutmeg, clove, and pepper plantations, while the steam curled in spirals around groups of palm trees, in the midst of which were seen picturesque bungalows, viharis, sort of abandoned monasteries, and marvellous temples enriched by the exhaustless ornamentation of Indian architecture. Then they came upon vast tracts extending to the horizon, with jungles inhabited by snakes and tigers, which fled at the noise of the train, 
succeeded by forests penetrating by the railway, and still haunted by elephants which, with pensive eyes, gazed at the train as it passed. The travellers crossed beyond Miligam, the fatal country so often stained with the blood by the sectaries of the goddess Kali. Not far off rose Alora, with its graceful pagodas, and the famous Arungambad, capital of the ferocious Arungzib, now the chief town in one of the detached provinces of the kingdom of the Nizam. It was thereabouts that Feringe, the thuggy chief, king of stranglers, held his sway. Those ruffians, united by a secret bond, strangled the victims of every age in honor of the goddess Death. Without ever shedding blood, there was a period when this part of the country could scarcely be traveled over without corpses being found in every direction. The English government has succeeded in greatly diminishing these murders, though the thuggies still exist and pursue the exercise of their horrible rights. At half-past twelve, the train stopped in Burhampur, where Passepartout was able to purchase some Indian slippers, ornamented with false pearls in which, with evident vanity, he proceeded to encase his feet. The travellers made a hasty breakfast and started off for Asogur, after skirting for a little the banks of the small river Tapti, which empties into the Gulf of Cambrai near Surat. Passepartout was now plunged into the absorbing revelry. Up to his arrival at Bombay he had entertained hopes that their journey would end there, but now that they were plainly whirling across India at full speed, a sudden change had come over the spirit of his dreams. His old vagabond nature returned to him. The fantastic idea of his youth once more took possession of him. He came to regard his master's project as intended in good earnest, believed in the reality of the bet, and therefore in the tour of the world and the necessity of making it without fail within the designated period. Already he began to worry about possible delays and accidents which might happen along the way. He recognized himself as being personally interested in the wager, and trembled at the thought that he might have been the means of losing it by his unpardonable folly of the night before. Being much less cool-headed than Mr. Fogg, he was much more restless, counting and recounting the days passed over, uttering maledictions when the train stopped and accusing it of sluggishness, and mentally blaming Mr. Fogg for not having bribed the engineer. The worthy fellow was ignorant that, while it was possible by such means to hasten the rate of a steamer, it could not be done on the railway. The train entered the defiles of the Suptor Mountains, which separate the Kandish from Bundelkund, t- towards evening. The next day, Sir Francis Cromarty asked Passepartout what time it is, to which, on consulting his watch, he replied that it was three in the morning. This famous timepiece, always regulated on the Greenwich Meridian, which was now some seventy-six degrees westward, was at least four hours slow. Sir Francis corrected Passepartout's time, whereupon the latter made the same remark that he had done to fix, and upon the general insisting that the watch should be regulated in each new meridian, since he was constantly going eastward, that is, in the face of the sun, and therefore the days were shorter by four minutes for each degree gone over. Passepartout abstainly refused to alter his watch, which he kept at London time. It was an innocent delusion which could harm no one. The train stopped at eight o'clock. In the midst of a glade some fifteen miles beyond Rothal, where there were several bungalows and workmen's cabins, the conductor, passing along the carriages, shouted, "'Passengers will get out here!' Phileas Fogg looked at Sir Francis Cromarty for an exclamation, but the gentleman could not tell what it meant and halt in the middle of this forest of dates and acacias. Passepartout, not less surprised, rushed out and speedily returned, crying, "'Monsieur, no more railway!' "'What do you mean?' asked Sir Francis." I mean to say that the train isn't going on. The journal at once stepped out, while Phileas Fogg calmly followed behind him, and they proceeded together to the conductor. Where are we? asked Sir Francis. At the hamlet of Kobe. Do we stop here? Certainly. The railway isn't finished. What? Not finished? No. It's a, still a matter of fifty miles to be laid from here to Ahalabad, where the line begins again. But the papers announced the opening of the railway throughout. What would you have, officer? The papers were mistaken. You sent tickets from Bombay to Calcutta, retorted Sir Francis, who was growing warm. No doubt, replied the conductor, but the passengers know that they must provide means of transportation from themselves from Colby to Al-Halabad. Sir Francis was furious. Passepartout would willingly have knocked out the conductor down, and did not dare look at his master. We will, if you please, look about for some means of conveyance to Al-Halabad. Mr. Fogg, this is a delay greatly to your disadvantage. No, Sir Francis, it was foreseen. 
What? You knew that the way... No, not at all. But I knew some obstacle or other would sooner or later arise in my route. Nothing, therefore, is lost. I have two days, which I have already gained, to sacrifice. A steamer leaves Calcutta for Hong Kong at noon. On the 25th, this is the 22nd, and we shall reach Calcutta in time. There was nothing to say to so confident a response. But it was too true that the railway came to a termination at this point. The papers were like some watches, which have a way of getting too fast, and had been premature in their announcement of the completion of the line. The greater part of the travellers were aware of this interruption, and, leaving the train, they began to engage such vehicles as the village could provide, four-wheel placgaris, wagons drawn by zebus, carriages that looked like perambulating pagodas, pelicans, ponies, and what not. Mr. Fogg and Sir Francis Cromarty, after searching the village from end to end, came back without having found anything. "'I shall go afoot,' said Phileas Fogg. Passepartout, who now had rejoined his master, made a wry grimace, as he thought of his magnificent but too frail Indian shoes. Happily, he too had been looking about him, and after a moment's hesitation said, "'Monsieur, I think I have found the means of conveyance.' "'What? An elephant, an elephant that belongs to an Indian who lives but a hundred steps from here.' "'Let's go see the elephant,' replied Mr. Fogg. As soon as they reached a small hut near which, enclosed within some high pilings, was the animal in question, an Indian came out of the hut, and, at their request, conducted them within the enclosure. The elephant, which the owner had reared, not for beast of burden, but for warlike purposes, was half domesticated. The Indian had begun already, off by often irritating him, and feeding him every three months on sugar and butter, to impart him with a ferocity not in his nature. This method, being often employed by those who train the Indian elephants for battle, happily, however, for Mr. Fogg, the animal's instruction in this direction had not gone far, and the elephant still preserved his natural gentleness. Kioni, this was the name of the beast, could doubtless travel rapidly for a long time, and, in default, or of any other means of conveyance, Mr. Fogg resolved to hire him. But elephants are far from cheap in India, where they are becoming scarce. The males, which are alone suitable for circus shows, are much sought. "'especially, but as few of them are domesticated. "'When therefore Mr. Fogg proposed to the Indian to hire Keone, "'he refused point-blank. "'Mr. Fogg persisted, offering an excessive sum of ten pounds an hour "'for the loan of the beast to Allahabad. "'Refused twenty pounds. Refused also. forty pounds still refused. "'Passepartout jumped at each advance, but the Indian declined to be tempted. "'Yet the offer was an alluring one, "'for supposing it took the elephant fifteen hours to reach Allahabad. His owner would receive no less than six hundred pounds sterling. Phileas Fogg, without getting in the least flurried, then proposed to purchase the animal outright, and at first offered a thousand pounds for him. The Indian, perhaps thinking he was going to make a great bargain, still refused. Sir Francis Cromarty took Mr. Fogg aside, and begged him to reflect more before he went any further, to which that gentleman replied that he was not in the habit of acting rashly, that a bet of twenty thousand pounds was at stake, and that the elephant was absolutely necessary to him, and that he would secure him if he had to pay twenty times his value. Returning to the Indian, whose small, sharp eyes glistened with avarice, betrayed that with him it was only a question of how great a price he could obtain. Mr. Falk offered first twelve hundred, then fifteen hundred, eighteen hundred, two thousand pounds. Passepartout, usually so rubicund, was fairly white with suspense. At two thousand pounds the Indian yielded. "'What a price! Good heavens!' cried Passepartout, for an elephant. It only remained now to find a guide, which was comparatively easy. A young Parsi with an intelligent face offered his services, which Mr. Fogg accepted, promising so generous a reward as to materially stimulate his zeal. The elephant was led out and equipped. The Parsi, who was an accomplished elephant driver, covered his back with sort of a saddle-cloth, and attached to each of his flanks some curiously uncomfortable howdahs, Phileas Fogg paid the Indian with some banknotes, which he extracted from the famous carpet-bag, a proceeding that seemed to deprive poor Passepartout of his vitals. Then he offered to carry Sir Francis to Allahabad, which the brigadier gratefully accepted, as one traveller the more would not be likely to fatigue the gigantic beast. Provisions were purchased at Colby, and while Sir Francis and Mr. Fogg took the howdahs on either side, Passepartout got astride the saddle-cloth between them. The Parsi perched himself on the elephant's neck, and at nine o'clock they set out from the village, the animal marching off through the dense forest of the palms by the shortest cut. End of chapter 11. Read by David Russell. For Lit to Go. Available on the web at fcit.usf.edu.
Around the World in Eighty Days, by Jules Verne, Chapter Twelve, in which Phileas Fogg and his companions venture across the Indian forests and what ensued. In order to shorten the journey, the guide passed to the left of the line where the railway was still in process of being built. This line, owing to the capricious turnings of the Vindalia Mountains, did not pursue a straight course. The Parsi, who was quite familiar with the roads and paths in the district, declared that they would gain twenty miles by striking directly through the forest. Phileas Fogg and Sir Francis Cromarty, plunged to the neck of the peculiar howdows provided for them, were horribly jousted by the swift trotting of the elephant, spurred on as he was by the skilful Parsi. But they endured the discomfort with true British phlegm, talking little, and scarcely able to catch a glimpse of each other. As for Passepartout, who was mounted on the beast's back, and received the direct force of each concussion as he trod along, he was very careful, in accordance with his master's advice, to keep his tongue from between his teeth, as it would otherwise have been bitten off. The worthy fellow bounced from the elephant's neck to his rump, and vaulted like a clown on a springboard, yet he laughed in the midst of his bouncing, and from time to time took a piece of sugar out of his pocket and inserted it in Keone's trunk, who received it without the least slackening of his regular trot. After two hours the guide stopped the elephant, and gave him an hour for rest, during which Keone, after quenching his thirst at a neighboring spring, set to devouring the branches and shrubs around him. Neither Sir Francis nor Mr. Fogg regretted the delay, and both descended with a feeling of relief. "'Why, he's made of iron!' exclaimed the general, gazing admirably on Keone. "'A forge d'iron,' replied Passepartout, as he set about preparing a hasty breakfast. At noon the Parsi gave the signal of departure. The country soon presented a very savage aspect— Copses of dates and dwarf palms succeeded the dense forests, then vast dry plains dotted with scanty shrubs, and sown with great blocks of sienet. All this portion of Bundelkund, which is little frequented by travellers, is inhabited by a fanatical population, hardened in the most horrible practices of the Hindu faith. The English have not yet begun to secure a complete dominion over this territory, which is subjected to the influence of rajas, who it is almost impossible to reach in their inaccessible mountain fastness. The travellers several times saw bands of ferocious Indians, who, when they perceived the elephant striding cross country, made angry, arid, threatening motions. The Parsi avoided them as much as possible. Few animals were observed on the route. Even the monkeys hurried from their path with contortions and grimaces, which convulsed Passepartout with laughter. In the midst of his gaiety, however, one thought troubled the worthy servant. What would Mr. Fogg do with the elephant when he got to Allahabad? Would he carry it on with him? Impossible. The cost of transporting him would make him ruinously expensive. Would he sell him or set him free? The estimable beast certainly deserves some consideration. Should Mr. Fogg choose to make him Passepartout a present of Keone, he would much be very embarrassed, and these thoughts did not cease worrying him for a long time. The principal chain of the Vindias was crossed by eight in the evening. Another halt was made on the northern slope, in a ruined bungalow, they had gone nearly twenty-five miles that day, and equal distance still separated them from the station of Allahabad. The night was cold. The Parsi lit a fire in the bungalow with a few dry branches, and the warmth was very grateful. Provisions purchased at Colby sufficed for supper, and the travers ate ravenously. The conversation, beginning with a few disconnected phrases, soon gave place to loud and steady snores. The guide watched Keone, who slept standing, bolstering himself against the trunk of a large tree. Nothing occurred during the night to disturb the slumbers, although the occasional growls from panthers and chatterings of monkeys broke the silence. The more formidable beasts made no cries or hostile demonstration against the occupants of the bungalow. Sir Francis slept heavily, like an honest soldier overcome with fatigue. Passepartout was wrapped in the uneasy dreams of bouncing the day before. As for Mr. Fogg, he slumbered as peacefully as if he had been in a serene mansion on Seville Row. The journey was resumed at six in the morning, the guide hoped to reach Allahabad by the evening. In that case, Mr. Fogg would only lose a part of forty-eight hours saved since the beginning of the tour. Keone, resuming his rapid gait, soon descended the lower spurs of the Vindias, and towards noon they passed the village of Callender, on the Kenny, one of the branches of the Ganges. The guide avoided inhabited places, thinking it safer to keep the open country, which lies along the first depressions of the basin of the great river. Allahabad was now only twelve miles to the northeast. They stopped under a clump of bananas, the fruit of which was 
healthy as bread, as succulent as cream, and amply partaken of and appreciated. At two o'clock the guide entered a thick forest, which extended several miles. He preferred to travel under the cover of the woods. They had not as yet had any unpleasant encounters, and the journey seemed on the point of being successfully accomplished, when the elephant, becoming restless, suddenly stopped, when it was the four o'clock. "'What's the matter?' asked Sir Francis, putting out his head. "'I don't know, officer,' replied the Parsi, listening attentively to a confused murmur which came through the thick branches." The murmur soon became more distinct. It now seemed like a distant concert of human voices accompanied by brass instruments. Passepartout was all eyes and ears. Mr. Fogg patiently waited without a word. The Parsi jumped to the ground, fastened the elephant to a tree, and plunged into the thicket. He soon returned, saying, A procession of Brahmins is coming this way. We must prevent their seeing us if possible. The guide unloosed the elephant and led him into a thicket, at the same time asking the travellers not to stir. He held himself ready to bestride the animal at a moment's notice, should flight become necessary. But he evidently thought that the procession of the faithful would pass without perceiving them amid the thick foliage which they were wholly concealed. The discordant tones of the voices and instruments drew near. Now droning songs mingled with the sound of tambourines and cymbals. The head of the procession soon appeared beneath the trees a hundred paces away, and the strange figures who performed the religious ceremony were easily distinguished through the branches. First came the priests, with meters on their head and clothed in long lace robes. They were surrounded by men, women, and children, who sang a kind of lugubrious psalm, interrupted at regular intervals by the tambourines and cymbals. While behind them was drawn a car with large wheels, the spokes of which represented serpents entwined within each other. Upon the car, which was drawn by four richly caparisoned zebus, stood a hideous statue with four arms, the body colored dull red with haggard eyes, disheveled hair, protruding tongue, and lips tinted with betel. It stood upright upon the figure of a prostrate and headless giant. Sir Francis, recognizing the statue, whispered, The goddess Kali, the goddess of love and death. Of death, perhaps, muttered back Passepartout, but of love, that ugly old hag? Never. The Parsi made a motion to keep silence. A group of old fakers were capering and making a wild ado around the statue. These were striped with ochre, and covered with the cuts whence their blood issued drop by drop, stupid fanatics, who in the great Indian ceremonies still throw themselves under the wheels of juggernaut. Some Brahmins, clad in all the sumptuous of oriental apparel, and leading a woman who faltered at every step followed. This woman was young, and as fair as European. Her neck and head, shoulders, ears, arms, hands, and toes were loaded down with jewels and gems, with bracelets, earrings, and rings, while a tunic bordered with gold and covered with a light muslin road betrayed the outline of her form. The guards who followed the young woman presented a violent contrast to her. Armed they were with naked sabers hung at their waists, and long damascened pistols, bearing a corpse on a palanquin. It was the body of an old man, gorgeously arrayed in the halibans of a rajah wearing, as in life, a turban embroidered with pearls, a robe of tissue and silk and gold, a scarf of cashmere sewed with diamonds, and the magnificent weapon of a Hindu prince. Next came the musicians, and a rear guard of capering fakers, whose cries sometimes drowned out the noise of instruments. These closed the perception. Sir Francis watched the perception with a sad countenance, and, turning to the guide, said, A sutty. The Parsi nodded, and put a finger to his lips. The procession slowly wound under the trees, and soon its last ranks disappeared in the depths of the wood. The songs gradually died away. Occasionally cries were heard in the distance, until at last all was silence again. Phileas Fogg had heard what Sir Francis said, and as soon as the procession had disappeared, asks, What's a sutty? A sutty, returned the gentleman, is a human sacrifice, but a voluntary one. The woman you have just seen will be burned tomorrow at the dawn of day. Oh, the scoundrels, cried the passepartout, who could not repress his indignation. And the corpse, asked Mr. Fogg. Is that the prince, her husband, said the guide, an independent rajah of Bundinklund. Is it possible, resumed Phileas Fogg, his voice betraying not the least emotion, that these barbarous customs still exist in India, and the English have been unable to put a stop to them? These sacrifices do not occur in the larger portion of India, replied Sir Francis, but we have no power over these savage territories, and especially here in Bundukund, the whole district north of the Vendiers is the theatre of incessant murders and pillage. The poor wretch, exclaimed Passepartout, to be burned alive. 
Yes, returned Sir Francis, burned alive, and, if she were not, you cannot conceive what a treatment she would be obliged to submit for from her relatives. They would shave off her hair, feed her a scanty allowance of rice, treat her with contempt. She would be looked upon as an unclean creature. She would die in some corner like a scurvy dog. The prospect of so frightful existence drives these poor creatures to the sacrifice of much more than love or religious fanaticism. Sometimes, however, the sacrifice is really voluntary, and it requires the active interference of the government to prevent it. Several years ago, when I was living at Bombay, a young widow asked permission of the governor to be burned along with her husband's body. But, as you may imagine, he refused. The woman left town and took refuge with an independent rajah, and there carried out her self-devoted purpose. While Sir Francis was speaking, the guide shook his head several times and now said, The sacrifice which will take place tomorrow at dawn is not a voluntary one. How do you know? Everybody knows about this affair in Bundelkund. But the wretched creature did not seem to be making any resistance, observed Sir Francis. That was because they had intoxicated her with fumes of hemp and opium. But where are they taking her? To the Bakoda of the Pilage, two miles from here. She will pass the night there. And the sacrifice will take place tomorrow, at the first light of dawn. The guide now led the elephant out of the thicket and leaped upon his neck. Just at the moment when he was about to urge Keone forward with a particular whistle, Mr. Fogg stopped him, and turning to Sir Francis Cromarty, said, Suppose we save this woman. Save the woman, Mr. Fogg? I yet have twelve hours to spare. I can devote them to that. Why, you are a man of heart. Sometimes, replied Phileas Fogg quietly, when I have the time. End of chapter 12 Read by David Russell For Lit to Go Available on the web at fcit.usf.edu. Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne Chapter 13 In which Passepartout receives a new proof that fortune favors the brave. The project was a bold one, full of difficulty, perhaps impracticable. Mr. Fogg was going to risk life, or at least liberty, and therefore the success of his tour, but he did not hesitate and he found in Sir Francis Cromarty an enthusiastic ally. As for Passepartout, he was ready for anything that might be proposed. His master's idea charmed him. He perceived a heart, a soul under that icy exterior. He began to love Phileas Fogg. There remained the guide. What course would he adopt? Would he not take part with the Indians? In default of his assistance, it was necessary to be assured of his neutrality. Sir Francis frankly put the question to him. Officer, replied the guide, I am a Parsi, and this woman is a Parsi. Command me as you will. Excellent, said Mr. Fogg. However, resumed the guide, it is certain not only that we will risk our lives, but the horrible tortures if we are taken. That is foreseen, replied Mr. Fogg. I think we must wait till nightfall before acting. I think so. The worthy Indian then gave some account of the victim, who, he said, was a celebrated beauty of the Parsi race and the daughter of a wealthy Bombay merchant. She had received a thoroughly English education in that city, and from her manners and intelligence would thought to be a European. Her name was Aouda, left an orphan. She was married against her will to the old Raja of Bundelkund, and, knowing the fate that awaited her, she escaped, was retaken and devoted by the Raja's relatives, who had an interest in her death, to the sacrifice from which it seemed she could not escape." The Parsi's narrative only confirmed Mr. Fogg's and his companions in their generous design. It was decided that the guide should direct the elephant towards the pagoda of the Pelagi, after which he accordingly approached as quickly as possible. They halted. Half an hour afterwards, in a copse, some five hundred feet from the pagoda, where they were well concealed, they could hear the groans and cries of the fakirs distinctly. Then they discussed the means of getting the victim— the guide was familiar with the pagoda of the Pelagi, in which, as he declared, the young woman was imprisoned. Could they enter any of its doors while the whole party of Indians was plunged into drunken sleep, or was it safer to attempt to make a hole in the walls? This could only be determined at the moment and the place themselves, but it was certain that the abduction must be made at night, and not when, at break of day, the victim was to be led to her funeral pyre, then no human intervention could save her. As soon as night fell, about six o'clock, they decided to make a reconnaissance around the pagoda. The cries of the fakirs were just ceasing. The Indians were in the act of plunging themselves into the drunkenness caused by liquid opium mingled with hemp, and it might be possible to slip between them to the temple itself. 
The posse, leading the others, noiselessly crept through the wood, and in ten minutes they found themselves on the banks of a small stream, whence, by the light of the rosin torches, they perceived a pyre of wood, on top of which lay the embalmed body of the Raja, who was to be burned with his wife. The Bakoda, whose minarets loomed above the trees in the deepening dusk, stood a hundred steps away. Come, whispered the guide. He slipped more cautiously than ever through the brush, followed by his companions. The silence around was only broken by the low murmuring of the wind among the branches. Soon the Parsi stopped on the borders of the glade, which was lit up by the torches. The crown was covered by the groups of Indians, motionless in their drunken sleep. It seemed a battlefield strewn with the dead. Men, women, and children lay together. In the background, among the trees, the bagot of the Palaji loomed distinctly. Much to the guide's disappointment, the guards of the Raja, lighted by torches, were watching at the doors and marching to and fro with naked sabers. Probably the priests, too, were watching within. The Parsi, now convinced that it was impossible to force an entrance to the temple, advanced no farther, but led his companions back again. Phileas Fogg and Sir Francis Cromarty also saw that nothing could be attempted in that direction. They stopped and engaged in a whispered colloquy. It's only eight now, said the brigadier, and these guards may also go to sleep. It is not impossible, returned the Parsi. They lay down at the foot of a tree and waited. The time seemed long. The guide ever and anon left them to take an observation on the edge of the wood, but the guards watched steadily by the glare of the torches, and a dim light crept through the windows of the pagoda. They waited until midnight, but no change took place among the guards, and it became apparent that their yielding to sleep could not be counted on. The other plan must be carried out. An opening in the walls of the pagoda must be made. It remained to ascertain whether the priests were watching by the side of their victim as studiously as the guards were at the door. After a last consultation, the guide announced that he was ready for the attempt and advanced, followed by the others. They took a roundabout way so as to get the pagoda on the rear. They reached the walls about half-past twelve. Without having met anyone, there was no guard. There were neither windows or doors. The night was dark. The moon on the wane scarcely left the horizon, and was covered with heavy clouds. The height of the trees deepened the darkness. It was not enough to reach the walls. An opening in them must be accomplished, and to attain this purpose the party only had their pocket knives. Happily, the temple walls were built of brick and wood, which could be penetrated with little difficulty. After one brick had been taken out, the rest would yield easily. They set noiselessly to work, and the posse on one side and Passepartout on the other began to loosen the brick so as to make a sudden aperture two feet wide. They were getting on rapidly, when suddenly a cry was heard in the interior of the temple, followed almost instantly by other cries replying from the outside. Passepartout and the guide had stopped. Had they been heard? Was the alarm being given? Common prudence urged them to retire, and they did so, followed by Phileas Fogg and Sir Francis. They again hid themselves in the wood, and waited till the disturbance, whatever it may be, ceased, holding themselves ready to resume their attempt without delay. But awkwardly enough, the guards now appeared at the rear of the temple, and there installed themselves in readiness to prevent a surprise. It would be difficult to describe the disappointment of the party. Thus interrupted in their work, they could now not reach the victim. How, then, could they save her? Sir Francis shook his fists. Passepartout was beside himself, and the guide gnashed his teeth with rage. The tranquil fog waited without betraying any emotion. "'We have nothing to do but to go away,' whispered Sir Francis. "'Nothing but to go away,' echoed the guide. "'Stop,' said Fogg. "'I am only due at Allahabad before tomorrow noon.' "'But what can you hope to do?' asked Sir Francis. "'In a few hours it will be daylight, and the chance which now seems lost may present itself at the last moment.' Sir Francis would have liked to read Phileas Fogg's eyes. What was this cool Englishman thinking of? Was he planning to make a rush for the young woman at the very moment of the sacrifice, and boldly snatch her from her executioners? This would be utter folly, and it was hard to admit that Fogg was such a fool. Sir Francis consented, however, to remain to the end of this terrible drama. The guide led them to the rear of the glade, where they were able to observe the sleeping groups. Meanwhile, Passepartout, who had perched himself on the lower branches of a tree, was resolving an idea which first struck him in like a flash, and which was now firmly lodged in his brain. He had commenced by saying to himself, What folly? And then he repeated, Why not, after all? It's a chance, perhaps the only one, and with such sorts. Thinking thus, he slipped, with the suppleness of a serpent, to the lowest branches, the ends of which bent almost to the ground. 
The hours passed, and the lighter shades now announced the approach of day. There was not yet light. This was the moment. The slumbering multitude became animated. The tambourines sounded, songs and cries arose. The hour of the sacrifice had come. The doors of the pagoda swung open, and a bright light escaped from its interior, in the midst of which Mr. Fogg and Sir Francis espied the victim. She seemed, having shaken off the stupor of intoxication, to be striving to escape from her executioner. Sir Francis's heart throbbed, and convulsively seizing Mr. Fogg's hand, found in it an open knife. Just as this moment the crowd began to move, the young woman had again fallen into stupor caused by the fumes of hemp passed among the fakirs, who escorted her with wild religious cries. Phileas Fogg and his companions, mingling in the rear ranks of the crowd, followed, and in two minutes they reached the banks of the stream and stopped fifty faces from the pyre, upon which still lay the Raja's corpse. In the semi-obscurity they saw the victim, quite senseless, stretched out beside her husband's body. Then a torch was brought, and the wood, heavily soaked with oil, instantly took fire. At this moment, Sir Francis and the guy seized Phileas Fogg, who in an instant of mad generosity was about to rush upon the pyre. But he had quickly pushed them aside. When the whole scene suddenly changed, a cry of terror rose. The whole multitude prostrated themselves, terror-stricken on the ground. The old Raja was not dead. Then, since he rose all of a sudden, like a spectre, took up the wife in his arms and descended from the pyre in the midst of the clouds of smoke, which only heightened his ghostly appearance. Vakirs and soldiers and priests, seized with instant terror, lay there, with their faces on the ground, not daring to lift their eyes and behold such a prodigy. The inanimate victim was borne alone by the vigorous arms which supported her, and which she did not seem in the least to burden. Mr. Fogg and Sir Francis stood erect. The Parsi bowed his head, and Passepartout was, no doubt, scarcely less stupefied. The resuscitated Raja approached Sir Francis and Mr. Fogg, and in an abrupt tone said, "'Let us be off.' It was Passepartout himself, who had slipped upon the prior in the midst of the smoke, and, profiting by the still overhanging darkness, had delivered the young woman from death. It was Passepartout who, playing his part with a happy audacity, had passed through the crowd amid the general terror. A moment after all four of the party had disappeared in the woods, and the elephant was bearing them away at a rapid pace, the cries and noise, and a ball which whizzed through Phileas Fogg's head, appraised them that the trick had been discovered. The old Raja's body indeed now appeared upon the burning pyre, and the priest, recovered from their terror, perceived that an abduction had taken place. They hastened into the forest, followed by the soldiers, who fired a volley after the fugitives. But the latter rapidly increased the distance between them, and ere long found themselves beyond the reach of bullets and arrows. End of chapter 13. Read by David Russell. For lit to go. Available on the web at fcit.usf.edu. Around the World in Eighty Days, by Jules Verne, Chapter 14, in which Phileas Fogg descends the whole length of the beautiful valley of gangs without ever thinking of seeing it. The rash exploit had been accomplished. For an hour, Passepartout laughed gaily at his success. Sir Francis pressed the worthy fellow's hand, and his master said, Well done, which from him was high commendation, to which Passepartout replied that all the credit of the affair belonged to Mr. Fogg. As for him, he had only been stuck with a queer idea, and he laughed to think that for a few moments he, Passepartout, the ex-gymnast, ex-sergeant fireman, had been the spouse of a charming woman, a venerable embalmed Raja. As for the young Indian woman, she had been unconscious throughout what was passing, and now, wrapped up in a travelling blanket, was reposing in one of the howdahs. The elephant, thanks to the skilful guidance of the Parsi, was advancing rapidly through the still darksome forest, and, an hour after leaving the pagoda, had crossed a vast plain. They made a halt at seven o'clock, the young woman being still in a state of complete prostration. The guide made her drink a little brandy and water, but the drowsiness which stupefied her could not be shaken off. Sir Francis, who was familiar with the effects of intoxication produced by the fumes of hemp, reassured his companions on her account. But he was more disturbed at the prospect of her future fate. He told Phileas Fogg that, should Iuda remain in India, she would inevitably fall in again to the hands of her executioners. These fanatics were scattered throughout the country, and would, despite the English police, recover their victim at Madras, Bombay, or Calcutta. She could only be safe by quitting India forever. Phileas Fogg replied that he would reflect upon the matter. 
The station at Allahabad was reached about ten o'clock, and the interrupted line of railway being resumed would enable them just to reach Calcutta in less than twenty-four hours. Phileas Fogg would thus be able to arrive in time to take the steamer which left Calcutta on the next day, October 25th, at noon for Hong Kong. The young woman was placed in one of the waiting rooms of the station, whilst Passepartout was charged with purchasing for her various articles of toilet, a dress shawl and some furs, for which his master gave him unlimited credit. Passepartout started off forthwith and found himself in the streets of Allahabad, that is, the city of God, one of the most venerated in India, being built at the junction of two sacred rivers, Ganges and Jumna, the waters of which attract pilgrims from every part of the peninsula. The Ganges, according to the legends of the Rayaman, rises in heaven, whence, owing to Brahma's agency, it descends to the earth. Passepartout made it a point, as he makes his purchases, to take a good look at the city. It was formerly defended by a noble fort, which has since become a state prison. Its commerce has dwindled away, and Passepartout in vain looked about for him such a bazaar as he used to frequent in Regent Street. At last he came upon an elderly crusty Jew, who sold second-hand articles, from whom he purchased a dress of scotch stuff, a large mantle, a fine otter-skin pelisse, for which he did not hesitate to pay seventy-five pounds, and then he returned triumphantly to the station. The influence to which the priests of Pelagi had subjected Udo began to gradually yield. She became more herself, so that her fine eyes resumed all their soft Indian expression. When the poet king, Uka Fudaul, celebrates the charms of the queen of Ahamengara, he speaks thus. Her shining tresses divided in two parts encircle the harmonious contour of her white and delicate cheeks. Brilliant in their glow and freshness, her ebony brows have the form and charm of the bow of Kama, the god of love and beneath her long silken lashes the purest reflections and celestial light swim, as in the sacred lakes of the Himalaya. In the black pupils of her great clear eyes, her teeth, fine, equal, and white, glitter between her smiling lips like dewdrops in a passion flower's half-enveloped breast. Her delicately formed ears, her vermilion hands, her little feet curved and tender, as the lotus bud glitter with the brilliancy of the loveliest pearls of the Ceylon. The most dazzling diamonds of Golconda, her narrow and supple waist, which a hand may clasp around, sets forth the outline of her rounded figure and the beauty of her bosom, where youth in its flower displays the wealth of its treasures, and beneath the silken folds of her tunic she seems to have been moulded in pure silver by the godlike hand of Vikvakama, the immortal sculptor. It is enough to say, without applying this poetical rhapsody to Aouda, that she was a charming woman. In all the European exception of the phrase, she spoke English with great purity, and the guide had not exaggerated in saying that the young Parsi had been transformed by her bringing up. The train was about to start from Mahalabad, and Mr. Fogg proceeded to pay the guide the price agreed upon for his service, and not a farthing more, which astonished Passepartout, who remembered all his master owed to the guide's devotion. He had, indeed, risked his life in the adventure at the Pelagi, and, if he should be caught afterwards by the Indians, he would with difficulty escape their vengeance. Kioni must be disposed of, but what should be done with the elephant, which he had so dearly purchased? Phileas Fogg had already determined this question. Parsi, he said to the guide, you have been serviceable and devoted. I have paid for your service, but not for your devotion. Would you like to have this elephant? He is yours. The guide's eyes glistened. You honour is giving me a fortune, cried he. Take him, guide, returned Mr. Fogg, and I shall still be your debtor. Good, exclaimed Passepartout, take him, friend. Kuni is a brave and faithful beast. And going up to the elephant, he gave him several lumps of sugar, saying, Here, Kuni, here, here. The elephant grunted out of his satisfaction, and clasping Passepartout around the waist with his trunk, lifted him as high as his head. Passepartout, not the least of arm, caressed the animal, which replaced him gently on the ground. Soon after, Phileas Fogg, Sir Francis Cromarty, and Passepartout, installed in a carriage with Iouda, who had the best seat, were whirling at full speeds towards Benares. It was a run of eighty miles, and was accomplished in two hours. During the journey, the young woman fully recovered her senses. What was her astonishment to find herself in this carriage, on the railway, dressed in European habiliments, and with travellers who were quite strangers to her? Her companions first set about fully reviving her with a little liquor, and then Sir Francis narrated to her what had passed, dwelling upon the courage at which Phileas Fogg had not hesitated to risk his life to save her, 
and recounting the happy sequel of the venture. The result of Passepartout's rash idea, Mr. Fogg said nothing, while Passepartout, abashed, kept repeating that it wasn't worth telling. Iota pathetically thanked her deliverers, rather with tears than words. Her fine eyes interpreted her gratitude better than her lips. Then, as her thoughts strayed back to the scene of the sacrifice, and recalled the dangers which still menaced her, she shuddered with terror. Phileas Fogg understood what was passing in Aouda's mind, and offered, in order to reassure her, to escort her to Hong Kong, where she might remain, safely until the affair was hushed up. An offer she eagerly and gratefully accepted. She had, it seems, a posse relation, who was one of the principal merchants of Hong Kong, which is wholly an English city, based on an island in the Chinese coast. At half-past twelve, this train stopped at Benares. The Brahmin legends assert that this city is built on the site of an ancient kasi, which, like Mahomet's tomb, was once suspended between heaven and earth. Though the Benares of today, which all the Orientalists call the Athens of India, stands quite unpoetically on the solid earth. Passepartout caught glimpses of its brick houses and clay huts, giving an aspect of desolation to the place as the train entered it. Benares was Sir Francis Camarty's destination, the troops he was rejoining being in camp some miles northward of the city. He bade adieu to Phileas Fogg, wishing him all success and expressing the hope that he would come that way again in a less original but more profitable fashion. Mr. Fogg lightly pressed him by the hand. The parting of Aouda, who did not forget that she owed Sir Francis, betrayed more warmth. As for Passepartout, he received a hearty shake of the hand from the gallant general. The railway, on leaving Benares, passed for a little while along the valley of the Ganges. Through the windows of the carriage, the travellers had glimpses of the diversified landscape of Bihar, with its mountains clothed in verdure, its fields of barley, wheat, and corn, its jungles peopled with green alligators, its neat villages, and its thickly-leaved forests. Elephants were bathing in the waters of the sacred river, and groups of Indians, despite the advanced season in chilly air, were performing solemnly their pious ablutions. These were fervent Brahmins, the bitterest foes of Buddhism, their deities being Vishnu, the solar god, Shiva, the divine impersonation of natural forces, and the Brahma, the supreme ruler of priests and legislators. What would these divinities think of India, anglicized as it is today, with steamers whistling and scuttling along the Ganges, frightening the gulls which float upon its surface, the turtles swarming along its banks, and the faithful dwelling upon its borders? The panorama passed before their eyes like a flash, save when the steam concealed it fitfully from the view. The travellers could scarcely discern the fort of Chupinay, twenty miles southwestward from Benares, the ancient strongle horde of the Rajas of Bihar, or Gezipur, and from the famous rose water factories, or the tomb of Lord Cornwallis, resting on the left bank of the Ganges, the fortified town of Buxar, or Patna, a large manufacturing and trading place, where is held the principal opium market of India or Mongir, a more European town, for it is English, as Manchester or Birmingham, with black iron foundries, edge tool factories, and high chimneys puffing clouds of black smoke heavenward. Night came on. The train passed on at full speed, in the midst of a roaring of the tigers, bears, and wolves which fled before the locomotive, and the marbles of Bengal, Golnkara, ruined Gore, Moshirabad, the ancient capital, Baudouin, Hujli, and the French town of Chandragore where Passepartout would have been so proud to see his country's flag flying, were hidden from their view in the darkness. Calcutta was reached at seven in the morning, and the packet left for Hong Kong at noon, so that Phileas Fogg had five hours before him. According to his journal, he was due at Calcutta on the 25th of October, and that was the exact date of his actual arrival. He was therefore neither behind the hand nor ahead of time. The two days' game between London and Bombay had been lost, as had been seen in the journey across India, but it is not supposed that Phileas Fogg regretted them. End of chapter 14. Read by David Russell. For Lit to Go. Available on the web at fcit.usf.edu. Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne. Chapter 15. In which the bag of banknotes disgorges some thousands of pounds more. The train entered the station, and Passepartout, jumping out first, was followed by Mr. Fogg, who assisted his fair companion to descend. Phileas Fogg intended to proceed at once to the Hong Kong steamer, in order to get Aouda comfortably settled for the voyage. He was unwilling to leave her while they were still on dangerous ground. Just as he was leaving the station, a policeman came up to him and said, Mr. Phileas Fogg, I am he. 
Is this mine your servant? asked the policeman, pointing to Passepartout. Yes. Be so good, both of you, as to follow me. Mr. Fogg betrayed no surprise whatsoever. The policeman was a representative of the law, and the law is sacred to an Englishman. Passepartout tried to reason about him the matter, but the policeman tapped him with a stick, and Mr. Fogg made a signal to obey. May this young lady go with us? asked he. She may, replied the policeman. Mr. Fogg, Aouda, and Passepartout were conducted into a palkigari, a sort of four-wheeled carriage drawn by two horses, in which they took their places and were driven away. No one spoke during the twenty minutes which elapsed before they reached their destination. They first passed through the black town, with its narrow streets and miserable dirty huts and the squalid population, then through the European town, which presented a relief in its bright brick mansions, sheeted by coconut trees and bristling with masts, where, although it was early morning, elegantly dressed horsemen and handsome equipages were passing back and forth. The carriage stopped before a modest-looking house, which, however, did not have the appearance of a private mansion. The policeman, having requested his prisoners for so truly they might be so called to descend, conducted them into a room with barred windows and said, You will appear before Judge Obadiah at half-past eight. He then retired and closed the doors. Why, we are prisoners! exclaimed Passepartout, falling into a chair. Iota, with an emotion she tried to conceal, said to Mr. Fogg, Sir, you must leave me to my fate. It is on my account that you received this treatment. It is for helping save me. Phileas Fogg contented himself with saying that was impossible. It was quite unlikely that he should be arrested for preventing a sooty. The complainants would never dare present themselves with such a charge. There was some mistake. Moreover, he could not, in any event, abandon Aoda, but it would escort her to Hong Kong. But the steamer leaves at noon, observed Passepartout nervously. We shall be on board by noon, replied his master placidly. It was said so positively that Passepartout could not help but muttering to himself, Blah, blah, that's certain. Before noon we shall be on board. But he was no means reassured. At half-past eight the door opened. The policeman appeared, and requesting them to follow him, led the way to an adjoining hall. It was evidently a courtroom, and a crowd of Europeans and natives had already occupied the rear of the apartment. Mr. Fogg and his two companions took their places on a bench opposite the desks of the magistrate and his clerk. Immediately after, Judge Obadiah, a fat, round man, followed by the clerk, entered. He proceeded to take down a wig which was hanging on a nail, and put it hurriedly on his head. "'The first guys,' said he, then putting his hand to his head, exclaimed, "'Hey, this is not my wig.' And that, "'Now, your worship,' returned the clerk, it, "'it's mine.' "'My dear Mr. Oysterpuff, how can a judge give a wise sentence in a clerk's wigs?' The wigs were exchanged. Passepartout was getting nervous, for the hands on the face of the big clock over the judge seemed to go around with terrible rapidity. "'The first case,' repeated Judge Obadiah. "'Phidious Fogg?' demanded Oysterpuff. "'I am here,' replied Mr. Fogg. Passepartout? Present, responded Passepartout. Good, said the judge. You have been looked for, prisoners, for two days on the trains from Bombay. But of what thou be accused? asked Passepartout impatiently. You are about to be informed. I am an English subject, sir, said Mr. Fogg, and I have the right. Have you been ill-treated? Not at all. Very well. Let the complainants come in. A door was swung open by the order of the judge, and three Indian priests entered. That's it, muttered Passepartout. These are the rogues who are going to burn our young lady? The priests took their places in front of the judge, and clerk proceeded to read a loud voice, a complaint of sacrilege against Phileas Fogg and his servant, who was accused of having violated a place held consecrated by the Brahmin religion. Do you hear the charge? Yes, sir, replied Mr. Fogg, consulting his watch, and I admit it. You admit it? I admit it. Then I wish to hear these priests admit it, in their turn, what they are going to do at the pagoda of the Pelagi. The priests looked at each other. They did not seem to understand what was said. Yes, cried Passepartout warmly, at the begot of Pelagi, where they were on the point of burning their victim. The judge stared with astonishment, and the priests were stupefied. What victim? said Judge Obadiah. Burn whom? In Bombay itself? Bombay, cried Passepartout. Certainly. We're not talking of the pagoda at Pelagi, but of the pagoda at Mambar Hill at Bombay. And as a proof, added the kirk, here the desecrator's very shoes which he left behind him. Whereupon he placed a pair of shoes on his desk. "'My shoes!' cried Passepartout, in his surprise, permitting this imprudent exclamation to escape him. The confusion of master and man, who had quite forgotten the affair at Bombay, for which they were now detained at Calcutta, may be imagined. 
Fix, the detective, had foreseen the advantage which Passepartout's escapade gave him, and, delaying his departure for twelve hours, had consulted the priests of Malabar Hill, knowing that the English authorities dealt very severely with this kind of misdemeanor. He promised them a goodly sum in damages, and sent them forward to Calcutta by the next train, owing to the delay caused by the rescue of the young widow. Fix and the priests reached the Indian capital before Mr. Fogg and his servants. The magistrates, having already been warned by a dispatch to arrest them should they arrive, Fix's disappointment when he learned that Phileas Fogg had not made his appearance in Calcutta may be imagined. He made up his mind had the robbers stopped somewhere on the route and taken refuge in the southern provinces. For twenty-four hours Fix watched the station with feverish anxiety. At last he was rewarded by seeing Mr. Fogg and Passepartout arrive, accompanied by a young woman, whose presence he was wholly at a loss to explain. He hastened for a policeman, and this was how the party came to be arrested and brought before Judge Obadiah. Had Passepartout been a little less preoccupied, he would have espied the detective ensconced in a corner of the courtroom, watching the proceedings with an interest easily understood, for the warrant had failed to reach him at Calcutta, as it had done in Bombay and Suez. Judge Obadiah had unfortunately caught Passepartout's rash exclamation, which the poor fellow would have given the world to recall. "'The facts are admitted?' asked the judge. "'Admitted,' replied Mr. Fogg coldly. It is much, resumed the judge, as the English law protects equally the sternly the religions of the Indian people, and as the man Passepartout has admitted that he violated the sacred pagoda of the Malabar Hill at Bombay on the 20th of October, I condemn the said Passepartout to imprisonment for fifteen days and a fine of three hundred pounds. Three hundred pounds, cried Passepartout, startled at the largeness of the sum. Solid, shouted the constable. And inasmuch, continued the judge, and is not proved, and the act was not done by the convenience of the master with the servant, and as the master in any case must be held responsible for the acts of his paid servant, I condemn Phileas Fogg to a week's imprisonment and a fine of one hundred and fifty pounds. Fix rubbed his hands softly with satisfaction. If Phileas Fogg could be detained in Calcutta for a week, it would be more than time for the warrant to arrive. Passepartout was stupefied. This sentence ruined his master. A wage of twenty thousand pounds lost, because he, like a precious fool, had gone in that abominable pagoda. Phileas Fogg, as self-composed as if the judgment did not in the least concern him, did not even lift his eyebrows while it was being pronounced. Just as the clerk was calling the next case, he rose and said, I offer bail. You have that right, returned the judge. Fix his blood ran cold, but he resumed his composure when he heard the judge announce that the bail required for each prisoner would be one thousand pounds. I will pay it at once said Mr. Fogg, taking a roll of bank bills from the carpet-bag which Passepartout had by him, and placing them on the clerk's desk. "'The sum will be restored to you upon your release from prison,' said the jail. "'Meanwhile, you are liberated on bail. Come,' said Phileas Fogg to a servant. "'But let them at least give me my black shoes,' cries Passepartout angrily. "'Ah, these are pretty dear shoes,' he muttered, as they were handed to him. "'More than a thousand pounds apiece. Besides, they pinch my feet.' Mr. Fogg, offering his arm to Aoda, then departed, followed by the crestfallen Passepartout, fixed still nourished hopes that the robber would not, after all, leave the two thousand pounds behind him, but would decide to serve out his week in jail, and issued forth on Mr. Fogg's traces. That gentleman took a carriage, and the party were soon landed on one of the quays. The Rangoon was moored half a mile off in the harbour, its signal of departure hoisted at the masthead. Eleven o'clock was striking. Mr. Fogg was an hour in advance of time. Fix saw them leave the carriage and push off on a boat for the steamer, and stamped his feet with disappointment. "'A rascal is off, after all,' he exclaimed. Two thousand pounds sacrificed. He's a prodigal as a thief. I'll follow him to the end of the world if necessary, but at the rate he's going on, his stolen money will soon be exhausted.' The detective was not far wrong in making this conjecture. Since leaving London, what with travelling expenses, bribes, the purchase of an elephant, bales, and fines, Mr. Fogg had already spent more than five thousand pounds on the way, and the percentage of the sum recovered from the bank robber promised to the detectives was rapidly diminishing. End of chapter 15. Read by David Russell. For Lit to Go. Available on the web at fcit.usf.edu. Around the World in Eighty Days, by Jules Verne, Chapter 16, in which Fix does not seem to understand in the least what is said to him. 
The Rangoon, one of the Peninsula and Oriental Company's boats plying in the Chinese and Japanese seas, was a screw steamer built of iron weighing about 1,770 tons and with engines of 400 horsepower. She was as fast but not well fitted up as the Mongolia, and Eudu was not comfortably provided for on board as her as Phileas Fogg would have liked. However, the trip from Calcutta to Hong Kong only compromised some 3,500 miles, occupying from 10 to 12 days, and the young woman was not difficult to please. During the first days of the journey, it had become better acquainted with her protector, and constantly gave evidence of her deep gratitude for which he had done. The phlegmatic gentleman listened to her, apparently at least with coldness, neither his voice nor his manner betraying the slightest emotion, but he seemed to be always on the watch that nothing could be wanting to aid his comfort. He visited her regularly each day at certain hours, not so much to talk himself, but as to sit and hear her talk. He treated her with the strictest politeness, but with the precision of an automaton, the movements of which had been arranged for this purpose. Iota did not quite know what to make of him, though. Passepartout had given her some hints of the master's eccentricity, and made her smile by telling her of the wager which was sending him around the world. After all, she owed Phileas Fogg her life, since she would always regard him through the exalting medium of her gratitude. Aoda confirmed that the Parsi's narrative of her touching history, she did indeed belong to the highest of the native races of India. Many of the Parsi merchants have made great fortunes there by dealing in cotton, and one of them, Sir James D. G. G. Hiboy, was a baronet of the English government. Aoda was a relative of this great man, and it was his cousin Gigi whom she hoped to join at Hong Kong. Whether she would find a protector in him she could not tell, but Mr. Fogg essayed to calm her anxieties and to assure her that everything would be mathematically, he used the very word arranged. Ayuda fastened her great eyes clear as the sacred lakes of the Himalaya upon him, but the intractable fog as reserved as ever did not seem at all inclined to throw himself into this lake. The first few days of the voyage passed prosperously, amid favorable weather and propitious winds, and they soon came in sight of the great Andaman, the principal of the islands of the Bay of Bengal, with its picturesque saddle peak, 2,400 feet high, looming above the waters. The steamer passed along the shores, but the savage Papuans, who are in the lowest scale of humanity, but are not, as been asserted, cannibals, did not make their appearance. The panorama of the islands as they steamed by them was superb. Vast forts of palms, arex, bamboo, teakwood, and of the giant mimosa and tree-like ferns covered the foreground, while behind the graceful outlines of the mountains were traced against the sky, and along the coast swarmed by thousands of the precious swallows, whose nest furnished a luxurious dish to the tables of the celestial empire. The varied landscape afforded by the Andaman Islands was soon passed, however, and the Rangoon rapidly approached the Straits of Malacca, which gave the access to the China Seas. What was Detective Fix, so unluckily drawn on from country to country, doing all this while? He had managed to embark on the Rangoon at Calcutta without being seen by Passepartout, after leaving orders that if the warrant should arrive it should be forwarded to him at Hong Kong, and he hoped to conceal his presence to the end of the voyage. It would have been difficult to explain why he was on board without awakening Passepartout's suspicions. We thought him still at Bombay, but necessity impelled him nevertheless to renew his acquaintance with the worthy servant, as will be seen. All the detective's hopes and wishes were now centered on Hong Kong, for the steamer's stay in Singapore would be too brief to enable him to take any steps there. The arrest must be made at Hong Kong, or the robber would probably escape him forever. Hong Kong was the last English ground on which he would set foot beyond China, Japan. America offered to fog a most certain refuge. If the warrant should at last make its appearance at Hong Kong, Fix could arrest him and give him to the hands of the local police, and there would be no further trouble. But beyond Hong Kong, a simple warrant would be of no avail. An extradition warrant would be necessary, and then would result in delays and obstacles of which the rascal could have taken advantage of to elude justice. Fix thought these probabilities over during the long hours which he spent in his cabin, and kept repeating to himself, now either the warrant will be at Hong Kong, in which case I shall arrest my man, or it will not be there. And this time is it absolutely necessary that I should delay his departure. I have failed the Bombay, which I have failed at Calcutta. If I fail at Hong Kong, my reputation is lost. Cost what it may, I must succeed. But how shall I prevent his departure, if that should turn out to be my last resource? Fix made up his mind if worse came to worse, he would make a confidant of Passepartout and tell him what kind of fellow his master really was. That Passepartout was not Fogg's accomplice. He was very certain. The servant, enlightened by disclosure and afraid of being himself implicated in the crime, would doubtless become an ally of the detective. But this method was a dangerous one, only to be employed when everything else had failed. A word from Passepartout to his master would ruin it all. The detective was therefore a sore strait, but suddenly a new idea struck him. The presence of Aoto and the Rangoon in company with Phileas Fogg gave him new material for reflection. Who was this woman? What combination of events had made her Fogg's traveling companion? Had they not evidently met somewhere between Bombay and Calcutta? But where? Had they met accidentally, or had Fogg gone into some interior purpose of quest of the charming damsel? Fix was fairly puzzled. He asked himself whether there had been not a wicked elopement 
and this idea so impressed itself upon his mind that he was determined to make use of the supposed intrigue. Whether the young woman were married or not, he would be able to treat such difficulties with Mr. Fogg at Hong Kong that he could not escape by paying any amounts of money. But he could even wait until they reached Hong Kong. Fogg had an abominable way of jumping from one boat to the other, and before anything could be effected, might get full underway for Yokohama. Fix decided that he must warn the English authorities, and signal the Rangoon before her arrival. This was easy to do, since the steamer stopped at Singapore, whence there was a telegraphic wire to Hong Kong. He finally resolved, moreover, before acting more positively, to question Passepartout. It would not be difficult to make him talk, as there was no time to lose, Fix prepared himself to make known. It was now the 30th of October, and on the day following, the Rangoon was due at Singapore. Fix emerged from his cabin and went onto the deck. Passepartout was promenading up and down the forward part of the steamer. The detective rushed forward with every appearance of extreme surprise and exclaimed, "'You here on the Rangoon!' "'What, ah, Monsieur Fix, are you on board?' returned the really astonished Passepartout, recognizing his crony of the Magnolia. "'Why, I left you in Bombay, and here you are, on the way to Hong Kong. "'Are you going round the world, too?' "'No, no,' replied Fix. "'I shall stop at Hong Kong, at least for some days.' "'Hm,' said Passepartout, who seemed for an instant perplexed, "'but how it is I have not seen you on board since we left Calcutta.' Oh, a trifle of seasickness. I've been staying in my berth. The Gulf of Bengal does not agree with me as well as the Indian Ocean. And how is Mr. Fogg? As well and as punctual as ever, and not a day behind time. But, Monsieur Fix, you don't know that we have a young lady with us. A young lady, replied the detective, not seeming to comprehend what was said. Passepartout thereupon recounted Iota's history, the affair at the Bombay Pagoda, the purchase of the elephant for two thousand pounds, the rescue, the arrest, and sentence of the Calcutta court, and the restoration of Mr. Fogg and himself to liberty on bail. Fix, who was familiar with the last events, seemed to be equally ignorant of all that Passepartout related. The lady was charmed to find so interested a listener. But does your master propose to carry this young woman to Europe? Not at all. We are simply going to place her under the protection of one of her relatives, a rich merchant at Hong Kong. Nothing to be done there, said Fix to himself, concealing his disappointment. A glass of gin, Mr. Passepartout? Willingly, Monsieur Fix. We must at least have a friendly glass on board the Rangoon. End of chapter 16 Read by David Russell for Lit to Go. Available on the web at fcit.usf.edu. Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne, Chapter 17, showing what happened on the voyage from Singapore to Hong Kong. The detective and Passepartout met often on deck after this interview. Though Fix was reserved and did not attempt to induce his companion to divulge any more facts concerning Mr. Fogg, he caught a glimpse of that mysterious gentleman once or twice. But Mr. Fogg usually confirmed himself to the cabin, where he kept Aouda company, or, according to his inverted habit, took a hand at twist. Passepartout began very seriously to conjecture what strange chance kept Fix still on the route that his master was pursuing. It was really worth considering why this certain very amiable, complacent person, whom he had first met in Suez, and then had encountered aboard the Mongolia, who disembarked at Bombay, which announced at his destination, now turned up so unexpectedly on the Rangoon, was following Mr. Fogg's track step by step. What was Fix's object? Passepartout was ready to wager his Indian shoes, which he religiously preserved, that Fix would also leave Hong Kong at the same time with them, and probably on the same steamer. Passepartout might have cudgelled his brain for a century without hitting upon the real object which the detective had in view. He could have never imagined that Phileas Fogg was being tracked as a robber around the globe. But, as it is in human nature to attempt the solution of every mystery, Passepartout suddenly discovered an explanation of Fix's movements, which was, in truth, far from unreasonable. Fix, he thought, could only be an agent of Mr. Fogg's friends at the Reform Club, sent to follow him up, and ascertain that he really went around the world that has been agreed upon. "'It's clear,' repeated the worthy silverman to himself, proud of his shrewdness. "'He's a spy sent to keep us in view. "'That isn't quite the thing, either, to be spying on Mr. Fogg, who is so honourable a man. "'Ah, gentlemen of the Reform, this shall cost you dear.' Passepartout, enchanted with his discovery, revolved to say nothing to his master, lest he should be justly offended at the mistrust on part of his adversaries. But he determined to chaff Fix whenever he had the chance, with mysterious illusions which, however, need not betray his real suspicions. During the afternoon of Wednesday, 30th October, the Rangoon entered the Strait of Malacca, which separates the peninsula of that name from Sumatra. The mountainous and craggy islets intercepted the beauties of this noble land from the view of travellers. The Rangoon weighed anchor at Singapore the next day at 4 a.m. to receive coal, having gained a half-day on the prescribed time of her arrival. Phileas Fogg noted the gain in this journal, and then accompanied by Aouda, who had traded desire for a walk on shore, disembarked. Fix, who suspected Mr. Fogg's every movement, followed them cautiously without being himself perceived, while Passepartout, laughing in at his sleeve at Fix's maneuvers, went about his usual errands. 
The island of Singapore is not imposing in aspect, for there are no mountains, yet its appearance is not without attractions. It is a park checkered by pleasant highways and avenues. A handsome carriage, drawn by a sleek pair of New Holland horses, carried Phineas Fogg and Aoud into the midst of rose and palms with bright foliage and of clove trees, where of the cloves from the heart of a half-open flower, pepper pans replaced the prickly hedges of European fields. Sago bushes, large ferns with gorgeous branches, varied the aspect of this tropical clime, while nutmeg trees and full foliage filled the air with a penetrating perfume. Agile and grinning bands of monkeys skipped about the trees, nor were tigers wanting in the jungles. After a drive of two hours through the country, Aoud and Mr. Fogg returned to the town, which is a vast collection of heavy-looking irregular houses, surrounded by charming gardens rich in tropical fruits and plants, and at ten o'clock they re-embarked, closely followed by the detective, who had kept them constantly in sight. Passepartout, who had been purchasing several dozen mangoes, a fruit as large as good-sized apples of a dark brown color outside and a bright red within, and whose white pulp melting in the mouth affords gourmands a delicious sensation, was waiting for them on deck. He was only too glad to offer some mangoes to Aoda, who thanked him very gratefully for them. At eleven o'clock the Rangoon roared out of Singapore Harbor, and in a few hours the high mountains of Malacca, with their forests, inhabited by the most beautifully furred tigers in the world, were lost to view. Singapore is distant, some thirteen hundred miles from the island of Hong Kong, which is a little English colony near the Chinese coast. Phileas Fogg hoped to accomplish the journey in six days, so as to be home in time for the steamer which would leave on the 6th of November to Yokohama, the principal Japanese port. The Rangoon had a large quarter of passengers, many of whom disembarked at Singapore, among them a usual number of Indians, Silanese, Chinamen, Malays, and Portuguese, mostly second-class travelers. The weather, which had hitherto been fine, changed with the last quarter of the moon. The sea rolled heavily, and the wind at intervals almost rose to a storm, but happily blew from the southwest, and thus aided the steamer's progress. The captain, as often as possible, put up the sails, and under the double action of steam and sail, the vessel made rapid progress along the coasts of Annam and Cochin, China. Owing to the defective construction of the Rangoon, however, unusual precautions became necessary in unfavorable weather. For the loss of time which resulted from this cause, while it nearly drove Passepartout out of his senses, did not seem to affect his new master in the least. Passepartout blamed the captain, the engineer, and the crew, and consigned all who were connected with the ship to the land where the pepper grows. Perhaps the thought of gas, which was remorselessly burning at expense in Seville Row, had something to do with his hot impatience. "'You're in a great hurry, then,' said Fix to him one day, to reach Hong Kong." A very great hurry. Mr. Fogg, I suppose, is anxious to catch the steamer for Yokohama. Terribly anxious. You believe in this journey around the world, then? Absolutely. Don't you, Mr. Fix? I don't believe a word of it. You're a sly dog, said Passepartout, winking at him. The expression rather disturbed Fix, without his knowing why. Had the Frenchman guessed his real purpose? He knew not what to think. But how could Passepartout have discovered that he was a detective? Yet in speaking as he did, the man evidently meant more than he expressed. Passepartout still went further the next day. He could not hold his tongue. Mr. Fix, he said in a bantering tone, shall we be unfortunate as to lose you when we get to Hong Kong? Why, responded Fix, a little embarrassed, I don't know, perhaps. Ah, if you could only go all the way with us. An agent of the Peninsular Company, you know, can't stop on the way. If we were only going to Bombay, and here you are in China, America is not far off, and from America to Europe is only a step. Fix looked intently at his companion, whose countenance was as serene as possible, and laughed with him, but Passepartout persisted in chafing him by asking if he had made such by his recent occupation. Yes and no, returned Fix. There is good and bad luck in such things, but you must understand that I don't travel at my own expense. Oh, I am quite sure of that, cried Passepartout, cried heartily. Fix, fairly puzzled, descended to his cabin and gave himself up to his reflections. He was evidently suspected somehow or the other that the Frenchman had found out that he was a detective. But had he told his master? What part was he playing in all this? Was he an accomplice or not? Was the game then up? Fix spent several hours turning these over in his mind, sometimes thinking that all was lost and presenting himself that Fogg was ignorant of his presence, and decided what course was best to take. Nevertheless, he preserved his coolness of mind, and at last resolved to deal plainly with Passepartout. If he did not find it practicable to arrest Fogg at Hong Kong, and if Fogg made preparations to leave that last foothold of the English territory, he, Fix, would tell Passepartout all. Either the servant was the accomplice of his master, and in the case his master knew of his operations and he should fail, or else the servant knew nothing about the robbery, then his interest would be in to abandon the robber. Such was the situation between Fix and Passepartout. Meanwhile, Phileas Fogg moved about them in the most majestic and unconscious indifference. He was passing methodically in his orbit around the world, regardless of the lesser stars which gravitated around him. Yet there was near by which astronomers would call a disturbing star, which might produce an agitation in this gentleman's heart. But no, the charms of Iota failed to act. To Vasparto's great surprise and the disturbances, if they existed, would have been more difficult to calculate than those of Uranus which led to the discovery of Neptune. 
It was every day an increasing wonder to Passepartout, who read in Aoda's eyes the depth of her gratitude to his master. Phileas Fogg, though brave and gallant must be, he thought, quite heartless. As to the sentiment which this journey might have awakened in him, there is clearly no trace of such a thing, while poor Passepartout existed in perpetual reveries. One day he was leaning on the railing of the engine room, and I was observing the engine when a sudden pitch of the steamer threw the screw out of the water, and the steam came hissing out of the valves. This made Passepartout indignant. "'The valves are not sufficiently charged,' he exclaimed. "'We are not going. Oh, these English. If this was an American craft, we should blow up. Perhaps, but we should all events go faster.'" End of chapter 17. Read by David Russell. For Lit to Go. Available on the web at fcit.usf.edu. Around the World in Eighty Days, by Jules Verne, Chapter 18, in which Phileas Fogg, Passepartout, and Fix go each about his business. The weather was bad during the latter days of the voyage. The wind, abstainly remaining in the northwest, blew a gale and retarded the steamer. The Rangoon rolled heavily with the passengers who became impatient of the long, monstrous waves which the wind raised before their path. A sort of tempest arose on the 3rd of November, the squall knocking the vessel about with fury, and the waves running high. The Rangoon reefed all her sails, and even the rigging proved too much, whistling and shaking amid the squall. The steamer was forced to proceed slowly, and the captain estimated that she would reach Hong Kong in twenty hours behind time, and more if the storm lasted. Phileas Fogg gazed at the tempestuous sea, which seemed to be struggling, especially to delay him. With his habitual tranquillity, he never changed countenance for an instance, though a delay of twenty hours by making him too late for the Yokohama boat would most inevitably cause the loss of the wager, but this man had a nerve manifested neither in impatience nor annoyance. It seemed as if the storm were part of his program and had been foreseen. Aida was amazed to find him calm as he had been from the first time she saw him. Fix did not look at the state of things in the same light. The storm greatly pleased him. His satisfaction would have been complete had the Rangoon been forced to retreat before the violence of wind and waves. Each delay filled him with hope, for it became more and more probable that Fogg would be obliged to remain some days at Hong Kong. And now the heavens themselves became his allies. With the gusts and squalls, it mattered not that they made him seasick. He made no account of this inconvenience, and whilst the body was writhing under the effects, his spirit bounded with hopeful exultation. Passepartout was arranged beyond expression at the unperceptuous weather. Everything had gone so well till now. Earth and sea had seemed to be at his master's service. Steamers and railways obeyed him. Wind and steam united to speed his journey. Had the hour of adversity come, Passepartout was as much excited as if the 20,000 pounds were to come from his own pocket. The storm exasperated him. Gale made him furious. How he longed to lash the obstinate sea into obedience. Poor fellow. Fix carefully concealed from his own satisfaction, for he had betrayed it. Passepartout could scarcely have restrained himself from personal violence. Passepartout remained on deck as long as the tempest lasted, being unable to remain quiet below and taking it to his head to aid the progress of the ship by lending a hand with the crew. He overwhelmed the captain, officers, and sailors who could not help laughing at his impatience with all sorts of questions. He wanted to know exactly how long the storm was going to last, whereupon he referred to the barometer, which seemed to have no intent of rising. Passepartout shook it, but with no perceivable effect, for neither shaking nor maledictions could prevail upon it to change its mind. On the fourth, however, the sea became more calm, and the storm lessened its violence. The wind reared southward and was once more favorable. Passepartout cleared up with his weather, some of the sails were unfurled, and the Rangoon resumed its most rapid speed. The time loss could not, however, be regained. Land was not signaled until five o'clock. On the morning of the sixth, the steamer was due on the fifth. Phileas Fogg was twenty-four hours behind hand, and the Oklahoma steamer would, of course, be missed. The pilot went on board at six and took his place on the bridge to guide the Rangoon through the channels of the port of Hong Kong. Passepartout longed to ask him if the steamer had left for Yokohama, but he dared not, for he wished to preserve the stark of hope, which still remained to the last moment. He had confided his anxiety to Fix, who, the sly rascal, tried to console him by saying that Mr. Fogg would be in time if he took the next boat, but this only put Passepartout in a passion. Mr. Fogg, bolder than his servant, did not hesitate to approach the pilot and tranquilly ask him if he knew whether a steamer would leave Hong Kong for Yokohama. At Hyde Hyde tomorrow morning, answered the pilot, Ah, said Mr. Fogg without betraying any astonishment. Passepartout, who had heard what passed, would willingly have embraced the pilot, while Fix would have been glad to twist his neck. What is the steamer's name? asked Mr. Fogg. The Carnatic. Ought she not to have gone yesterday? Yes, sir, but they had to repair one of her boilers, so her departure was postponed till tomorrow. Thank you, returned Mr. Fogg, descending mathematically to the saloon. Passepartout clasped the pilot's hand and shook it heartily in his delight, exclaiming, Pilot, you are the best of good fellows. The pilot probably does not know to this day why his responses won him the enthusiastic greeting. He remounted the bridge and guided the steamer through the flotilla of junks, tankers, and fishing boats, which crowd the harbor of Hong Kong. At one o'clock, the Rangoon was in the quay, and the passengers were going ashore. Chance had strangely favored Phileas Fogg, for he had not the car not been forced to lie of, 
over for repairing her boilers, she would have left on the 6th of November, and the passengers for Japan would have been obliged to wait for a week in the sailing of the next steamer. Mr. Fogg was, it is true, 24 hours behind his time, but could not seriously imperil the remainder of his tour. The steamer which crossed the Pacific from Yokohama to San Francisco made a direct connection with that from Hong Kong, and it could not sail until the latter reached Yokohama. If Mr. Fogg was 24 hours late on reaching Yokohama, this time would no doubt be easily regained on the voyage of 22 days across the Pacific. He found himself, then, about 24 hours behindhand, 35 days after leaving London. The Carnatic was announced to leave Hong Kong at 5 the next morning. Mr. Fogg had 16 hours into which to attend his business there, which was to deposit Aouda safely with her wealthy relative. On landing, he conducted her to a palaquin, in which they repaired to the club hotel, a room that was engaged for the young woman, and Mr. Fogg, after seeing that she wanted for nothing, set out in search of her cousin Gigi. He instructed Passporteau to remain at the hotel until his return, and they would or maybe not be left entirely alone. Mr. Fogg repaired to the exchange, where he did not doubt everyone would know so wealthy and considerable a personage as the Parsi merchant. Meeting a broker, he made inquiry to learn that Gigi had left China two years before, and retiring from business with an immense fortune, had taken up his residence in Europe. In Holland, the broker thought, with the merchants of which country he had principally traded. Phileas Fogg returned to his hotel, begged a moment of conversation with Iuda, and without more ado, apprised her that Gigi was no longer in Hong Kong, but probably in Holland. Iuda at first said nothing. She passed her hand across her forehead and reflected a few moments. Then her sweet, soft voice, she said, What I to do, Mr. Fogg? It's very simple, responded the gentleman. Go on to Europe. But I cannot intrude. You do not intrude, nor do you at least embarrass my project. Passepartout, monsieur, go to the Carnatic and engage three cabins. Passepartout, delighted that the young woman, who was very gracious to him, was going to continue the journey with him, went off in a brisk gait to obey his master's order. End of chapter 18. Read by David Russell. For Lit to Go. Available on the web at fcit.usf.edu. Around the World in 80 Days, by Jules Verne, Chapter 19, in which Passepartout takes too great an interest in his master and what comes of it. Hong Kong is an island which came into the possession of the English by the Treaty of Nankin after the War of 1842, and the colonizing genius of the English had created upon an important city at an excellent port. The island is situated at the mouth of the Canton River, and it is separated by about 60 miles from the Portuguese town of Maoko, on the opposite coast. Hong Kong has been in Maoko in the struggle for Chinese trade, and now the greater part of the transportation of Chinese goods finds a depot at the former place. Docks, hospitals, wharves, a Gothic cathedral, a government house, macadamized streets give to Hong Kong the appearance of a town in Kent or Surrey transferred by some strange magic to the Antipodes. Passepartout wandered with his hands in his pockets towards the Victoria port, and gazing as he went at the curious palaquins and other modes of conveyance, and the groups of Chinese, Japanese, and Europeans who passed to and fro in the streets. Hong Kong seemed not to unlike Bombay, Calcutta, and Singapore, since, like them, it betrayed everywhere the evidence of English supremacy. At the Victoria port he found a confused mass of ships of all nations— English, French, American, and Dutch men of war trading vessels, Japanese and Chinese junk, sempas, tankas, and flower boats, which formed so many floating parteras. Passepartout noticed in the crowd of number of the natives, who seemed very old and were dressed in yellow. On going into a barber's to get shaved, he learned that these ancient men were at least 80 years old, at which age they are permitted to wear yellow, which is the imperial color. Passepartout, without exactly knowing why, thought this was very funny. Upon reaching the quay where they were to embark in the Carnatic, he was not astonished to find Fix washing up and down. The detective seemed much disturbed and disappointed. This is bad, muttered Passepartout, for the gentleman of the Reform Club. He accosted Fix with a merry smile, as if he had not perceived the gentleman's chagrin. The detective had indeed good reasons to invade and invest in the bad luck which pursued him. The warrant had not come. It was certainly on its way, but it certainly would not reach Hong Kong for several days, and this being the last English territory on Mr. Fogg's route, the robber would escape unless he could manage to detain him. Well, Monsieur Fix, said Passepartout, have you decided to go with us so far as America? Yes, returned Fix through his set teeth. Good, exclaimed Passepartout, laughing heartily. I knew you could not persuade yourself to separate from us. Come and engage your berth. They entered the steamer office and secured cabins for four persons. The clerk, as he gave them the tickets, informed them that the repairs on the Carnatic having been completed, the steamer would leave that very evening, and not next morning as had been announced. That will suit my master all the better, said Passepartout. I will go and let him know. Fix now decided to make a bold move. He resolved to tell Passepartout all. It seemed to be the only possible means of keeping Phileas Fogg several days longer at Hong Kong. He accordingly invited his companion to a tavern which caught on the eye of the quay. Upon entering, they found themselves in a large room handsomely decorated, at the end of which was a large camp bed furnished with cushions. Several persons lay upon this bed in a deep sleep. At the small tables which were arranged around the room, some thirty customers were drinking English 
beer, porter, gin, and brandy, smoking, the while long red clay pipe stuffed with little balls of opium mingled with the essence of rose. From time to time, one of the smokers overcome with the narcotic would slip under the table, whereupon the waiters, taking him by the head and feet, carried him and laid him upon the bed. The bed already supported twenty of these stupefied salts. Fix and Passepartout saw that they were in the smoking house, haunted by those wretched, cadaverous, idiotic creatures to whom the English merchants sell every year the miserable bro- drug called opium, to the amount of one million four hundred thousand pounds. Thousands devoted the most despicable vices which afflict humanity. The Chinese government has a vain attempt to deal with the evil by stringent laws. It passed gradually from the rich, to whom it was at first exclusively reserved, to the lower classes, and then its ravages could not be arrested. Opium is smoked everywhere, all the times, by men and women. In the celestial empire, and once accustomed to it, the victims cannot dispense with it, except by suffering horrible bodily contortions and agonies. A great smoker can smoke as many as eight pipes a day, but he dies in five years. It was in one of these dens that Fix and Passepartout, in search of a friendly glass, found themselves. Passepartout had no money, but willingly accepted Fix's invitation and of hope of returning the obligation in some future time. They ordered two bottles of port, to which the Frenchman did ample justice, while Fix observed him with close attention. They chatted about the journey, and Passepartout was especially merry at the idea that Fix was going to continue it with him. When the bottles were empty, however, he rose to go and tell his master of the change in the time and the sailing of the Carnatic. Fix caught him by the arm. Wait a moment. What for, Mr. Fix? I want to have a serious talk with you. A serious talk, cried Passepartout, drinking up a little wine that was left in the bottom of his glass. Well, we'll talk about it tomorrow. I haven't time now. Stay. What I have to say concerns your master. Passepartout at this looked attentively at his companion. Fix's face seemed to have a singular expression. He resumed his seat. What have you to say? Fix placed his hand upon Passepartout's arms and, lowering his voice, said, You have guessed who I am. Parbleu, said Passepartout, smiling. Then I'm going to tell you everything. Now that I know everything... My friend, ah, that's very good, but go on, go on. First, let me tell you that these gentlemen have put themselves to a useless expense. Useless, said Fix. You speak confidently. It's clear you don't know how large the sum is. Of course I do, returned Passepartout. Twenty thousand pounds. Fifty-five thousand, answered Fix, pressing his companion's hands. What, cried the Frenchman, had his monsieur fog dared. Fifty-five thousand pounds. Well, there's all the more reason for not losing an instant. He continued getting up hastily. Fix pushed Passepartout back in his chair and resumed, fifty-five thousand pounds, and if I succeed, I'll get two thousand pounds. If you'll help me, I'll let you have five hundred of them. Help you, cried Passepartout, whose eyes were standing wide open. Yes, help me keep Mr. Fogg here for two or three more days. Why, what are you saying? These gentlemen are not satisfied with following my master and suspecting his honor. They must try to put obstacles in his way. I blush for them. What do you mean? I mean this is a piece of shameful trickery. They might as well... Waylay Mr. Fogg and put his money in their pockets. That's just what we count on doing. It's a conspiracy, then, cried Passepartout, who became more and more excited as the liquor mounted in his head, and for he drank without perceiving it. A real conspiracy, and gentlemen, too. Bah! Fix began to be puzzled. Members of the Reform Club, continued Passepartout, you must know, Monsieur Fix, that my master is an honest man, and that when he makes a wager, he tries to win it fairly. But who do you think I am? asked Fix, looking at him intently. Parbleau, an agent of the members of the Reform Club, sent here to interrupt my master's journey. But I thought I found you out some time ago. I've taken good care to say nothing about it to Mr. Fogg. He knows nothing, then? Nothing, replied Passepartout. Again emptying a glass, the detective passed his hands across his forehead. Hesitating before he spoke again, what should he do? Passepartout's mistake seemed sincere, but it has made his design more difficult. It was evident that the servant was not the master's accomplice, as Fix had been inclined to suspect. Well, said the detective to himself, as he is not his accomplice, he will help me. He had no time to lose. Fogg must be detained in Hong Kong, so resolved to make a clean breast of it. Listen to me. I am, as not as you think, an agent of the members of the Reform Club. Bah, retorted Passepartout with an air of raillery. I'm a police detective sent out here by a London office. You a detective? I will prove it. Here's my commission. Passepartout was speechless with astonishment when Fix displayed his document, the genuineness of which could not be doubted. Mr. Fogg's wager, resumed Fix, is only a pretext of which you and the gentlemen of the Reform are dupes. He had a motive for securing your innocent complicity. But why? Listen, on the 28th of September, a robbery of 55,000 pounds was committed at the Bank of England by a person whose description was unfortunately secured. Here is his description. It answers exactly to that of Mr. Phileas Fogg. What nonsense, cried Passepartout. My master is the most honorable of men. How can you tell? You know scarcely anything about him. He went into his service the day he came away, and he came away in a foolish pretext, without trunks and carrying a large amount of banknotes. And yet you are bold enough to assert that he is an honest man? Yes, yes, repeated the poor fellow melancholy. Would you like to be arrested as accomplice? Passepartout, overcome by what he had heard, held his head between his hands and did not dare look at the detective. Phileas Fogg, the saver of Iota, that brave and generous man a robber, and yet how many presumptions there were against him. Passepartout essayed to reject the suspicions which forced themselves upon his mind. He did not wish to believe his master was guilty. Well, what do you want of me? He said it with the last with an effort. 
See here, I have tracked Mr. Falk to this place, but I have yet to fail to receive the warrant of arrest for which I have sent to London. You must help me to keep him here in Hong Kong. I, but I will share you with the 2,000 pounds reward offered by the Bank of England. Never, replied Passepartout, who tried to rise but fell back, exhausted in mind and body. Mr. Fix, he stammered, even what you should say is true. My master is really the robber you are seeking, which I deny. I have been am in his service. I have seen his generosity and his goodness, and I will never betray him, not for all the gold in the world. I come from a village where they don't eat that kind of bread. You refuse? I refuse. Consider that I had said nothing, said Fix, and let us drink. Yes, let us drink. Passepartout felt himself yielding more and more to the effects of the liquor. Fix, seeing that he must at all hazards be separated from his master, wished to entirely overcome him. Some pipes full of opium lay on the table. Fix slipped one into Passepartout's hands. He took it, put it between his lips, lit it, and drew several puffs, and his head, becoming very heavy under the influence of the narcotic, fell upon the table. At last, said Fix, seeing Passepartout's unconscious. Mr. Fogg will not be informed of his karmatic's departure, and if he is, he will have to go on without his cursed Frenchman. And after paying his bill, Fix left the tavern. End of chapter 19. Read by David Russell. For Lit to Go. Available on the web at fcit.usf.edu. Around the World in 80 Days. By Jules Verne. Chapter 20. In which Fix comes face to face with Phileas Fogg. While these events were passing at the opium house, Mr. Fogg, unconscious of the danger he was in losing the steamer, was quietly escorting Aoda about the streets of the English quarter, making necessary purchases for the long voyage before them. It was all very well for an Englishman like Mr. Fogg to make the tour of the world with a carpet bag. A lady could not be expected to travel comfortably in such conditions. He acquitted his task with characteristic serenity, and invariably replied to the remonstrances of his fair companion, who was confused by his patience and generosity. It is in the interest of my money, a part of my program. The purchases made, they returned to the hotel, where they dined at a sumptuously served table de hot, after which Ayuda, shaking hands with the protector of the English fashion, retired to her room for a rest. Mr. Fogg absorbed himself throughout the evening in the perusal of the Times and Illustrated London News. Had he been capable of astonished at anything, he would have not to have seen his servant return at bedtime, but knowing that a steamer was not to leave for Yokohama until the next morning, he did not discern himself about the matter. When Passepartout did not appear the next morning to answer his master's bell, Mr. Fogg, not betraying the least vexation, contented himself with taking his carpet bag, calling Eodo, and sending for a palaquin. It was then eight o'clock. At half past nine, it being then high tide, the Carnatic would leave the harbor. Mr. Fogg and Eodo got into the palanquin, their luggage being brought after on a wheelbarrow. A half hour later stepped up on the quay whence they were to embark. Mr. Fogg then learned that the Connecticut had sailed the evening before. He had expected to find not only the steamer but his domestic, and was forced to give up both. But no sign of disappointment appeared on his face, and he merely remarked to an Uda, It is an accident, madam, nothing more. At this moment a man who had been observing him tentatively approached. It was Fix, who bowing addressed Mr. Fogg. Were you not like me, sir, a passenger on the Rangoon which arrived yesterday? I was, sir, replied Mr. Fogg coldly, but I have not had the honor. Pardon me, I thought you'd only find your servant here. Do you know where he is, sir? What? responded Fix, feigning surprise. Is he not with you? No. He has not made his appearance since yesterday. Could he have borne on board the Carmatic without us? Without you, madam, answered the detective. Excuse me, did you intend to sail the Carnatic? Yes, I did. So did I, madam. I am excessively disappointed. The Carnatic, its repairs being completed, left Hong Kong twelve hours before the stated time, without any notice being given, and we now must wait a week for another steamer. As he said a week, Fix felt his heart leap for joy. Fogg detained at Hong Kong for a week. There would be time for the warrant to arrive, and fortune at last favored the representative of the law. His horror may be imagined when he heard Mr. Fogg say in his placid voice, for there are other vessels besides the Carnatic, it seems to me in the harbor of Hong Kong. And offering his arm to Ada, he directed his steps toward the dock in search of some craft about to start. Fix, stupefied, to follow it. It seems as if he were really attached to Mr. Fogg by an invisible thread. Chance, however, appeared really to have abandoned the man, and it hitherto served so well. For three hours, Phileas Fogg wandered about the docks, with the determination, if necessary, to charter a vessel to carry him to Yokohama. But he could only find vessels which were loading or unloading, and which would not, therefore, set sail. Fix began to hope again, but Mr. Fogg, far from being discouraged, was continuing his search, resolved not to stop if he had to resort to Macau, when he was accosted by a sailor on one of the wharves. Is your honor looking for a boat? Have you a boat ready to sail? Yes, Your Honor, a pilot boat, number 43, the best in the harbor. Does she go fast? Between eight and nine hours of the hour. Will you look at her? Yes. Your Honor will be satisfied with her. Is it for a sea excursion? No, for a voyage. A voyage. Yes, will you agree to take me to Yokohama? 
The sailor leaned on the rating, opened his eyes wide, and said, Is your honor joking? No, I have missed the Carmatic, and I must get to Yokohama by the 14th at the latest, to take the boat for San Francisco. I am sorry, said the sailor, but it is impossible. I offer you a hundred pounds per day, and an additional word of two hundred pounds if I reach the Yokohama in time. Are you in earnest? Very much so. The pilot walked away a little distance, gazed out to sea, evidently struggling between the anxiety to earn a large sum and the fear of venturing so far. Fix was in mortal suspense. Mr. Fogg turned to Aida and asked her, You would not be afraid, would you, madam? Not with you, Mr. Fogg, was her answer. The pilot now returned, shuffling his hat in his hands. Well, pilot, said Mr. Fogg, well, your honor, replied he, I could not risk myself, my men, or my little boat of scarcely twenty tons on so long a voyage at this time of year. Besides, we could not reach Yokohama in time, for it is sixteen hundred and sixty miles from Hong Kong. Only sixteen hundred, said Mr. Fogg. It's the same thing. Fix breathed more freely. But, added the pilot, it might be arranged another way. Fix ceased to breathe at all. How? asked Mr. Fogg. By going to Nagasaki, at the extreme south of Japan, or even to Shanghai, which is only 800 miles from here. In going to Shanghai, we could not be forced to sail the wide of the Chinese coast, which would be a great advantage as the currents run northward and would aid us. Pilot, I must make the American steam at Yokohama and not at Shanghai or Nagasaki. Why not? returned the pilot. The San Francisco does not start from the Yokohama. It puts in at Yokohama and Nagasaki, but starts from Shanghai. You are sure of that? Perfectly. And when does the boat leave Shanghai? On the 11th at 7 in the evening. We therefore have four days before us. That is 96 hours, and in that time, if we have good luck in a southwest wind, and the sea was calm, we could make those 800 miles to Shanghai, and you could go in an hour. As soon as provisions got aboard on the ship and the sails put up, it is a bargain. Are you the master of the boat? Yes. John Busby, a master of the Tankard. Would you like some earnest money? If it would not put your honor out, here are 200 pounds on the account, sir. I had finished fog, turning to fix. If you would like to take advantage, thanks, sir. I was about to ask the favor. Very well, and in half an hour we shall go on board. But poor Passepartout, or Jayuda, who is much disturbed by the servant's disappearance, I shall do all I can to find him. All fixed in a feverish, nervous state, repaired to the pilot boat. The others directed their course to the police station at Hong Kong. Phileas Fogg there gave Passepartout's description and left the spun of money to be spent on the search. For him, the same formalities have been gone through the French consulate, and the Pelican have stopped at the hotel for luggage, which have been sent back there they returned to the wharf. It was now three o'clock, and pilot boat number 43, with its crew on board and its provisions stored away, was ready for departure. The tankard was a neat little craft of twenty tons, as gracefully built as if she were a racing yacht. Her shining copper sheathing, her galvanized ironwork, and her deck, white as ivory, betrayed the pride taken by John Busby in making her presentable. Her two masts leaned a trifle backward. She carried a brigantine, foresail, storm jib, standing jib, and it was well rigged for running before the wind. And she seemed capable of brisk speed, which indeed she had already proved by gaining several prizes in pilot boat races. The crew of the tankard were composed of John Busby, the master, four hardy mariners who were familiar with the Chinese seas, John Busby himself, a man over forty-five thereabouts, vigorous, sunburnt, with the sprightly expression of the eye and energetic, self-reliant countenance, would have inspired confidence in the most timid. Phileas Fogg and Aota went on board, where they found Fix already installed below deck was a square cabin, of which the walls bulged out in the form of cots, above a circular divan. In the centre was a table provided with a swinging lamp. The accommodation was confined, but neat. "'I'm sorry I have nothing better to offer you,' said Mr. Fogg to Fix, who bowed without responding. The detective had a feeling akin to humiliation in profiting by the kindness of Mr. Fogg. "'It is certain,' thought he, "'though rascal he is, he is a polite one.' The sails in the English flag were hoisted ten minutes past three. Mr. Fogg and Aouda, who were seated on the desk, cast a last glance at the quay in hopes of espying Passepartout. Fix was not within his fears, lest chance should direct the steps of the unfortunate servant, whom he had so badly treated. In this direction, in which a case explanation of the reverse of satisfactory due to the detective must have ensued, but the Frenchman did not appear, and without doubt was still lying under the stupefying influence of opium. John Bunsby, master at length, gave the order to start, and the tankard, taking on the wind of her brigantine, four sail and standing jib, bounded briskly forward over the waves. End of chapter 20. Read by David Russell. For Lit to Go, available on the web at fcit.usf.edu. Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne, Chapter 21, in which the master of the Tankadier runs great risk of losing a reward of two hundred pounds. This voyage of eight hundred miles was a perilous venture on a craft of twenty tons, and at that season of the year the Chinese seas are usually boisterous subject to terrible gales of wind, especially during the equinoxes, and it was now early November. It would clearly have been to the master's advantage to carry his passengers to Yokohama, since he was paid a certain sum per day, but he would have been rash to attempt such a voyage, and it was imprudent to even attempt to reach Shanghai, 
but John Bunsby believed in the Tankadier, which rode on the waves like a seagull, and perhaps he was not wrong. Late in the day they passed through the capricious channels of the Hong Kong, and the Tankadier, impelled by favorable winds, conducted herself admirably. "'I do not need, pilot,' said Phileas Fogg when they got into the open sea, "'to advise you to use all possible speed.' "'Trust me, Your Honor. We are carrying all the sail the wind will let us. The poles would add nothing, and are only used when we are going into port. It's your trade, not mine, pilot, and I confide in you. Phileas Fogg, with body erect and legs wide apart, standing like a sailor, gazed without staggering at the swelling waters. The young woman, who was seated aft, was profoundly affected as she looked out upon the ocean, darkening now with the twilight, on which she had ventured in so frail a vessel. Above her head rustled the white sails, which seemed like great white wings. The boat, carried forward by the wind, seemed to be flying in the air. Night came. The moon was entering her first quarter, and her insufficient light would soon die out in the midst of the horizon. Clouds were rising from the east, and had already overcast a part of the heavens. The pilot hung out his lights, which was very necessary in these seas crowded with vessels bound landward, for collisions are not uncommon occurrences. And at the speed she was going, the least shock would shatter the gallant little craft. Fix, seated in the bow, gave himself up to meditation. He kept apart from his fellow travellers, knowing Mr. Fogg's taciturn tastes. Besides, he did not quite like to talk to the men whose favours he had accepted. He was thinking, too, of the future, and it seemed certain that Fogg would not stop at Yokohama, but at once take the boat for San Francisco, and was the vast extent of America would assure him impunity and safety. Fogg's plan appeared to him the simplest in the world. Instead of sailing directly from England to the United States, like a common villain, he had transversed three-quarters of the globe so as to gain the American continent more surely. And there, after throwing the police off his track, he would quietly enjoy himself with the fortune stolen from the bank. But once in the United States, what should he do? Should he abandon this man? No, a hundred times no. He had secured this extradition. He would not lose sight of him for an hour. It was his duty, and he would fulfill it to the end. At all events, there was one thing to be thankful for. Passepartout was not with his master. And it was above all important, after the confidences Fix had imparted to him, that the servant should never have speech with his master. Phileas Fogg was also thinking of Passepartout, who had so strangely disappeared. Looking at the matter from every point of view, it did not seem to him impossible that, by some mistake, the man might have embarked on the Carnatic. At the last moment, and it was also Aouda's opinion, who regretted very much the loss of the worthy fellow to whom she owed so much, they might find him at Yokohama, for, if the Carnatic was carrying him thither, it would be easy to ascertain if he had been on board. A brisk breeze arose around ten o'clock, but though it might have been prudent to take it in reef, the pilot, after carefully examining the heavens, let the craft remain rigged as before. The Tankadere bore sail admirably as she drew a great deal of water, and everything was prepared for high speed in case of a gale. Mr. Fogg and Aouda descended into the cabin at midnight, having already preceded by Fix, who lay down on one of the cots. The pilot and crew remained on deck all night. At sunrise the next day, which was 8th November, the boat had made more than 100 miles. The log indicated a mean speed between 7 and 9 miles. The tankadere still carried all sail and was accomplishing her greatest capacity of speed. If the wind held as it was, the chances would be in her favor. During the day she kept along the coast, where the currents were favorable. The coast, irregular in profile, and visible sometimes across the clearings, was at most 5 miles distant. The sea was less boisterous, since the wind came off land, a fortunate circumstance for the boat, which would suffer, owing to its small tonnage, by heavy surge on the sea. The breeze subsided a little towards noon, and set in from the southwest. The pilot put up his poles, but took them down again within two hours as the wind freshened up anew. Mr. Fogg and Aouda, happily unaffected by the roughness of the sea, ate with a good appetite. Fix being invited to the share of their repast, which he accepted with a secret chagrin, to travel at the man's expense and live upon his provisions was not palatable to him. Still, he was obliged to eat, and so he ate. When the meal was over, he took Mr. Fogg apart, and said, Sir, this, and Sir, scorched his lips, and he had to control himself to avoid collaring his gentleman. Sir, you have been very kind to give me a passage on this boat. But, though my means will not admit of my expending them as freely as you, I must ask to pay for my share. Let us not speak of that, sir, replied Mr. Fogg. But if I insist... No, sir. 
repeated Mr. Fogg, in a tone which did not admit of a reply. This enters into my general expenses. Fix, as he bowed, had a stifled feeling, and, going forward where he ensconed himself, did not open his mouth for the rest of the day. Meanwhile, they were progressing famously, and John Bunsby was in high hope. He several times assured Mr. Fogg that they would reach Shanghai in time, to which the gentleman responded that he counted upon it. The crew set to work in good earnest, inspired by the reward to be gained. There was not a sheet which was not tightened, not a sail which was not vigorously hoisted, not a lurch could be charged to the man at the helm. They worked as desperately as if they were contesting in a royal yacht regatta. By evening, the log showed that 220 miles had been accomplished from Hong Kong, and Mr. Fogg may hope that he would be able to reach Yokohama without recording any delay in his journal, in which case the many misadventures which had overtaken him since he left London would not seriously affect his journey. The Tankadere entered the Straits of Fo Kien, which separate the island of Formosa from the Chinese coast. In the small hours of the night, and crossed by the Tropic of Cancer, the sea was very rough in the Straits, full of eddies formed by the countercurrents, and on the chopping waves broke her course, whilst it became very difficult to stand on the deck. At daybreak, the wind began to blow hard again, and the heavens seemed to predict a gale. The barometer announced a speedy change, the mercury rising and falling capriciously. The sea also, in the southeast, raised to long surges, which indicated a tempest. The sun had set the evening before in a red mist, in the midst of phosphorescent scintillations of the ocean. John Bunsby long examined the threatening aspect of the heavens, muttering indistinctly between his teeth. At last he said in a low voice to Mr. Fogg, "'Shall I speak out to your honor?' "'Of course. Well, we are going to have a squall. Is the wind north or south?' asked Mr. Fogg quietly. "'South, look, a typhoon is coming up. "'Glad it's a typhoon from the south, for it will carry us forward.' "'Oh, if you take it that way,' said John Bunsby, "'I have nothing more to say.' "'John Bunsby's suspicions were confirmed. "'At a less advanced season of the year like typhoon, "'according to a famous meteorologist, "'would have passed away like a luminous cascade of electrical flame. "'But in the winter equinox it was to be feared "'that it would burst upon them with great violence.' The pilot took his precautions in advance. He reefed all sail and pole masts were dispensed with. All hands went forward to the bows. A single triangular of sail of strong canvas was hoisted on the storm jib so as to hold the wind from behind. Then they waited. John Bunsby had requested his passengers to go below, but this imprisonment in so narrow a space with little air and the boat bouncing in this gale was far from pleasant. Neither Mr. Fogg, Fix, or Ada consented to leave the deck. The storm of rain and wind descended upon them towards eight o'clock, but with its bit of the sail the tanker dare was lifted like a feather by a wind, an idea of whose violence can be scarcely given. To compare her speed to four times that of a locomotive on going full steam would be below the truth. The boat scudded thus northward during the whole day, borne on by monstrous waves, persevering always, fortunately, by a speed equal to theirs. Twenty times she seemed to be almost submerged by these mountains of water which rose behind her, but the adroit management of the pilot saved her. The passengers were often bathed in spray, but they submitted to it philosophically. Fix cursed it, no doubt, but Ayuda, with her eyes fastened upon her protector, whose coolness amazed her, showed herself worthy of him, and bravely weathered the storm. As for Phileas Fogg, it seemed just as if the typhoon were part of his program. Up to this time the tankard air had always held her course to the north, but towards the evening the wind, veering three quarters, bore down from the northwest. The boat, now lying through the trough of waves, shook and rolled terribly. The sea struck her with fearful violence. At night the tempest increased in violence. John Bunsby saw the approach of darkness and the rising of the storm with the dark misgivings. He thought a while and then asked the crew if it was not the time to slacken speed. After a consultation, he approached Mr. Fogg and said, I think, Your Honor, that we should do well to make for one of the ports on the coast. I think so, too. Ah, said the pilot, but which one? I know of but one, returned Mr. Fogg tranquilly, and that is Shanghai. The pilot at first did not seem to comprehend. He could scarcely realize so much determination and tenacity. Then he cried, Well, yes, Your Honor is right, to Shanghai. So the tankadier kept steadily on her northward track. The night was really terrible. It would be a miracle if the craft did not founder. Twice it could have been all over with her if the crew had not been constantly on the watch. Ayuda was exhausted, but did not utter a complaint. More than once Mr. Fogg rushed to protect her from the violence of the waves. Day reappeared, 
The tempest still raged with undiminished fury, but the wind now returned to the southeast. It was a favorable change, and the Tankadir once again bounded forth on this mountainous sea. Though the waves crossed each other and imparted shocks and countershocks which would have crushed a craft less solidly built, from time to time the coast was visible through the broken mist. No vessel was in sight. The Tankadir was alone upon the sea. There were some signs of a calm at noon, and these became more distinct as the sun descended towards the horizon. The tempest had been brief as terrific. The passengers, thoroughly exhausted, could now eat a little and take some repose. The night was comparatively quiet. Some of the sails were again hoisted, and the speed of the boat was very good. The next morning at dawn they espied the coast, and John Bunsby was able to assert that they were not one hundred miles from Shanghai. A hundred miles, and only one day to traverse them. That very evening Mr. Fogg was due at Shanghai, if he did not wish to miss the steamer to Yokohama. Had there been no storm, during which several hours were lost, they would be at this moment within thirty miles of their destination. The wind grew decidedly calmer, and happily the sea fell with it. All sails were now hoisted, and at noon the Tangadair was within forty-five miles of Shanghai. There remained yet six hours to which accomplish that distance. All on board fear could not be done, and every one, Phileas Fogg, no doubt, expected felt his heart beat with impatience. The boat must keep up with an average of nine miles an hour, and the wind was becoming calmer every moment. It was a capricious breeze coming from the coast, and after it passed the sea became smooth. Still, the tank deer was so light, and her fine sails caught the fickle zephyrs so well, that with the aid of currents, John Bunsby found himself at six o'clock not more than ten miles from the mouth of the Shanghai River. Shanghai itself was situated at least twelve miles up the stream, and at seven they were still three miles from Shanghai. The pilot swore an angry oath. The reward of two hundred pounds was evidently on the point of escaping him. He looked at Mr. Fogg. Mr. Fogg was perfectly tranquil, and yet his whole fortune was at this moment at stake. At this moment, also, a long black funnel, crowned with wreaths of smoke, appeared on the edge of the waters. It was the American steamer, leaving for Yokohama at the appointed time. Confound her! cried John Bunsby, pushing back the rudder with a desperate jerk. Signal her, said Phileas Fogg quietly. A small brass cannon stood on the forward deck of the tankadier for making signals in the fogs. It was loaded to the muzzle, but just as the pilot was about to apply a red-hot coal to the touch hole, Mr. Fogg said, Hoist your flag. The flag was run up at half-mast, and this being the signal of distress, it was hoped that the American steamer, perceiving it, would change her course a little, as to succour the pilot boat. Fire, said Mr. Fogg, and the booming of the little cannon resounded in the air. End of chapter 21. Read by David Russell. For Lit to Go. Available on the web at fcit.usf.edu. Around the World in Eighty Days. By Jules Verne. Chapter 22. In which Passepartout finds out that Even in the Antipodes, it's convenient to have some money in one's pocket. The Carnatic, setting sail from Hong Kong at half-past six on the 7th of November, directed her course at full steam towards Japan. She carried a large cargo and a well-filled cabin of passengers. Two staterooms in the rear were, however, unoccupied, those which had been engaged by Phileas Fogg. The next day a passenger with half-stupefied eyes, staggering gait, and disordered hair was seen to emerge from the second cabin, and to totter to a seat on deck. It was Passepartout, and what had happened to him was as follows. Shortly after Fix left the opium den, two waiters had lifted the unconscious Passepartout and had carried him to the bed reserved for the smokers. Three hours later, pursued even in his dreams by a fixed idea, the poor fellow awoke and struggled against the stupefying influence of the narcotic, and the thought of duty unfulfilled shook off his torpor, and he hurried from the abode of drunkenness, staggering up and holding himself by keeping up against the walls, falling down and creeping up again, and irresistibly impelled by the kind of instinct he kept crying out, The Carnatic! The Carnatic! The steamer lay puffing alongside the quay, on the point of starting. Passepartout had but a few steps to go, and rushing upon the plank, he crossed it and fell unconscious on the deck just as the Carnatic was moving off. Several sailors, who were evidently accustomed to this sort of scene, carried the poor Frenchman down to the second cabin, and Passeporto did not wake until they were 150 miles away from China. Thus he found himself the next morning on the deck of the Carnatic, and eagerly inhaling the exhilarating sea breeze, the pure air sobered him. He began to collect his sense, which he found a difficult task, but at last he recalled the events of the evening before. 
fixes revelation and the opium house. It is evident, he said to himself, that I have been abominably drunk. What will Mr. Fogg say? At least I have not missed the steamer, which is the most important thing. Then, as fix occurred to him, as for that rascal, I hope we are well rid of him, and that he has not dared, as he had proposed, to follow us on board of the Carnatic, a detective on the track of Mr. Fogg accused of robbing the Bank of England. Pshaw! Mr. Fogg is no more a robber than I am a murderer. Should he divulge Fix's real errand to his master? Would it do to tell the part the detective was playing? Would it not be better to wait until Mr. Fogg reached London again, and then impart to him that an agent of the Metropolitan Police had been following him around the world, and have a good laugh over it? No doubt, at least, it was worth considering. The first thing to do was to find Mr. Fogg and apologize for this singular behavior. Passepartout got up and proceeded, as well as he could with the rolling of the steamer to the after-deck. He saw no one who resembled either his master or Ayuda. Good, muttered he. Ayuda has not got up yet, and Mr. Fogg has probably found some partners at whist. He descended into the saloon. Mr. Fogg was not there. Passepartout had only, however, to ask the purser a number of his master's stateroom. The purser replied that he did not know any passenger by the name of Fogg. I beg your pardon, said Passepartout persistently. He's a tall gentleman, quiet and not very talkative. He has with him a young lady. There's no young lady on board, interrupted the purser. Here is a list of the passengers. You may see so yourself. Passepartout scanned the list, but his master's name was not upon it. All at once an idea struck him. Ah, am I on the Carnatic? Yes. On the way to Yokohama? Certainly. Passepartout had for an instant feared that he was on the wrong boat, but though he was really on the Carnatic, his master was not there. He felt thunderstruck on his seat. He saw it all now. He remembered that the time of the sailing had been changed, that he should have informed his master of that fact, and he had not yet done so. It was his fault, then, that Mr. Fogg and Iota had missed the steamer. Yes, but it was still more the fault of the traitor who, in order to separate him from his master and detain the latter at Hong Kong, had inveiled him into getting drunk. He now saw the detective's trick, and at this moment Mr. Fogg was certainly ruined. His bet was lost, and he himself perhaps arrested and imprisoned. At this thought, Passepartout tore through his hair. Ah, if Fix ever came within his reach, what a settling of counts there would be. After this first depression, Passepartout became calmer, and began to study his situation, and it was not certainly an enviable one. He found himself on the way to Japan, and what should he do when he got there? His pocket was empty. He had not a solitary shilling, not so much as a penny. His passage had fortunately been paid for in advance. As he had five or six days to which to decide upon his future course, he fell to at meals with an appetite, and ate for Mr. Fogg, Ayuda, and himself. He helped himself as generously as if Japan were dessert, where nothing to eat was to be looked for. At dawn of the 13th, the Carnatic entered the port of Yokohama. This is an important port of call in the Pacific, where all the mail steamers and those carrying travelers between North America, China, Japan, and the Oriental Islands put in. It is situated at the Bay of Yedo, but at a short distance from that, the second capital of the Japanese Empire and the residence of the tycoon, the civil emperor, before the Mikado, the spiritual emperor, absorbed his office in his own. The Carnatic anchored at the quay near the Custom House in the midst of a crowd of ships bearing the flags of all nations. Passepartout went timidly ashore on this so curious territory of the Sons of the Sun. He had nothing better to do than, taking chance for his guide, to wander aimlessly through the streets of Yokohama. He found himself at first in a thoroughly European quarter, the houses having low fronts and being adorned with the verandas, beneath which he caught glimpses of the neat peristyles. This quarter occupied with its streets, squares, docks, and warehouses, all the space between the promontory of the treaty and the river. Here, as at Hong Kong and Calcutta, were mixed crowds of all races. Americans and English, Chinamen and Dutchmen, mostly merchants ready to buy or sell anything. The Frenchman felt himself as much alone among them as he had dropped down in the midst of Hottentots. He had... At least one resource to call on the French and English consuls at Yokohama for assistance. But he shrank from telling the story of his adventures, intimately connected as it was with that of his master, and, before doing so, he determined to exhaust all other means of aid, as chance did not favor him in the European quarter. He penetrated that inhabited by the native Japanese, determined, if necessary, to push on to Yedo. The Japanese quarter of Yokohama is called Benton, after the goddess of the sea who is worshipped on the islands round about. 
There Passepartout beheld beautiful fir and cedar groves, sacred gates of singular architecture, bridges half hid in the midst of bamboos and reeds temples shaded by immense cedar trees, holy treats which were sheltered Buddhist priests and sectaries of Confucius, and interminable streets where a perfect harvest of rose-tinted and red-cheeked children who looked as if they had been cut out of Japanese screens, and who were playing in the midst of short-legged poodles and yellowish cats, might have been gathered. The streets were crowded with people. Priests were passing in processions, beating their dreary tambourines. Police and custom-house officers with pointed hats encrusted with lac, and carrying two sabers hung at their waists. Soldiers, clad in blue cotton with white stripes and bearing guns. The Mikado's guards, enveloped in silken doublets, habkirks, and coats of mail, and numbers of military folk of all ranks, for the military profession is much respected in Japan as it is despised in China. Went hither and thither in groups and pairs, Passepartout saw two baking friars, long-robed pilgrims, and simple civilians, with their warped and jet-black hair, big heads, long busts, slender legs, short stature, and complexions varying from copper color to a dead white, but never yellow like the Chinese, from whom the Japanese widely differ, and did not fail to observe the curious equipages, characters, palanquins, bow supplied with sails, and litters made of bamboo, nor the women, whom he thought not especially handsome, who took little steps with their little feet, whereon they wore canvas shoes, straw sandals, and clogs of worked wood, and displayed tight-looking eyes, flat chests, teeth fashionably blackened, and gowns crossed with silken scarves, tied into an enormous knot behind an ornament, which the modern Parisian ladies seem to have borrowed from the dames of Japan. Passepartout wandered for several hours in the midst of this motley crowd, looking in at the windows of the rich and curious shops, the jewelry establishments glittering with quaint Japanese ornaments, the restaurants decked with streamers and banners, and the tea houses, where the odorous beverage was being drunk with sake, a liquor concocted with the fermentation of rice, and the comfortable smoking houses, where they were puffing not opium, which is almost unknown in Japan, but a very fine stringy tobacco. He went on till he found himself in the fields, in the midst of the vast rice plantations, where he saw dazzling camellias expanding themselves with flowers which were giving forth the last colors and perfumes, not on bushes but on trees, and with them bamboo enclosures, cherry, plum, and apple trees, which the Japanese cultivate rather for their blossoms than their fruit, and were queerly fashioned grinning scarecrows protected from the sparrows, pigeons, ravens, and other voracious birds." and on the branches of the cedars were perched large eagles. Amid the foliage of the weeping willows were herons, solemnly standing on one leg. On every hand were crows, ducks, hawks, wild birds, and a multitude of cranes, which the Japanese considered sacred, and which to their minds symbolized long life and prosperity. As he was strolling along, Passepartout espied some violets among the shrubs. Good, said he, I'll have some supper. But on smelling them, he found that they were odorless. No chance there, thought he. The worthy fellow had certainly taken good care as to eat a hearty breakfast as possible before leaving the Carnatic, but, as he had been walking about all day, the demands of hunger were becoming importunate. He observed that the butcher's stalls contained neither mutton, goat, nor pork, and knowing also that it is sacrilege to kill cattle, which are preserved solely for farming, he made up his mind that meat was far from plentiful in Yokohama. Nor was he mistaken, and in default of butcher's meat, he would have wished for a quarter of wild boar or deer, a partridge or some quails, or some game or fish, with which rice the Japanese eat almost exclusively. But he found it necessary to keep up a stout heart, and to postpone the meal he craved till the following morning. Night came, and Passepartout re-entered the native quarter, where he wandered through the streets, lit by very colored lanterns, looking on at the dancers, who were executing skillful steps and boundings, and the astrologers who stood in the open air with their telescopes. Then he came to the harbor, which was lit up by the resin torches of the fishermen, who were fishing from their boats. The streets at last became quiet, and the patrol, the officers of which, in their splendid costumes, surrounded by their suites, Passepartout thought it seemed like ambassadors succeeding the bustling crowd. Each time a company passed, Passepartout chuckled and said to himself, Good, another Japanese embassy departing for Europe. End of chapter 22. Read by David Russell. For Lit to Go. Available on the web at fcit.usf.edu. Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne, Chapter 23, in which Passepartout's nose becomes outrageously long. 
The next morning, poor, jaded, famished Passepartout said to himself that he must get something to eat at all hazards, and the sooner he did so, the better. He might indeed sell his watch, but he would have starved first. Now or never he must use the strong, if not melodious voice which nature had bestowed upon him. He knew several French and English songs, and resolved to try them upon the Japanese, who must be lovers of music, since they were forever pounding on their cymbals, tam-tams, and tambourines, and could not but appreciate European talent. It was perhaps rather early in the morning to get up for a concert, but the audience prematurely aroused from their slumbers might not possibly pay their entertainer with coin bearing Mikado's features. Passepartout therefore decided to wait several hours, and as he was sauntering along, it occurred to him that he would seem rather too well dressed for a wandering artist. The idea struck him to change his garments for clothes more in harmony with his project, by which he might also get a little money to satisfy the immediate cravings of hunger. The resolution taken, it remained to carry it out. It was only after a long search that Passepartout discovered a native dealer in old clothes to whom he applied for an exchange. The man liked the European costume, and ere long Passepartout issued from his shop accoutred in an old Japanese coat and a sort of one-sided turban faded with long use. A few small pieces of silver, moreover, jingled in his pocket. Good, thought he. I will imagine I am at the carnival. His first care, after being thus Japaneseed, was to enter a tea-house of modest appearance, and, upon half a bird and a little rice, to breakfast like a man, for whom dinner was not yet a problem to be solved. Now, thought he, when he had eaten heartily, I mustn't lose my head. I can't sell this costume again for one still more Japanese. I must consider how to leave this country of the sun, of which I shall not retain the most delightful memories as quickly as possible." It occurred to him to visit the steamers which were about to leave for America, and he would offer himself as a cook or servant in pavement of his passage and meals. Once at San Francisco, he would find some means of going on. The difficulty was how to transverse 4,700 miles of the Pacific, which lay between Japan and the New World. Passepartout was not the man to let an idea go begging, and directed his steps towards the docks. But as he approached him, his project, which at first hand seemed so simple, began to grow more and more formidable to his mind. What need would they have a cook or a servant on an American steamer? And what confidence would they put in in him, dressed as he was? What references could he give? As he was reflecting in the wise, his eyes fell upon an immense placard which a sort of clown was carrying through the streets. This placard, which was in English, read as follows. Acrobatic Japanese Troop. Honorable William Battlecar Proprietor. Last representations prior to their departure to the United States of the long noses, long noses, under the direct patronage of the god Tingo. Great attraction. The United States, said Passepartout, that's just what I want. He followed the clown, and soon found himself once more in the Japanese quarter. A quarter of an hour later he stopped before a large cabin, adorned with several clusters of streams, the exterior walls of which were designed to represent in violent colors, with perspective, a company of jugglers. This was the Honorable William Battlecar's establishment. That gentleman was a sort of Barnum, the director of a troop of mountebanks, jugglers, clowns, acrobats, equilibrists, and gymnasts, who, according to the placard, was giving his last performance before leaving the Empire of the Sun for the States of the Union. Passepartout entered and asked for Mr. Battlecar, who straightway appeared in person. "'What do you want?' said he to Passepartout, whom he at first took for a native." "'Would you like a servant, sir?' asked Passepartout. "'A servant?' cried Mr. Battlecar, caressing the thick grey beard which hung from his chin. "'I already have two who are obedient and faithful, have never left me and served me for their nourishment, and here they are,' he added, holding out his two robust arms, furrowed with veins as large as the strings of a bass viol. "'So I can be of no use to you, none. The devil! I should so like to cross the Pacific with you.' "'Ah?' said the Honourable Mr. Battlecar. "'You know more Japanese than I am, a monkey.' "'Who are you dressed up in that way?' "'A man dresses as he can. "'That's true. "'You are a Frenchman, aren't you?' "'Yes, a Parisian of Paris. "'Then you ought to know how to make grimaces.' "'Why?' replied Passepartout, "'a little vexed that his nationality should cause this question. "'We Frenchmen know how to make grimaces. "'It's true, but not any better than the Americans do. "'True. "'Well, if I can't take you as a servant, I can as a clown. "'You see, my friend, in France they exhibit foreign clowns, "'and in foreign parts French clowns.' "'Ah, you are pretty strong, eh? Especially after a good meal. "'And you can sing?' "'Yes,' returned Passepartout, who had formerly been wont to sing in the streets. "'But can you sing standing on your head with a top spinning on your left foot "'and a sabre balanced on your right?' "'Humph, I think so,' replied Passepartout, recalling the exercises of his younger days. 
Well, that's enough, said the Honorable William Battlecar. The engagement was concluded then and there. Passepartout had at last found something to do. He was engaged to act with the celebrated Japanese troupe. It was not a very dignified position, but within a week he would be on his way to San Francisco. The performance, so noisily announced by the Honorable Mr. Battlecar, was to commence at three o'clock, and soon the deafening instruments of a Japanese orchestra resounded at the door. Passepartout, though he had not been able to study or rehearse a part, was designated to lend the aid of his sturdy shoulders in a great exhibition of the human pyramid, executed by the long noses of the god Tingu. This great attraction was to close the performance. Before three o'clock, the large shed was invaded by the spectators, comprising Europeans, natives, Chinese and Japanese, men, women and children, who precipitated themselves upon the narrow benches and into the boxes opposite the stage. The musicians took up a position inside, and were vigorously performing on their gongs, tam-tams, flutes, bones, tambourines, and immense drums. The performance was just like all acrobatic displays, but it must be confessed that the Japanese are first equivalorists of the world. One, with a fan and some bits of paper, performed a graceful trick of butterflies and the flowers. Another traced in the air with the odorous smoke of his pipe a series of blue words which composed a compliment to the audience, while a third juggled with some lighted candles, which he extinguished successively as they passed his lips, and relit again without interrupting for an instant his juggling. Another reproduced the most singular combinations with the spinning top in his hands, and the revolving tops seemed to be animated with a life of their own in their interminable whirling. They ran over pipe stems, the edges of sabers, wires, and even hairs stretched across the stage. They turned around on the large ends of glasses, crossed bamboo ladders, dispersed into all corners, and produced a strange musical effect by the combination of their various pitches of tone. The jugglers tossed them in the air and threw them like shuttlecocks with their wooden battle doors, and yet they kept on spinning. They put them into their pockets and took them out, still whirling as before. It is useless to describe the astonishing performances of the acrobats and gymnasts. The turning on ladders, poles, balls, barrels, etc., was executed with wonderful precision." But the principal attraction was the exhibition of the long noses, a show to which Europe is as yet a stranger. The long noses form a peculiar company. Under the direct patronage of the god Tingu, attired after the fashion of the Middle Ages, they bore upon their shoulders a splendid pair of wings. But what especially distinguished them was the long noses which were fastened to their faces, and the uses of which they made of them. These noses were made of bamboo, and were five, six, and even ten feet long, some straight, others curved, some ribboned, and having some imitation warts upon them. It was upon these appendages, fixed tightly on their real noses, that they performed their gymnastic exercises. A dozen of these sectaries of Tingu lay flat upon their backs, while others, dressed to represent the lightning rods, came and flocked on their noses, jumping from one to another, and performing the most skillful leapings in somersault. As a last scene, a human pyramid had been announced, in which fifty long noses were to represent the car of Juggernaut. But instead of forming a pyramid by mounting each other's shoulders, the artists were to group themselves on top of the noses. It happened that the performer who had hitherto formed the base of the car had quitted the troupe, and as to fill the part, only strength and adroitness were necessary. Passepartout had been chosen to take his place. The poor fellow felt really sad when, melancholy reminiscence of his youth, he donned his costume, adorned with very colored wings, and fastened to his natural feature a false nose six feet long. But he cheered up when he thought that this nose was winning him something to eat. He went upon the stage and took his place beside the rest where to compose the base of the carved the juggernaut. They all stretched themselves on the floor, their noise pointed to the ceiling. The second group of artists disposed themselves on the long appendages, and a third above these, and a fourth until a human monument reaching to the very cornices of the theatre soon arose on the top of the noses. This elicited a loud applause, in the midst of which the orchestra was just striking up a deafening air when the pyramid tottered. The balance was lost, one of the lower noses vanished from the pyramid, and the human monument was shattered like a castle built of cards. It was Passepartout's fault. Abandoning his position, clearing the footlights without aid of his wings, and clambering up the right gallery, he fell at the feet of one of the spectators, crying, Ah, my master, my master. You here? Myself. Very well. Then let us go to the steamer, young man. Mr. Fogg, Aouda, and Passepartout passed through the lobby of the theatre to the outside, where they encountered the Honorable Mr. Battlecar, furious with rage. He demanded damages for the breakage of the pyramid, and Phileas Fogg appeased him by giving him a handful of banknotes. At half-past six, the very hour of departure, Mr. Fogg and Aouda, followed by Passepartout, who in his hurry had retained his wings and nose six feet long, stepped upon the American steamer. 
End of chapter 23. Read by David Russell. For Lit to Go. Available on the web at fcit.usf.edu. Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne. Chapter 24, during which Mr. Fogg and party crossed the Pacific Ocean. What happened when the pilot boat came in sight of Shanghai will be easily guessed. The signals made by the Tankadere had been easily seen by the captain of the Yokohama steamer, who, espying the flag at half-mast, had directed his course towards the little craft. Phileas Fogg, after paying the stipulated price of his passage to John Busby, and rewarding that worthy with an additional sum of five hundred and fifty pounds, ascended the steamer with Aouda and Fix, and they started at once for Nagasaki and Yokohama. They reached their destination on the morning of the 14th of November. Phileas Fogg lost no time in going on board the Carnatic when he learned, to Aouda's great delight, and perhaps his own, though he betrayed no emotion, that Passepartout, a Frenchman, had really arrived on her the day before. The San Francisco steamer was announced to leave that very evening, and it became necessary to find Passepartout, if possible, without delay. Mr. Fogg applied in vain to the French and English consuls, and after wandering through the streets a long time, began to despair of finding of his missing servant. Chance, or perhaps a kind presentiment, at last led him to the Honorable Mr. Battlecar's theatre. He certainly would not have recognized Passepartout in the eccentric mountebank's costume, but the latter, lying on his back, perceived his master in the gallery. He could not help starting, which so changed the position of his nose as to bring the pyramid pell-mell upon the stage. All this Passepartout learned from Aouda, who recounted to him what had taken place on the voyage from Hong Kong to Shanghai on the Tankadere, in company with one Mr. Fix. Passepartout did not change countenance on hearing this name. He thought that the time had not yet arrived to divulge to his master what had taken place between the detective and himself. And, in the account he gave of his absence, he simply excused himself for having been overtaken by drunkenness and smoking opium in a tavern in Hong Kong. Mr. Fogg heard this narrative coldly without a word, then furnished his man with funds necessary to obtain clothing more in harmony with his position. Within an hour the Frenchman had cut off his nose and parted with his wings, and retained nothing about him which called his secretary of the god Tingo. The steamer which was about to depart from Yokohama to San Francisco belonged to the Pacific Mail Steamship Company, and was named General Grant. She was a large paddle-wheel steamer of 2,500 tons, and well-equipped and very fast. The massive walking beam rose and fell above the deck. At one end, a piston rod worked up and down. At the other was a connecting rod, which, in changing the rectilinear motion to a circular one, was directly connected with the shaft of the paddles. The General Grant was rigged with three masts, giving a large capacity for sails, and thus materially aiding the steam power. By making twelve miles an hour, she would cross the ocean in twenty-one days. Phileas Fogg was therefore justified in hoping that he would reach San Francisco by the 2nd of December, New York by the 11th, and London on the 20th, thus gaining several hours on the fatal day of the 21st of December. There was a full complement of passengers on board, among them English, many Americans, a large number of coolies on their way to California, and several East Indian officers who were spending their vacation in making the tour of the world. Nothing of moment happened in the voyage. The steamer sustained on its large paddles rolled but little, and the Pacific almost justified its name. Mr. Fogg was as calm and taciturn as ever. His young companion felt herself more and more attached to him by other ties than gratitude. His silent but generous nature impressed her more than she thought, and it was almost unconsciously that she yielded to emotions which did not seem to have the least effect upon her protector. Ayuda took the keenest interest in his plans, and became impatient at any incident which seemed likely to retard his journey. She often chatted with Passepartout, who did not fail to perceive the state of his lady's heart, and, being the most faithful of domestics, he never exhausted his eulogies of Phileas Fogg's honesty, generosity, and devotion. He took pains to calm Ayuda's doubts of a successful termination of the journey, telling her that the most difficult part of it had passed, and they were beyond the fantastic countries of Japan and China, and were fairly on their way to civilized places again. The railway train from San Francisco to New York and a transatlantic steamer from New York to Liverpool would doubtless bring them to the end of this impossible journey round the world within the period agreed upon. On the ninth day after leaving Yokohama, Phileas Fogg traversed exactly one half the terrestrial globe. The General Grant passed. On the 23rd of November, the 180th meridian, and was at that very antipodes of London, Mr. Fogg, in its true, exhausted fifty-two of the eighty days which he was to complete the tour, and there were only twenty-eight left. But though he was only halfway to the difference of the meridians, he had really gone over two-thirds of the whole journey. 
for he had been obliged to take long circuits from London to Aden, from Aden to Bombay, from Calcutta to Singapore, and from Singapore to Yokohama. Could he have followed without deviation the 50th parallel, which is that of London, the whole distance would have only been about 12,000 miles, whereas he would have been forced by the irregular methods of locomotion to traverse 26,000 of which he had on the 23rd of November, accomplished 17,500. And now the course was a straight one, and fixed no longer there to put the obstacles in their way. It happened also on the 23rd of November that Passepartout made a joyful discovery. It will be remembered that the obstinate fellow had insisted on keeping his famous family watch at London time, and on regarding that of countries he had passed through as quite false and unreliable. Now on this day, though he had not changed the hands, he found that his watch exactly agreed with the ship's chronometers. His triumph was hilarious. He would like to know what Fix would say if he were aboard. The rogue told me a lot of stories, repeated Passepartout, about the meridians, the sun, the moon. Moon, indeed. Moonshine, more likely. If one listened to that sort of people, a pretty sort of time would one keep. I was sure that the sun would some day regular itself by my watch. Passepartout was ignorant that, if the face of his watch had been divided into twenty-four hours like the Italian clocks, he would have no reason for exultation. For the hands of his watch would then, instead, as of now, indicating nine o'clock in the morning, indicate nine o'clock in the evening, that is, the twenty-first hour after midnight, precisely the difference between London time and that of one hundred and eightieth meridian. But if Fix had been able to explain this purely physical effect, Passepartout would not have admitted, even if he had comprehended it. Moreover, if the detective had been on board at that moment, Passepartout would have joined issue with him on a quite a different subject and in an entirely different manner. Where was Fix at the moment? He was actually on board the General Grant. On reaching Yokohama, the detective, leaving Mr. Fogg, whom he expected to meet again during the day, had repaired at once to the English consulate, where he had at last found the warrant of arrest. It had followed him from Bombay, and had come by the Carnatic, on which steamer he himself was supposed to be. Fix's disappointment may be imagined when he reflected that the warrant was now useless. Mr. Fogg had left English ground, and it was now necessary to procure his extradition. Well, thought Fix in a moment of anger, my warrant is not good here, but it will be in England. The rogue evidently intends to return to his own country, thinking he has thrown the police off his track. Good, I will follow him across the Atlantic. As for the money, heaven grant that there be some left. But the fellow was already spending travelling, rewards, trials, bails, elephant, and all sorts of charges, more than five thousand pounds. Yet, after all, the bank is rich. His course decided on, he went on board the General Grant, and was there Mr. Fogg and Aoudou arrived. To his utter amazement, he recognized Passepartout, despite his theatrical disguise. He quickly concealed himself upon his cabin, to avoid an awkward explanation, and hoped, thanks to the number of passengers, to remain unperceived by Mr. Fogg's servant. On that very day, however, he met Passepartout face to face on the forward deck. The latter, without much a word, made a rush for him, grasped him by the throat, and, much to the amusement of the group of Americans, who immediately began to bet on him, administered to the detective a perfect volley of blows, which proved the great superiority of French over English pugilistic skill. When Passepartout had finished, he found himself relieved and comforted. Fix got up in somewhat rumbled condition, and, looking at his adversary, coldly said, "'Have you done?' For this time, yes. Then let me have a word with you, but I in your master's interests. Passepartout seemed to be vanquished by Fix's coolness, for he quietly followed him, and they sat down aside from the rest of the passengers. You have given me a thrashing, said Fix. Good. I expected it. Now listen to me. Up to this time I had been Mr. Fogg's adversary. Now I am in his game. Aha! cried Passepartout. You are convinced he is an honest man. No, replied Fix coldly. I think him a rascal. Don't budge and let me speak. As long as Mr. Fogg was on English ground, it was for my interest to detain him there until my warrant of arrest arrived. I did everything I could to keep him back. I sent the Bombay priests after him. I got you intoxicated in Hong Kong. I separated you from him. I made him miss the Yokohama steamer. Passepartout listened with closed fists. Now, resumed Fix, Mr. Fogg seems to be going back to England. Well, I will follow him there, but after I will do as much to keep obstacles out of his way as I've done at this time to put them in his path. I've changed my game, you see, and simply because it was for my interest to change it. Your interest is the same as mine, for it is only in England that you will ascertain whether you are in the same service of a criminal or an honest man. Passepartout listened very attentively to Fix, and was convinced he spoke with entire good faith. Are we friends? asked the detective. Friends? No, replied Passepartout. But allies? Perhaps. At the least sign of treason, however, I will tryst your neck for you. Agreed, said the detective quietly. Eleven days later, on the 3rd of December, the General Grant entered the Bay of the Golden Gate and reached San Francisco. Mr. Fogg had neither gained nor lost a single day. End of chapter 24 
read by David Russell for Lit to Go, available on the web at fcit.usf.edu. Around the World in 80 Days, by Jules Verne, Chapter 25, in which a slight glimpse is had of San Francisco. It was seven in the morning when Mr. Fogg, Aouda, and Passepartout set foot upon the American continent, and if this name can be given to the floating quay upon which they disembarked, these quays, rising and falling with the tide, thus facilitate the loading and unloading of vessels. Alongside them were clippers of all sizes, steamers of all nationalities, and the steamboats with several decks rising one above the other, which ply on the Sacramento and its tributaries. These were also heaped upon the products of the commerce which extend to Mexico, Chile, Peru, Brazil, Europe, Asia, and all the Pacific Islands. Passepartout, in his joy on reaching at last the American continent, thought he would manifest it by executing a perilous vault in fine style, but tumbling upon some warm meat and planks, he fell through them. Put out of continence by the manner of which he just set foot upon the new world, he uttered a loud cry which so frightened the innumerable comorants and pelicans that were always perched upon these unmovable quays that they flew noisily away. Mr. Fogg, on reaching the shore, produced to find out what hour the first train left for New York, and learned that it was six o'clock p.m. He had, therefore, an entire day to spend in the Californian capital. Taking carriage at the charge of three dollars, he and Aouda entered it. While Passepartout mounted the box beside the driver, they set out for the International Hotel. From his exalted position, Passepartout observed with much curiosity the wide streets, the low, even rearranged houses, the Anglo-Saxon Gothic churches, the great docks, the palatial wooden and brick warehouses, the numerous conveyances, omnibuses, horse cars, and upon the sidewalks, not only Americans and Europeans, but Chinese and Indians. Passepartout was surprised at all he saw. San Francisco was no longer the legendary city of 1849, a city of banditti, assassins, and incendiaries who had flocked thither in crowds in pursuit of plunder, a paradise of outlaws where they gambled with gold dust, a revolver in one hand and a bowie knife in the other. It was now a great commercial emporium. The lofty tower of its city hall overlooked the whole panorama of the streets and avenues which cut each other at right angles, and in the midst of which appeared pleasant verdant squares, while beyond appeared the Chinese quarter, seemingly imported from the celestial empire in a toy box. Sombreros and red shirts and plumed Indians were rarely to be seen, but there were silk hats and black coats everywhere, worn by a multitude of nervously active, gentlemanly-looking men, some of the street, especially Montgomery Street, which is to San Francisco what Regent Street is to London, the Boulevard des Italiens to Paris, and Broadway to New York were lined with splendid and spacious stores, which exposed in their windows the products of the entire world. When Passepartout reached an international hotel, he did not seem to him as if he had left England at all. The ground floor of the hotel was occupied by a large bar, a sort of restaurant freely open to all passers-by who might partake of dried beef, oyster soup, biscuits, and cheese, without taking out their purses. Payment was made only for the ale, porter or sherry, which was drunk. This seemed very American to Passepartout. The hotel refreshment rooms were comfortable, and Mr. Fogg and Aouda, installing themselves at a table, were abundantly served on a diminutive place by negroes of the darkest hue. After breakfast, Mr. Fogg, accompanied by Aouda, started for the English consulate to have his passport visited. As he was going out, he met Passepartout, who asked him if he would not be well before taking the train to purchase some dozens of Enfield rifles and Colt's revolvers. He had been listening to the stories of attacks upon the trains by the Sioux and the Pawnees. Mr. Fogg thought it a useless precaution, but told him to do as he thought best, and went on to the consulate. He had not proceeded two hundred steps, however, when by the greatest chance of the world he met Fix. The detective seemed wholly taken by surprise. What? Had Mr. Fogg and himself crossed the Pacific together, and not met on the steamer? At least Fix felt honored to be held once more the gentleman to whom he owed so much, and, as his business recalled him to Europe, he should be delighted to continue the jury in such pleasant company. Mr. Fogg replied that the honor would be his, and the detective, who was determined not to lose sight of him, begged permission to accompany them in their walk about San Francisco, a request which Mr. Fogg readily granted. They soon found themselves in Montgomery Street, where a great crowd was collected. The sidewalks, street, horse-car trails, and shop doors, the windows of the houses, even the roofs, were full of people. Men were going about carrying large posters and flags, and streamers were floating in the wind, while loud cries were heard on every hand, Hurrah for Camerfield! Hurrah for Mandaboy! It was a political meeting, at least so Fix conjectured, who said to Mr. Fogg, Perhaps we'd better not mingle with the crowd. There may be danger in it. Yes, returned Mr. Fogg, and blows, even if they are political, are still blows. 
Fix smiled at this remark, and, in order to be able to see without being jostled about, the party took up a position on the top of the flight of steps situated at the upper end of Montgomery Street. Opposite them, on the other side of the street, between a coal wharf and a petroleum warehouse, a large platform had been erected in the open air, towards which the current of the crowd seems to be directed. For what purpose was this meeting? What was the occasion of this excited assemblage? Phileas Fogg could not imagine. Was it to nominate some high official? A governor, a member of Congress? It was not improbable, so agitated was the multitude before them. Just at this moment there was an unusual stir in the human mass. All the hands were raised in the air. Some tightly closed seemed to disappear suddenly in the midst of cries. An energetic way, no doubt, of casting a vote. A th crowd swayed back. The banners and flags waved and disappeared in an instant, then reappeared in tanders. The undulations of the human surge reached the steps, while all the heads floundered on the surface like a sea agitated by a squall. Many of the black hats disappeared. The greater part of the crowd seemed to have diminished in height. It's evidently a meeting, said Fix, and its object must be an exciting one. I should not wonder if it were about the Alabama, despite the fact that question is settled. Perhaps, replied Mr. Fogg simply. At least there are two champions in presence of each other, the Honorable Mr. Camerfield and the Honorable Mr. Mandeboy. Ayuda, leaning upon Mr. Fogg's arm, observed the tumultuous scene with surprise, while Fix asked a man near him what the cause of it was all about. Before the man could reply, a fresh agitation rose. Hurrahs and excited shouts were heard. The staffs of banners began to use offensive weapons, and fists flew about in every direction. Thumps were exchanged from the tops of carriages and omnibuses which had been blocked up in the crowd. Boots and shoes went whirling through the air, and Mr. Fogg thought he even heard the crack of revolvers mingling in the din. The rout approached the stairway and flowed over the lower step. One of the parties had evidently been repulsed, but the mere lookers-on could not tell whether Menderboy or Camerfield had gained the upper hand. "'It would be prudent for us to retire,' said Fix, who was anxious that Mr. Fogg should not receive any injury, at least until they got back to London. "'If there is any question about England and all this, and we are recognized, I fear it would go hard with us.' An English subject began Mr. Fogg. He did not finish his sentence, for a terrific hubbub now arose on the terrace behind the flights of steps where they stood, and the frantic shouts of hurrah for Mandaboy, hip hip hurrah. It was a band of voters coming to the rescue of their allies and taking the Camerfield forces in flank. Mr. Fogg, Aouda, and Fix found themselves between two fires. It was too late to escape. The torrent of men armed with loaded canes and sticks was irresistible. Phileas Fogg and Fix were roughly hustled in their attempts to protect their fair companion. The former, as cool as ever, tried to defend himself with the weapons which nature had placed at the very end of every Englishman's arm, but in vain. A big brawny fellow with a red beard, flushed face, and broad shoulders, who seemed to be the chief of his band, raised his clenched fist to strike Mr. Fogg, whom he would have given an enormous crushing blow had not Fix rushed in and received it instead. An enormous bruise immediately made its appearance under the detective's silk hat, which was completely smashed in. "'Yankee!' exclaimed Mr. Fogg, daring a compensuous look at the ruffian. "'Englishman,' returned the other. "'We will meet again. When you please. What's your name? Phileas Fogg and yours? Colonel Stamp Proctor.' The human tide now swept by, after overturning Fix, who speedily got upon his feet again, though with tattered clothes. Happily, he was not seriously hurt. His traveling overcoat was divided into two unequal parts, and his trousers resembled those of certain Indians, which fit less compactly than they are easy to put on. Ayuda had escaped unharmed, and Fix alone bore marks of the fray in his black and blue bruise. "'Thanks,' said Mr. Fogg to the detective, as soon as they were out of the crowd. "'No thanks are necessary,' replied Fix. "'But let us go.' "'Where? To a tailor's?' Such a visit was, indeed, opportune. The clothing of both Mr. Fogg and Fix was in rags, as if they had themselves been actively engaged in the contest between Camerfield and Mandeboy. An hour after, they were once more suitably attired, and with Aoda returned to the International Hotel. Passepartout was waiting for his master, armed with a half-dozen six-barreled revolvers. When he perceived Fix, he knit his brows, but Aoda, having in few words told him of their adventure, his countenance resumed its placid expression— Fix evidently was no longer an enemy, but an ally. He was faithful, keeping his word. Dinner over, the coach, which was to convey the passengers and their luggage to the station, drew up to the door. As he was getting in, Mr. Fodd said to Fix, "'You have not seen this Colonel Proctor again? No.' "'I will come back to America to find him,' said Phileas Fogg calmly. "'It would not be right for an Englishman to permit himself to be treated in that way without retaliating.' The detective smiled, but did not reply. It was clear that Mr. Fogg was one of those Englishmen who, while they did not tolerate dueling at home, fight abroad when their honor is attacked. At a quarter before six, the travelers reached the station and found the train ready to depart. As he was about to enter it, Mr. Fogg called the porter and said to him, "'My friend, was there not some trouble today in San Francisco?' 
It was a political meeting, sir, replied the porter. But I thought there was a great deal of disturbance in the streets. It was only a meeting of the assembled for an election. An election of the general-in-chief, no doubt, asked Mr. Fogg. No, sir, a justice of the peace. Phileas Fogg got into the train, which started off at full speed. End of chapter 25. Read by David Russell. For Lit to Go. Available on the web at fcit.usf.edu. Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne Chapter 26 In which Phileas Fogg and party travel by the Pacific Railroad <clears throat> From ocean to ocean, so say the Americans, and these four words compose the general designation of the Great Trunk Line, which crosses the entire width of the United States. The Pacific Railroad is, however, really divided into two distinct lines. The Central Pacific, between San Francisco and Ogden, and the Union Pacific, between Ogden and Omaha. Five main lines connect Omaha with New York. New York and San Francisco are thus united by an uninterrupted metal ribbon which measures no less than 3,786 miles. Between Omaha and the Pacific, the railway crosses a territory which is still infested by Indians and wild beasts, and a large tract which the Mormons, after they were driven from Illinois in 1845, began to colonize. The journey from New York to San Francisco consumed, formerly under the most favorable conditions, at least six months. It is now accomplished in seven days. It was in 1862 that, in spite of the southern members of Congress who wished a more southerly route, it was decided to lay the road between 41st and 42nd parallels. President Lincoln himself fixed the end of the line at Omaha and Nebraska. The work was at once commenced and pursued with true American energy, nor did the rapidity with which it went on injuriously affect its good execution. The road grew on the prairies, a mile and a half a day. A locomotive running on the rails laid down the evening before brought the rails to be laid on the morrow, and advanced upon them as fast as they were put in position. The Pacific Railroad is joined by several branches in Iowa, Kansas, Colorado, and Oregon. On leaving Omaha, it passes along the left bank of the Platte River as far as the junction of its northern branch. It follows the southern branch, crosses the Laramie Territory and the Watash Mountains, turns the Great Salt Lake and reaches Salt Lake City, the Mormon capital, plunges into the Tallulah Valley, across the American Desert, Cedar and Humboldt Mountains, the Sierra Nevada, and descends via Sacramento to the Pacific, its grade, even on the Rocky Mountains, never exceeding 112 feet to the mile. Such was the road to be traversed in seven days, which would enable Phileas Fogg, at least so he hoped, to take the Atlantic steamer at New York on the 11th for Liverpool. The car which he occupied was a sort of long omnibus with eight wheels, and with no compartments in the interior, it was supplied with two rows of seats perpendicular to the direction of the train on either side of the aisle which conducted to the front and rear platforms. These platforms were found throughout the train, and the passengers were able to pass from one end of the train to the other. It was supplied with saloon cars, balcony cars, restaurant and smoking cars. Theater cars alone were wanting, and they will all have these some day. Book and news dealers, seller of edibles, drinkables, and cigars, who seemed to have plenty of customers, were continually circulating the aisles. The train left Oaken Station at six o'clock. It was already night, cold and cheerless, and the heavens being overclassed with clouds which did not seem to threaten snow, the train did not proceed rapidly. Counting the stoppages, it did not run more than twenty miles an hour, which was a sufficient speed, however, to enable it to reach Omaha within its designated time. There was but little conversation in the car, and soon many of the passengers were overcome with sleep. Passepartout found himself beside the detective, but he did not talk to him. After recent events, their relations with each other had grown somewhat cold. There could no longer be mutual sympathy or intimacy between them. Fix's manner had not changed, but Passepartout was very reserved and ready to strangle his former friend on the slightest provocation. Snow began to fall an hour after they had started, a fine snow, however, which could absolutely not obstruct the train. Nothing could be seen from the windows but a vast white sheet against which the smoke of the locomotive had a grayish aspect. At eight o'clock, a steward entered the car and announced that the time for going to bed had arrived, and in a few minutes the car was transformed into a dormitory. The backs of seats were thrown back, bedsteads carefully packed were rolled over by an ingenious system. Berths were suddenly improvised, and each traveler had soon at his disposition a comfortable bed, protected from curious eyes by thick curtains. The sheets were clean and the pillow soft. It only remained to go to bed and sleep, which everybody did, while the train sped across the state of California. The country between San Francisco and Sacramento is not very hilly. 
The Central Pacific, taking Sacramento for its starting point, extends eastward to meet the road from Omaha. The line from San Francisco to Sacramento runs a northeasterly direction, along the American River, which empties into San Pablo Bay. The 120 miles between these cities were accomplished in six hours, and towards midnight, while fast asleep, the travelers passed through Sacramento, so that they saw nothing of the important place, the seat of the state of government with its fine quays, its broad streets, its noble hotels, squares, and churches. The train, on leaving Sacramento and passing the junction Roslyn, Auburn, and Colifax, entered the range of the Sierra Nevada. Cisco was reached at seven in the morning, and an hour later the dormitory was transformed into an ordinary car, and the travelers could observe the picturesque beauties of the mountain region through which they were steaming. The railway track wound in and out among the passes, now approaching the mountain sides, now suspended over the precipices, avoiding abrupt angles by bold curves, plunging into narrow defiles, which seemed to have no outlet. The locomotive, its great funnel emitting a weird light with a sharp bell and its cowcatcher extended like a spur, mingled its shrieks and bellowings with the noise of torrents and cascades, and twined its smoke among the branches of the gigantic pines. There were few or no bridges or tunnels on the route. The railway turned around the sides of the mountain, and did not attempt to violate nature by taking the shortest cut from one point to another. The train entered the state of Nevada through the Carson Valley, about nine o'clock, going always northeasterly, and at midday reached Reno, where there was a delay of twenty minutes for breakfast. From this point the road, running along the Humboldt River, passed northward for several miles by its banks. Then it turned eastward, and kept by the river until it reached the Humboldt Range, nearly at the extreme eastern limit of Nevada. Having breakfast, Mr. Fogg and his companions resumed their places in the car and observed the varied landscape which unfolded itself as they passed along the vast prairies, the mountains lining the horizon, the creeks with their frothy foaming streams. Sometimes a great herd of buffaloes, massing together in the distance, seemed like a movable dam. These innumerable multitudes of ruminating beasts often form an insurmountable obstacle to the passage of trains. Thousands of them have been seen passing over the track for hours together in compact ranks. The locomotive is then forced to stop and wait it once more until the road is clear. This happened, indeed, to the train in which Mr. Fogg was traveling. About twelve o'clock, a group of ten or twelve thousand head of buffalo encumbered the track. The locomotive, slackening its speed, tried to clear the way with its cowcatcher, but the mass of animals was too great. The buffaloes marched along with a tranquil gait, uttering now and then the deafening bellowings. There is no use of interrupting them, for having taken a particular direction, nothing can moderate and change their course. It is a torrent of living flesh which no dam could contain. The travelers gazed on this curious spectacle from the platforms, but Phileas Fogg, who had the most reason of all to be in a hurry, remained in his seat, and waited philosophically until it should please the buffaloes to get on out of the way. Passepartout was furious at the delay they occasioned, and longed to discharge his arsenal of revolvers upon them. What a country, cried he, mere cattle stop the trains, and go by in procession, just as if they were not impeding travel, parbleu. I should like to know if Mr. Fogg foresaw this mishap in his program. And here's an engineer who doesn't care to run the locomotive into the herd of beasts. The engineer did not try to overcome the obstacle, and he was wise. He would have crushed the first buffaloes, no doubt with the cow herder, but the locomotive, however powerful, would have soon been checked. The train would have inevitably been thrown off the track and would have been helpless. The best course was to wait patiently and regain the lost time by greater speed when the obstacle was removed. The procession of buffaloes lasted three full hours, and it was night before the track was clear. The last ranks of the herd were now passing over the rails, while the first had already disappeared below the southern horizon. It was eight o'clock when the train passed through the defiles of Humboldt Range, and half-past nine when it penetrated Utah, the region of the Great Salt Lake, the singular colony of the Mormons. End of chapter 26. Read by David Russell. For Lit to Go. Available on the web at fcit.usf.edu. Around the World in 80 Days. By Jules Verne. Chapter 27, in which Passepartout undergoes, at a speed of twenty miles an hour, a course of Mormon history. During the night on the 5th of December, a train ran southeasterly for about fifty miles, then rose in equal distance in a northeasterly direction towards the Great Salt Lake. Passepartout, about nine o'clock, went out upon the platform to take in the air. The weather was cold, the heavens gray, but it was not snowing. The sun's disk, enlarged by the mist, seemed an enormous ring of gold, and Passepartout was amusing himself by calculating its value in pounds sterling. 
when he was diverted from this interesting study by a strange-looking personage who made his appearance on the platform. This personage, who had taken the train at Elko, was tall and dark, with black mustache, black stockings, black silk hat, a black waistcoat, black trousers, a white cravat, and dogskin gloves. He might have been taken for a clergyman. He ran from one end of the train to the other, and affixed to the door of each car a notice written in manuscript. Passepartout approached and read one of these notices, which stated that Elder William Hitch, Mormon missionary, taking advantage of his presence on train number 48, would deliver a lecture on Mormonism in car number 117, from 11 to 12 o'clock, and that he invited all who were desirous of being instructed concerning the mysteries of the religion of the Latter-day Saints to attend. "'I'll go,' said Passepartout to himself. He knew nothing of Mormonism except the custom of polygamy, which is its foundation.' The news quickly spread through the train, which contained about 100 passengers, 30 of whom, at most, attracted by the notice, ensconced themselves in car number 117. Passepartout took one of the front seats. Neither Mr. Fogg nor Fix cared to attend. At the appointed hour, Elder William Hitch rose, and, in an irritated voice, as if he had already been contradicted, said, I tell you that Joe Smith is a martyr, that his brother Hiram is a martyr, and the persecutions of the United States. Government dare against the prophets will also make a martyr of Brigham Young. Who dares to say the contrary? No one ventured to gainsay the missionary, whose excited tone contrasted curiously with his natural calm visage. No doubt his anger arose from the hardships to which the Mormons were actually subjected. The government had just succeeded with some difficulty in reducing these independent fanatics to its rule. It had made itself master of Utah and subjugated that territory to the laws of the Union. After imprisoning Brigham Young on a charge of rebellion and polygamy, the disciples of the prophet had since redoubled their efforts and resisted, by words at least, the authority of Congress. Elder Hitch, as is seen, was trying to make precedents on the very railway trains. Then, emphasizing his words with his loud voice and frequent gestures, he related the story of the Mormons from biblical times, how that in Israel a Mormon prophet of the tribe of Joseph published the annals of the new religion and bequeathed them to his son Mormon, how many centuries later a translation of this precious book, which was written in Egyptian, was made by Joseph Smith, Jr., a Vermont farmer who revealed himself as a mystical prophet in 1825, and how, in short, the celestial messenger appeared to him in an illuminated forest and gave him the annals of the Lord. Several of the audience, not being much interested in the missionary's narrative, had left the car. But Elder Hitch, continuing his lecture, related how Smith, Jr., with his father, two brothers, a few disciples, founded the Church of the Latter-day Saints, which adopted not only in America, but in England, Norway, Sweden, and Germany, counts many artisans, as well as men engaged in the liberal professions among its members, how a colony was established in Ohio, a temple erected there at the cost of $200,000, and a town built at Kirkland. How Smith became an enterprising banker and received from a simple mummy showman a papyrus scroll written by Abraham and several famous Egyptians. The elder's story was somewhat wearisome, and his audience grew gradually less, until it was reduced to twenty passengers. But this did not disconcert the enthusiast, who proceeded with the story of Joseph Smith's bankruptcy in 1837 and how his ruined creditors gave him a coat of tar and feathers. His reappearance some years afterwards, more honorable and honored than ever, at Independence, Missouri, the chief of a flourishing colony of three thousand disciples, and his pursuit thence by outraged Gentiles and retirement to the far west. Ten hearers were now left, among them Honest Passepartout, who was listening with all his ears. Thus he learned that, after long persecutions, Smith reappeared in Illinois, and in 1839 founded a community at Nuavu on the Mississippi, numbering 25,000 souls, of which he became mayor, chief justice, and general-in-chief, that he announced himself in 1843 as a candidate for the presidency of the United States, and that finally, being drawn into ambuscade at Carthage, he was thrown into prison and assassinated by a band of men disguised in masks. Passepartout was now the only person left in the car, and the elder, looking him full in the face, reminded him that two years after the assassination of Joseph Smith, the inspired prophet Brigham Young, his successor, left Nauvoo for the banks of the Great Salt Lake, where in the midst of that fertile region directly en route of the immigrants who crossed Utah on their way to California, the new colony, thanks to the polygamy practiced by the Mormons, had flourished beyond expectation. And this, added William Hitch, this is why the jealousy of Congress has been aroused against us. Why have the soldiers of the Union invaded the soil of Utah? Why has Brigham Young, our chief, been imprisoned in contempt of all justice? Shall we yield to force? Never. Driven from Vermont, driven from Illinois, driven from Ohio, driven from Missouri, driven from Utah, we shall yet find some independent territory under which to plant our tents. And you, my brother, 
continued the elder, fixing his angry eyes upon his single auditor, will not plant yours there, too, under the shadow of our flag. No, replied Passepartout courageously, in his turn retiring from the car and leaving the elder to preach to vacancy. During the lecture, the train had been making good progress. Towards half-past twelve, it reached the northwest border of the Great Salt Lake. Thence, the passengers could observe the vast extent of the interior sea, which was also called the Dead Sea, and into which flows in the American Jordan. It is a picturesque expanse, framed in lofty crags and large strata, encrusted with white salt, a superb sheet of water, which was formerly larger extent than now, its shores having encroached with the lapse of time, and thus once reduced its breadth and increased its depth. The Salt Lake, seventy miles long and thirty-five wide, is situated three miles, eight hundred feet above the sea, quite different from Lake Asphaltit, whose depression is twelve hundred feet below the sea. It contains considerable salt, and one quarter the weight of its water is solid matter. The specific weight having been one thousand one hundred seventy, and after being distilled one thousand. Fishes are, of course, unable to live in it, and those which descend through the Jordan water and other seams soon perish. The country around the lake was well cultivated, for the Mormons are mostly farmers, while ranchers and pens for domesticated animals, fields of wheat, corn, and other cereals, luxuriant prairies, hedges of wild rose, clumps of acacias, and milkwort would have seen six months later. Now the ground was covered with a thin powdering of snow. The train reached Ogden at two o'clock, where it rested for six hours. Mr. Fogg and his party had time to pay a visit to Salt Lake City, connected with Ogden by a branch road, and they spent two hours in this strikingly American town, built on the pattern of other cities of the Union like a checkered board, with the somber sadness of right angles, as Victor Hugo expresses it. The founder of the City of the Saints could not escape from the taste of symmetry which distinguishes the Anglo-Saxons in this strange country, where people are certainly not up to the level of their institutions. Everything is done squarely. Cities, houses, and follies. The travelers, then, were promenading at three o'clock about the streets of the town built between the banks of the Jordan and the spurs of the Watash Range. They saw few or no churches, but the prophet's mansion, the courthouse, and the arsenal, blue brick houses with verandas and porches, surrounded by gardens bordered with acacias, palm, and locusts, a clay and pebble wall built in 1853 surrounded the town, and the principal street where the market and several hotels adorned with pavilions. The place did not seem thickly populated. The streets were almost deserted, except in the vicinity of the temple, which they only reached after having traversed several quarters surrounded by palisades. There were many women, which was easily accounted for by the peculiar institution of the Mormons. But it must not be supposed that all Mormons are polygamists. They are free to marry or not as they please. But it is worth noting that it is mainly the female citizens of Utah who are anxious to marry. As according to the Mormon religion... Maiden ladies are not admitted to the possession of its highest joys. These poor creatures seem to be neither well-off nor happy. Some, the more well-to-do, no doubt, wore short, open black silk dresses under a hood or modest shawl. Others were habited in Indian fashion. Passepartout could not behold, without a certain fright, these women, charged in groups with conferring happiness on a single Mormon. His common sense pitied above all the husband. It seemed to him a terrible thing to have to guide so many wives at once across the vicissitudes of life, and to conduct them, as it were, in a body to the Mormon paradise, with the prospect of seeing them in the company of the glorious Smith, who doubtless was the chief ornament of that delightful place to all eternity. He felt decidedly repelled from such a vocation, and he imagined, perhaps he was mistaken, that the fair ones of Salt Lake City cast rather alarming glances on his person. Happily his stay there was but brief. At four the party found themselves again at the station, and took their places in the train, and the whistle sounded for the starting. Just at the moment, however, the locomotive wheels began to move, cries of stop, stop were heard. Trains, like time and tide, stopped for no one. The gentleman who uttered the cries was evidently a belated Mormon. He was breathless with running. Happily for him, the station had neither gates nor barriers. He rushed along the track, jumped on the rear platform of the train, and fell, exhausted, into one of the seats. Passepartout, who had been anxiously watching this amateur gymnast, approached him with lively interest, and learned that he had taken flight after an unpleasant domestic scene. When the Mormon had recovered his breath, Passepartout ventured to ask him politely how many wives he had, for... From the manner it was which he had decamped, it might be thought of that he had twenty at least. One, sir, replied the Mormon, raising his arms, having a word. One, and that was enough. End of chapter 27. Read by David Russell. For Lit to Go. Available on the web at fcit.usf.edu. Around the World in Eighty Days. By Jules Verne. Chapter 28 in which Passepartout does not succeed in making anybody listen to reason. 
The train, on leaving Great Salt Lake at Ogden, passed northward for an hour as far as the Weber River. Having completed nearly 900 miles from San Francisco, from this point it took in an easterly direction towards the jagged Wasatch Mountains. It was in the section included between this range and the Rocky Mountains that the American engineers found the most formidable difficulties in laying the road, and that the government granted a subsidy of $48,000 per mile instead of $16,000 allowed for the work done on the plains. But the engineers, instead of violating nature, avoided its difficulties by winding around instead of penetrating the rocks. One tunnel only, 14,000 feet in length, was pierced in order to arrive at the Great Basin. The track up to this time had reached its highest elevation at the Great Salt Lake. From this point, it described a long curve, descending towards Bitter Creek Valley to rise again at the dividing ridge of the waters between the Atlantic and Pacific. There were many creeks in this mountainous region, and it was necessary to cross Muddy Creek, Green Creek, and others upon culverts. Passepartout grew more and more impatient as they went on, while Fix longed to get out of this difficult region and was more anxious than Phileas Fogg himself to be beyond the danger of delays and accidents and set a foot on English soul. At ten o'clock at night the train stopped at Fort Bridger Station and twenty minutes later entered the Wyoming Territory. Followed by the Valley of Bitter Creek throughout, the next day, 7th December, they stopped for a quarter of an hour at Green River Station. Snow had fallen abundantly during the night, but being mixed with rain it half-melted. It did not interrupt the progress. The bad weather, however, annoyed Passepartout, for the accumulation of snow by blocking the wheels of cars would have certainly been fatal to Mr. Fogg's tour. "'What an idea,' he said to himself. "'Why did my master make this journey in winter? Couldn't he have waited for a good season to increase his chances?' While the worthy Frenchman was absorbed in a state of sky and depression of the temperature, Aouda was experiencing fears from a totally different cause." Several passengers had got off at Green River and were walking up and down the platforms. Among these, they would have recognized Colonel Stamp Proctor, the same who had grossly insulted Phileas Fogg at the San Francisco meeting. Not wishing to be recognized, the young woman drew back from the window, feeling much alarm at her discovery. She was attached to the man who, however coldly, gave her daily evidences of the most absolute devotion. She did not comprehend, perhaps, the depth of the sentiment with which her protector inspired her, which she called gratitude, but which, though she was unconscious of it, was really more than that. Her heart sank within her when she recognized the man whom Mr. Fogg desired, sooner or later, to call into account for his conduct. Chance alone, it was clear, had brought Colonel Proctor on this train. But there he was, and it was necessary, at all hazards, that Phileas Fogg should not perceive his adversary. Iota seized a moment when Mr. Fogg was asleep to tell Fix and Passepartout whom she had seen. "'That Proctor is on this train,' cried Fix. "'Well, reassure yourself, madam, before he settles with Mr. Fogg, he has got to deal with me. It seems that I was the more insulted of the two. "'And besides,' added Passepartout, "'I'll take charge of him, Colonel, as he is. "'Mr. Fix,' resumed Iota, "'Mr. Fogg would allow no one to avenge him. "'He said he would come back to America to find this man. "'Should he receive Colonel Proctor, "'we would not prevent a collision which might have terrible results. "'He must not see him.' "'You are right, madam,' replied Fix. "'A meeting between them might ruin all. "'Whether he were victorious or beaten, Mr. Fogg would be delayed, "'and, and,' added Passepartout, "'that would play the game of the gentlemen of the Reform Club. "'In four days we shall be in New York. "'Well, if my master does not leave his car during these four days, "'we may hope that chance will not bring him face to face "'with this confounded American. "'We must, if possible, prevent the stirring out of it.' "'The conversation dropped. "'Mr. Fogg had just woke up and was looking out of the window.' Soon after Passepartout, without being heard by his master Iota, whispered to the detective, "'Would you really fight for him?' "'I would do anything,' replied Fix, in a tone which betrayed determined will, to get him living back to Europe. Passepartout felt something like a shudder shoot through his frame, but his confidence in his master remained unbroken. Was there any means of detaining Mr. Fogg in this car, to avoid a meeting between him and the colonel? It ought not to be a difficult task, since that gentleman was naturally sedentary and a little curious. The detective, at least, seemed to have found a way, for after a few moments he said to Mr. Fogg, "'These are long and slow hours, sir, that we are passing on the railway.' "'Yes,' replied Mr. Fogg, "'but they pass. "'You are in the habit of playing whist,' resumed Fix, "'on the steamers. "'Yes, but it would be difficult to do so here. "'I have neither cards nor partners. "'Oh, but we can easily buy some cards, "'for they are sold on all the American trains. "'As for partners, if Madame plays, "'certainly, sir,' Ayuda quickly replied, "'I understand whist. "'It's a part of an English education. "'I, myself, having some pretensions to play a good game, "'well, here are three of us and a dummy.' "'As you please, sir,' replied Phileas Fogg, "'heartily glad to resume his favorite pastime, even on the railway. "'Passepartout was dispatched in search of the steward, "'and soon returned with two packs of cards, "'some pins, counters, and a shelf covered with cloth. "'The game commenced, 
Aouda understood Whist sufficiently well and even received some compliments on her playing for Mr. Fogg. As for the detective, he was simply an adept and worthy of being matched against his present opponent. Now, thought Passepartout, we've got him. He won't budge. At eleven in the morning, the train had reached the dividing ridge of the waters of the Bridger Pass. Seven thousand five hundred and twenty-four feet above the level of the sea, one of the highest points attained by the track in crossing the Rocky Mountains. After going about two hundred miles, the travellers at last found themselves on one of those vast plains which extend to the Atlantic, and which nature has made so propitious for laying in the iron road. On the declivity of the Atlantic basin, the first streams, branches of the North Platte River, already appeared. The whole northern and eastern horizon was bounded by the immense semicircular curtain which is formed by the southern portion of the Rocky Mountains, the highest being Laramie Peak. Between these the railway extended vast plains, plentifully irrigated. On the right rose lower spurs of the mountainous pass which extends southward to the sources of the Arkansas River, one of the greatest tributaries of the Missouri. At half-past twelve the travelers caught sight for an instance of Fort Halleck, which commands that section and in a few more hours the Rocky Mountains were crossed. There was reason to hope, then, that no accident would mark their journey through this difficult country. The snow had ceased falling, and in the air became crisp and cold. Large birds, frightened by the locomotive, rose and flew off in the distance. No wild beast appeared on the plain. It was a desert in its vast nakedness. After a comfortable breakfast served in the car, Mr. Fogg and his partners had just resumed whist, when a violent whistling was heard and the train stopped. Passepartout put his head out the door, but saw nothing to cause delay. No station was in view. Aouda and Fix feared that Mr. Fogg might take it to his head to get out, but that gentleman contented himself with a saying to his servant, "'See what is the matter.' Passepartout rushed out of the car. Thirty or forty passengers had descended amongst them, Colonel Stamp Proctor." The train had stopped before a red signal which blocked the way. The engineer and conductor were talking excitedly with the signal man, whom the station master at Medicine Bow, the next stopping place, had sent on before. The passengers drew around and took part in the discussion, in which Colonel Proctor, with his insolent banner, was conspicuous. Passepartout, joining the group, heard the signal man say, No, you can't pass. The bridge at Medicine Bow is shaky and would not bear the weight of the train. This was a suspension bridge, thrown over some rapids about a mile from the place where they now were. According to the signal man, it was a ruinous condition, several of the iron wires being broken, and it was possible to risk the passage. He did not in any way exaggerate the condition of the bridge. It may be taken for granted that, rash as the Americans usually are, when they are prudent, there is good reason for it. Passepartout, not daring to apprise his master of what he heard, listened with set teeth, immovable as a statue. Hmm cried Colonel Proctor. But we are not going to stay here, I imagine, and take root in the snow, Colonel, replied the conductor. We have telegraphed to Omaha for a train, but it is not likely it will reach Medicine Bow in less than six hours. Six hours, cried Passepartout. Certainly, returned the conductor. Besides, it will take us as long as that to reach Medicine Bow on foot. But it's only a mile from here, said one of the passengers. Yes, but it's on the other side of the river. And can't we cross in a boat, asked the Colonel. That's impossible. The creek is swelled by the rains. It is a rapid, for we shall have to make a circuit of ten miles to the north to find a ford. The colonel launched a volley of oaths denouncing railway company and the conductor, and Passepartout, who was furious, was not disinclined to make common cause with him. Here was an obstacle indeed, which all his master's banknotes could not remove. There's a general disappointment among the passengers who, without reckoning the delay, saw themselves compelled to trudge fifteen miles over a plain covered with snow. They grumbled and protested, and would certainly have thus attracted Phileas Fogg's attention if he had not been completely absorbed in his game. Passepartout found out that he could not avoid telling his master what had occurred, and with hanging head was turning towards the car when the engineer, a true Yankee named Forrester, called out, "'Gentlemen, perhaps there is a way, after all, to get over.' "'On the bridge?' asked the passenger. "'On the bridge.' "'With our train?' "'With our train.' Passepartout stopped short, and eagerly listened to the engineer. "'But the bridge is unsafe,' urged the conductor." "'No matter,' replied Forrester. "'I think that by putting on the very highest speed "'we might have a chance of getting over.' "'The devil,' murdered Passepartout. "'But a number of passengers were at once attracted "'by the engineer's proposal, "'and Colonel Proctor was especially delighted "'and found the plan very feasible. "'He told stories about engineers "'leaping their trains over rivers without bridges "'by putting on full steam, "'and many of those present avowed themselves "'of the engineer's mind. "'We have fifty chances out of a hundred getting over,' said one. Eighty, ninety, Passepartout was astounded, and though ready to attempt anything to get over Medicine Creek, thought the experiment proposed a little too American. 
Besides, thought he, there is still more simple way, and it doesn't even occur to any of these people, sir, he said aloud to one of the passengers. The engineer's plan seems to me a little dangerous, but eighty chances, replied the passenger, turning his back on him. I know it, said Passepartout, turning to another passenger. But a simple idea, ideas are no use, returned the American, shrugging his shoulders, as the engineer assures us that we can pass. Doubtless, urged Passepartout, we can pass, but perhaps it would be more prudent. What? Prudent? cried Colonel Proctor, whose words seemed to excite prodigiously. At full speed, don't you see? At full speed. I know, I see. But it would be, if not more prudent, since that word displeases you, at least more natural. Poof, what? What's the matter with this fellow? cried several. The poor fellow did not know whom to address himself. Are you afraid? asked Colonel Proctor. I afraid? Very well. I will show these people that a Frenchman can be as American as they. All aboard, cried the conductor. Yes, all aboard, repeated Passepartout, and immediately. But they can't prevent me from thinking that it would be more natural f for us to cross the bridge on foot and let the train come after. But no one heard this sage reflection, nor would anyone have acknowledged its justice. The passengers resumed their places in the cars. Passepartout took a seat without telling what had passed. The whist players were quite absorbed in their game. The locomotive whistled vigorously. The engineer, reversing the steam, backed up the train for nearly a mile, retiring like a jumper in order to take a longer leap. Then, with another whistle, he began to move forward. The train increased its speed, and soon its rapidity became frightful. The prolonged screech issues from the locomotive. The piston worked up and down twenty strokes to the second. They perceived that the whole train, rushing on the rate of a hundred miles an hour, hardly bore up the rails at all. And then they passed over. It was like a flash. No one saw the bridge. The train leaped, so to speak, from one bank to the other. And the engineer could not stop it until it had gone five miles beyond the station. But scarcely had the train passed the river when the bridge, completely ruined, fell with a crash into the rapids of Medicine Bow. End of chapter 28. Read by David Russell. For Lit to Go. Available on the web at fcit.usf.edu. Around the World in Eighty Days, by Jules Verne, Chapter 29, in which certain incidents are narrated which are only to be met with on American railroads. The train pursued its course, that evening, without interruption, passing Fort Saunders, crossing Cheyenne Pass, and reaching Evans Pass. The road here attained the highest elevation of the journey, 8,092 feet above the level of the sea. The travelers now had only to descend to the Atlantic by the limitless plains leveled by nature. A branch of the Grand Trunk led off southward towards Denver, the capital of Colorado. The country round about is rich in gold and silver, and more than 50,000 inhabitants are already settled there. 1,382 miles have been passed over from San Francisco in three days and three nights. Four days and nights more would probably bring them to New York. Phileas Fogg was not as yet behindhand. During the night, Camp Wabuck was passed on the left. Lodge Pole Creek ran parallel with the road, marking the boundary between the territories of Wyoming and Colorado. They entered Nebraska at eleven, passed near Sedwick, and touched at Julesburg on the southern branch of the Platt River. It was here that the Union Pacific Railroad was inaugurated on the 23rd of October, 1867, by Chief Engineer General Dodge. Two powerful locomotives carrying nine cars of invited guests, among of whom was Thomas C. Durant, vice president of the road, stopped at this point. Cheers were given, the Sioux and Pawnees performed an imitation Indian battle, fireworks were let off, and the first number of the railway pioneer was printed by a press brought on the train. Thus was celebrated the inauguration of this great railroad, a mighty instrument of progress and civilization, thrown across the desert and destined to link together more cities and towns which do not yet exist. The whistle of the locomotive, more powerful than Amphion's lyre, was about to bid them rise from the American soil. Fort McPherson was left behind at eight in the morning, and 357 miles had yet to be traversed before reaching Omaha. The road followed the capricious windings of the southern branch of the Plate River. On its left bank, at nine the train stopped at the important town of North Platte, built between the two arms of the river, which rejoin each other around it and form a single artery, on a large tributary whose waters empty into the Missouri a little above Omaha. The 101st Meridian was passed. Mr. Fogg and his partners had resumed their game. Not one, not even the dummy, complained the length of the trip. Fix had begun by winning several guineas, which he seemed likely to lose. He showed himself a not less eager whist player than Mr. Fogg. During the morning, chance distinctly favored that gentleman. Trumps and honors were showered upon his hands. Once, having resolved on a bold stroke, he was on the point of playing a spade when a voice behind him said, I should play a diamond. 
Mr. Fogg, it would have fixed, raised their heads, and beheld Colonel Proctor. Stamp Proctor and Phileas Fogg recognized each other at once. "'Ah, it's you, is it, Englishman?' cried the colonel. "'Is it you who are going to play a spade?' "'And who plays it?' replied Phileas Fogg coolly, throwing down the ten of spades. "'Well, it pleases me to have it diamonds,' replied Colonel Proctor in an insolent tone. He made a movement as to seize the card which had just been played, adding, "'You don't understand anything about whist.' "'Perhaps I do, as well as another,' said Phileas Fogg, rising. "'You only have to try, son of John Bull,' replied the colonel. Iuda turned pale, and her blood ran cold. She seized Mr. Fogg's arm and gently pulled him back. Passepartout was ready to pounce upon the American, who was staring instantly at his opponent, but Fix got up, and, going to Colonel Proctor, said, "'You forget that it is whom I you have to deal with, sir, for it was I whom you not only insulted but struck.' "'Mr. Fix,' said Mr. Fogg, "'pardon me, but this affair is mine and mine only. The Colonel has again insulted me by insisting that I should not play a spade, and he shall give me satisfaction for it.' "'When and where you will,' replied the American, "'whatever weapon you choose.' Iota in vain attempt to retain Mr. Fogg as vainly as the detective endeavor to make quarrel with his. Passepartout wished to throw the colonel out of the window, but a sign from his master checked him. Phileas Fogg left the car, and the American followed upon the platform. Sir, said Mr. Fogg to his adversary, I am in great hurry to get back to Europe, and any delay, whatever, will be greatly to my disadvantage. Well, what's that to me? Sir, said Mr. Fogg very politely, after our meeting at San Francisco, I determined to return to America and find you as soon as I had completed the business which called me to England. Really? "'Will you appoint a meeting for six months hence? "'Why not ten years hence?' "'I say six months,' returned Phileas Fogg, "'and I shall be at the place of the meeting promptly.' "'All this is an evasion,' cried Stamp Proctor. "'Now or never. "'Very good. "'You are going to New York? "'No. "'To Chicago? "'No. "'To Omaha. "'What difference is it to you? "'Do you know Plum Creek? "'No. "'It's the next station. "'The train will be there in an hour, "'and we will stop there ten minutes. "'In ten minutes several revolver shots could be exchanged. "'Very well.' said Mr. Fogg. I will stop at Plum Creek. And I guess you'll stay there, too, added the American insolently. Who knows? replied Mr. Fogg, returning to the car as coolly as usual. He began to reassure Aoda, telling her that blusterers were never to be feared, and begged Fix to be his second at the approaching duel, a request which the detective could not refuse. Mr. Fogg resumed the interrupted game with perfect calmness. At eleven o'clock the locomotive's whistle announced that they were approaching Plum Creek Station. Mr. Fogg rose and, followed by Fix, went out upon the platform. Passepartout accompanied him, carrying a pair of revolvers. Ayuda remained in the car, as pale as death. The door of the next car opened, and Colonel Proctor appeared on the platform, attended by a Yankee of his own stamp as his second. But just as the combatants were about to step off the train, the conductor hurried up and shouted, "'You can't get off, gentlemen.' "'Why not? We are twenty minutes late. We shall not stop. But I'm going to fight a duel with this gentleman. I'm sorry,' said the conductor. "'But we shall be off at once. There's the bell ringing now.' The train started." "'I'm really very sorry, gentlemen,' said the conductor. "'Under any other circumstances, I should have been happy to oblige you. "'But after all, as you have not had time to fight here, why not fight as we go along?' "'That wouldn't be convenient, perhaps, for this gentleman,' said the colonel in a jeering tone. "'It would be perfectly so,' replied Phileas Fogg. "'Well, we really are in America,' thought Passepartout, "'and the conductor is a gentleman of the first order.' "'So muttering, he followed his master.' The two combatants and their seconds and the conductor passed through the cars to the rear of the train. The last car was the only occupied by a dozen passengers, who the conductor politely asked if they could not be so kind as to leave it vacant for a few moments, as the two gentlemen had an affair of honor to settle. The passengers granted the request with a larcity and straightway disappeared on the platform. The car, which was some fifty feet long, was very convenient for their purpose. The adversaries might march on the end of the other aisle and file at their ease. Never was a duel more easily arranged. Mr. Fogg and Colonel Proctor, each provided with two six-barreled revolvers, entered the car. The seconds remaining outside shut them in, and they were to begin firing at the first whistle of the locomotive, after an interval of two minutes. What remained of the two gentlemen could be taken from the car. Nothing could be more simple, indeed. It was all so simple that Fix and Passepartout felt their hearts beating as if they would crack. They were listening for the whistle agreed upon, when suddenly savage cries resounded in the air, accompanied by reports, which certainly did not issue from the car where their duelists were. The reports continued in front in the whole length of the train. Cries of terror proceeded from the interior of the cars. Colonel Proctor and Mr. Fogg, revolvers in hand, hastily quitted their prison and rushed forward where the noise was most clamorous. They perceived that the train was attacked by a band of Sioux. It was not the first attempt of these daring Indians, for more than once they had waylaid trains on the road. A hundred of them had, according to their own habit, jumped upon the steps without stopping the train, with the ease of a clown mounting the horse at full gallop. The Sioux were armed with guns, from which came the reports, to which the passengers, who were almost all armed, respond by revolver shots. 
The Indians had first mounted the engine and half stunned the engineer and stoker with blows from their muskets. A Sioux chief, wishing to stop the train but not knowing how to work the regulator, had opened wide instead of closing the stem valve, and the locomotive was plunging forward with terrific velocity. The Sioux had the same time invaded the cars, skipping like enraged monkeys over the roof, thrusting open doors and fighting hand to hand with the passengers. Penetrating the baggage car, they pillaged it, throwing the trunks out of the train. The cries and shots were constant. The travelers defended themselves bravely. Some of the cars were barricaded and sustained a siege, like moving forts carried along at a speed of a hundred miles an hour. Euda behaved courageously from the first. She defended herself like a true heroine with a revolver, which she shot through the broken windows whenever a savage made his appearance. Twenty Sioux had fallen mortally wounded to the ground, and the wheels crushed those who fell upon the rails as if they had been worms. Several passengers shot or stunned lay on the seats. It was necessary to put an end to the struggle which had lasted for ten minutes, and which would result in the triumph of the Sioux if the train was not stopped. Fort Kearney's station, where there was a garrison, was only two miles distant, but that once passed, the Sioux would be masters of the train between Fort Kearney and the station beyond. The conductor was fighting beside Mr. Fogg when he was shot and fell. At the same moment he cried, "'Unless this train is stopped in five minutes, we are lost.' "'It shall be stopped,' said Phileas Fogg, preparing to rush from the car. "'Stay, monsieur,' cried Passepartout. "'I will go.' Mr. Fogg had not time to stop the brave fellow, who, opening a door unperceived by the Indians, succeeded in slipping under the car, and while the struggle continued and the balls whizzed across each other over his head, he made use of his old acrobatic experience, and with amazing agility worked his way under the cars, holding on to the chains, aiding himself by the brakes and the edges of the sashes, creeping from one car to another with marvelous skill, and thus gaining the forward end of the train. There, suspended by one hand between the baggage car and the tender, with the other he loosed the safety chains, but, owing to the traction, he would never have succeeded in unscrewing the yoking bar, had not a violent concussion jolted this bar out. The train, now detached from the engine, remained a little behind, whilst the locomotive rushed forward with increased speed. Carried on by the force already acquired, the train still moved for several minutes, but the brakes were worked and at last they stopped, less than a hundred feet from Kearney Station. The soldiers of the fort, attracted by the shots, hurried up. The Sioux had not expected them, and decamped in a body before the train entirely stopped. But the passengers counted each other on the station platform. Several were found missing, among others the courageous Frenchman whose devotion had just saved them. End of chapter 29. Read by David Russell. For Lit to Go. Available on the web at fcit.usf.edu. Around the World in Eighty Days, by Jules Verne, Chapter 30, in which Phileas Fogg simply does his duty. Three passengers, including Passepartout, had disappeared. Had they been killed in the struggle? Were they taken prisoners by the Sioux? It was impossible to tell. There were many wounded, but none mortally. Colonel Proctor was one of the most seriously hurt. He had fought bravely, and a ball had entered his groin. He was carried into the station with the other wounded passengers to receive such attention as could be of avail. Aouda was safe, and Phileas Fogg, who had been in the thickest of the fight, had not received a scratch. Fix was slightly wounded in the arm, but Passepartout was not to be found, and tears coursed down Aouda's cheeks. All the passengers had gotten out of the train, the wheels of which were stained with the blood. From the tires and spokes hung ragged pieces of flesh. As far as the eye could reach on the white plain, behind red trails were visible. The last Sioux were disappearing in the south, along the banks of the Republican River. Mr. Fogg, with folded arms, remained motionless. He had a serious decision to make. Aouda, standing near him, looked at him without speaking, and he understood her look. If his servant was a prisoner, ought he not to risk everything to rescue him from the Indians? I will find him, living or dead, he said quietly to Aouda. Ah, Mr. Mr. Fogg, she cried, clasping his hands and covering them with tears. Phileas Fogg, by this resolution, inevitably sacrificed himself. He pronounced his own doom. The delay of a single day would make him lose the steamer at New York, and his bet would be certainly lost. But as he thought, it is my duty, he did not hesitate. The commanding officer of Fort Kearney was there. A hundred of his soldiers had placed themselves in a position to defend the station, should the Sioux attack it. Sir, said Mr. Fogg to the captain, three passengers have disappeared. Dead? asked the captain. Dead or prisoners? That is the uncertainty which must be solved. Do you propose to pursue the Sioux? "'That's a serious thing to do, sir,' returned the captain. "'These Indians may retreat beyond Arkansas, and I cannot leave the fort unprotected.' "'The lives of three men are in question, sir,' said Phileas Fogg. "'Doubtless, but I can risk the lives of fifty men to save three. "'I don't know whether you can, sir, but you ought to do so.' "'Nobody here,' returned the other, "'has a right to teach me my duty.' 
"'Very well,' said Mr. Fogg coldly. "'I will go alone.' "'You, sir,' cried Fix, coming up, "'you go alone in pursuit of the Indians? "'Would you have me leave this poor fellow to perish? "'Him who every one in this present owns his life. "'I shall go.' "'No, sir, you shall not go alone,' cried the captain, "'touched in spite of himself. "'No, you are a brave man. Thirty volunteers,' he added, turning to the soldiers. "'The whole company started forward at once. "'The captain had only to pick his men. Thirty were chosen, and an old sergeant placed at their head. "'Thanks, captain,' said Mr. Fogg. "'Will you let me go with you?' asked Fix.' "'Do as you please, sir, but if you wish to do me a favor, you will remain with Aouda, in case anything should happen to me.' A sudden pallor overspread the detective's face. Separate himself from the man who he had so persistently followed step by step. Leave him to wander about the desert? Fix gazed attentively at Mr. Fogg, and despite his suspicions and the struggle which was going on within him, he lowered his eyes before that calm and frank look. "'I will stay,' said he. A few minutes after, Mr. Fogg pressed in the young woman's hand, and having confided to her his precious carpet-bag, went off with the sergeant and his little squad. But before going he had said to the soldiers, "'My friends, I will divide five thousands among you if we save the prisoners.' It was then a little past noon. Ayuda retired to a waiting-room, and there she waited alone, thinking of the simple and noble generosity, the tranquil courage of Phileas Fogg. He had sacrificed his fortune and was now risking his life, all without hesitation from duty, in silence. Fix did not have the same thoughts, and could scarcely conceal his agitation. He walked feverishly up and down the platform, but soon resumed his outward composure. He now saw the folly of which he had been guilty in letting Fogg go alone. What? This man who he had just followed around the world was permitted now to separate himself from him? He began to accuse and abuse himself, as if he were the director of police, admitted to himself a sound lecture for his greenness. I have been an idiot, he thought, and this man will see it. He has gone, and he won't come back. But that is how I, Fix, who have in my pocket a warrant for his arrest, have been so fascinated by him. Decidedly, I am nothing but an ass. So reasoned the detective, while the hours crept by all too slowly. He did not know what to do. Sometimes he was... "'tempted to tell Aoudis all, "'but he could not doubt "'how the young woman would receive his confidences. "'What course should he take? "'He thought of pursuing fog "'across the vast white plains. "'It did not seem impossible "'that he might overtake him. "'Footsteps were easily printed on the snow, "'but soon under a new sheet "'every impet would be effaced. "'Fix became discouraged. "'He felt a sort of insurmountable longing "'to abandon the game altogether. "'He could now lead Ford Kearney Station "'and pursue his journey homeward in peace.' Towards two o'clock in the afternoon, while it was snowing hard, long whistles were heard approaching from the east. A great shadow, preceded by a wild light, slowly advanced, appearing still larger through the mist, which gave it a fantastic aspect. No train was expected from the east, neither had there been time for the succor asked for by telegraph to arrive. The train from Omaha to San Francisco was not due till the next day. The mystery was soon explained. The locomotive, which was slowly approaching with deafening whistles, was that which, having been detached from the train, had continued its route with such terrific rapidity, carrying off the unconscious engineer and stoker, it had run several miles. When the fire became low for want of fuel, the steam had slackened, and it nearly stopped an hour after, some twenty miles beyond Fort Kearney. Neither the engineer or the stoker was dead, and after remaining for some time in their swoon, had come to themselves. The train had then stopped. The engineer, when he had found himself in the desert in the locomotive without cars, understood what had happened. He could not imagine how the locomotive had become separated from the train, but he did not doubt that the train left behind was in distress. He did not hesitate what to do. It would be prudent to continue on to Omaha, for it would be dangerous to return to the train, which the Indians might still be engaged in pillaging. Nevertheless, he began to rebuild the fire in the furnace, and the pressure again mounted, and the locomotive returned, running backwards to Fort Kearney. This was what was whistling in the mist. The travelers were glad to see the locomotive resume its place at the head of the train. They could now continue the journey so terribly interrupted. Aouda, on seeing the locomotive come up, hurried out of the station and asked the conductor, "'Are you going to start?' "'At once, madam.' "'But the prisoners, our unfortunate fellow travelers, I cannot interrupt the trip,' replied the conductor. "'We are already three hours behind the time. "'And when will another train pass here from San Francisco?' "'Tomorrow evening, madam. "'Tomorrow evening? "'But then it will be too late. "'We must wait.' "'It is impossible,' responded the conductor. "'If you wish to go, please get in.' "'I will not go,' said Aouda. Fix had heard this conversation a little while before. When there was no prospect of proceeding on the journey, he had made it up his mind to leave Fort Kearney. But now that the train was there, ready to start, he had only to take his seat in the car. An irresistible influence held him back. The station platform burned his feet, and he could not stir. The conflict in his mind began again. Anger, failure stifled him. He wished to struggle on to an end. Meanwhile, the passengers and some of the wounded, among them Colonel Proctor, whose injuries were serious, had taken their places in the train. 
The buzzing of the overheated boiler was heard, and the steam was escaping from the valves. The engineer whistled. The train started and soon disappeared, mingling its white smoke with the eddies of the densely falling snow. The detective had remained behind. Several hours passed. The weather was dismal and it was very cold. Fick sat motionless on a bench in the station. He might have been thought asleep. Ayuda, despite the storm, kept coming out of the waiting room, going to the end of the platform and peering through the tempest of snow, as if to pierce the mist which narrowed the horizon around her, and to hear, if possible, some welcome sound. She heard and saw nothing. Then she would return, chilled through to Isha out again after the lapse of a few moments, but always in vain. Evening came, and the little band had not returned. Where could they be? Had they found the Indians and were having a conflict with them, or were they still wandering amid the mist? The commander of the fort was anxious, though he tried to conceal his apprehensions. As night approached, the snow fell less plentifully, but it came intensely cold. Absolute silence rested on the plains. Neither flight of bird nor passing of beast troubled the perfect calm. Throughout the night, Aouda, full of sad forebodings, her heart stifled with anguish, wandered about on the verge of the plains. Her imagination carried her far off and showed her innumerable dangers. What she suffered through the long hours, it would be impossible to describe. Fix remained stationary in the same place, but did not sleep. Once a man approached and spoke to him, the detective merely replied by shaking his head. Thus the night passed. At dawn, the half-extinguished disk of the sun rose above the misty horizon, but it was now possible to recognize objects two miles off. Phileas Fogg and his squad had gone southward. In the south was all still vacancy. It was then seven o'clock. The captain, who was really alarmed, did not know what course to take. Should he send another detachment to the rescue of the first? Should he sacrifice more men, with so few chances of saving those already sacrificed? His hesitation did not last long, however. Calling one of his lieutenants, he was on the point of ordering a reconnaissance when gunshots were heard. Was it a signal? The soldiers rushed out of the fort, and a half mile off they perceived a little band returning in good order. Mr. Fogg was marching at their head, and just behind him were Passepartout and the two other travelers rescued from the Sioux. They had met and fought the Indians ten miles south of Fort Kearney. Shortly before the detachment arrived, Passepartout and his companions had begun to struggle with their captors, three of whom the Frenchman had felled with his fists when his master and the soldiers hastened up to their relief. All were welcomed with joyful cries. Phileas Fogg distributed the reward he had promised to the soldiers, while Passepartout, not without reason, muttered to himself, "'It must certainly be confessed that I cost my master dear.' Fix, without saying a word, looked at Mr. Fogg, and it would have been difficult to analyze the thoughts which struggled within him. As for Aouda, she shook her protector's hand and pressed it in her own, too much moved to speak. Meanwhile, Passepartout was looking about for the train. He thought he should find it there, ready to start for Omaha, and hoped that at the time lost might be regained. "'The train, the train!' cried he. "'Gone,' replied Fix. "'And when does the next train pass here?' said Phileas Fogg. "'Not till this evening. Ah!' returned the impassable gentleman quietly. End of chapter 30 Read by David Russell. For Lit to Go. Available on the web at fcit.usf.edu. Around the World in 80 Days. By Jules Verne. Chapter 31. In which Fix, the detective, considerably furthers the interests of Phileas Fogg. Phileas Fogg found himself twenty hours behind the time. Passepartout, the involuntary cause of this delay, was desperate. He had ruined his master. At this moment the detective approached Mr. Fogg, and, looking him intently in the face, said, "'Seriously, sir, are you in great haste?' "'Quite seriously.' "'I have a purpose in asking,' resumed Fix. "'Is it absolutely necessary that you should be in New York on the 11th before nine o'clock in the evening, the time the steamer leaves for Liverpool?' "'It is absolutely necessary. And if your journey had not been interrupted by these Indians, you would have reached New York on the morning of the 11th. Yes, with eleven hours to spare before the steamer left. Good. You are therefore twenty hours behind. Twelve from twenty leaves eight. You must regain eight hours. Do you wish to try and do so? On foot? Asked Mr. Fogg. No, on a sledge, replied Fix. On a sledge with sails. A man has proposed such a method to me. It was the man who had spoken to Fix during the night, and whose offer he had refused. Phileas Fogg did not reply at once, but Fix, having pointed out the man who was walking up and down the front of the station, Mr. Fogg went up to him. An instant after, Mr. Fogg and the American, whose name was Mudge, entered a hut built just below the fort. There Mr. Fogg examined a curious vehicle, a kind of frame on two long beams, a little raised in front like the runners of a sledge, and upon which was room for four, five, or six passengers. 
A high mast was fixed on the frame, held firmly by metallic lashings, to which was attached a large brigantine sail. This mast held an iron stay upon which to hoist a jib sail. Behind, a sort of rudder served to guide the vehicle. It was, in short, a sledge rigged like a sloop. During the winter, when the trains are blocked up by snow, these sledges make extremely rapid journeys across the frozen plains from one station to another. Provided with more sails than a cutter, and with the wind behind them, they slip over the surface of the prairies with a speed equal to, if not superior to that of express trains. Mr. Fogg readily made a bargain with the owner of this landcraft, and the wind was favorable. Being fresh and blowing from the west, the snow had hardened, and Mudge was very confident about being able to transport Mr. Fogg in a few hours to Omaha. Thence the trains eastward run frequently to Chicago and New York. It was not impossible that the lost time might yet be recovered, and such an opportunity was not to be rejected. Not wishing to expose Aouda to this comforts of travelling in open air, Mr. Fogg proposed to leave her with Passporteau at Fort Kearney, the servant taking upon himself to escort her to Europe by a better route and under a more favourable condition. But Aouda refused to separate from Mr. Fogg, and Passepartout was delighted with her decision, for nothing could induce him to leave his master while Fix was with him. It would be difficult to guess the detective's thoughts. Was this conviction shaken by Phileas Fogg's return, or did he still regard him as an exceedingly shrewd rascal, who, his journey round the world completed, would think himself absolutely safe in England? Perhaps Fix's opinion of Phileas Fogg was somewhat modified, but he was nevertheless resolved to do his duty, and to hasten the return of the whole party to England as much as possible. At eight o'clock the sledge was ready to start. The passengers took their places on it and wrapped themselves up closely in their travelling cloaks. The two great sails were hoisted, and under the pressure of the wind the sledge slid over the hardened slow with a velocity of forty miles an hour. The distance between Fort Kearney and Omaha, as the birds fly, is at most two hundred miles. If the wind held good, the distance might be traversed in five hours. If no accident happened, the sledge might reach Omaha by one o'clock. What a journey! The travellers, huddled close together, could not speak for the cold, intensified by the rapidity at which they were going. The sledge sped on as lightly as a boat over the waves. When the breeze came skimming the earth, the sledge seemed to be lifted off the ground by its sails. Mudge, who was at the rudder, kept a straight line and by a turn of his hand checked the lurches which the vehicle has a tendency to make. All the sails were up, and the jib was so arranged not to screen the brigantine. A topmast was hoisted, and another jib held out the wind, added to its force the other sails. Although the speed could not be exactly estimated, the sledge could not be going less than forty miles an hour. If nothing breaks, said Mudge, we shall get there. Mr. Fogg had made it for Mudge's interest to reach Omaha within the time agreed on by the offer of a handsome reward. The prairie across which the sledge was moving in a straight line was as flat as the sea. It seemed like a vast frozen lake. The railroad, which ran through this section, ascended from the southwest to the northwest by Great Island Columbus, an important Nebraska town, Schuyler and Fremont to Omaha. It followed throughout the right bank of the Platte River. The sledge, shortening this route, took a cord of the arc described by the railway. Mudge was not afraid of being stopped by the Platte River, because it was frozen. The road, then, was quite clear of obstacles— and Phileas Fogg had but two things to fear, an accident to the sledge, and a change or calm in the wind. But the breeze, far from lessening its force, blew as if to bend the mast, which, however, the metallic lashings had firmly. These lashings, like the cords of a stringed instrument, resounded as if vibrated by a violin bow. The sledge slid along in the midst of a plaintively intense melody. "'These cords give the fifth in the octave,' said Mr. Fogg. These were the only words he uttered during the journey. Aouda, cosily packed in furs and cokes, was sheltered as much as possible from the attacks of the freezing wind. As for Passepartout, his face was as red as the sun disks when it sets in the mist, and he laboriously inhaled the biting air. With his natural buoyancy of spirits, he began to hope again. They would reach New York on the evening, if not the morning of the 11th, and there were still some chances that it would be before the steamer sailed for Liverpool. Passepartout even felt the strong desire to grasp his ally Fix by the hand. He remembered that it was the detective who procured the sledge, the only means of reaching Omaha in time. But checked by some presentiment, he kept his usual reserve. One thing, however, Passepartout would never forget was that the sacrifice which Mr. Fogg had made, without hesitation, to rescue him from the Sioux. Mr. Fogg had risked his fortune and his life. No, his servant would never forget that. While each of the party was absorbed in reflection so different, the sledge flew past over the vast carpet of snow. The creeks it passed over were not perceived. Fields and streams disappeared under the uniform whiteness. The plain was absolutely deserted. Between the Union Pacific Road and the branch which unites Kearney with St. Joseph, it formed a great uninhabited island. 
Neither village station nor fort appeared. From time to time they sped by some phantom-like tree, whose white skeleton twisted and rattled in the wind. Sometimes flocks of wild birds rose, or bands of gaunt, famished, ferocious prairie wolves ran howling after the sledge. Passepartout, revolver in hand, held himself ready to fire on those which came too near. Had an accident then happened to the sledge, the travellers attacked by these beasts would have been in the most terrible danger. But it held on its even course and soon gained on the wolves, and ere long left the howling band a safe distance behind. About noon, Mudge perceived by certain landmarks that he was crossing the Plate River. He said nothing, but he felt certain that he was now within twenty miles of Omaha. In less than an hour, he left the rudder and furled his sails, whilst the sledge, carried forward by the great impetuous the wind had given it, went on half a mile further with its sails and spread. It stopped at last, and Mudge, pointing to a mass of roofs white with snow, said, "'We have got there.' Arrived, arrived at the station, which is in daily communication by numerous trains with the Atlantic seaboard, Passepartout and Fix jumped off, stretched their stiffened limbs, and aided Mr. Fogg and the young woman to descend from the sledge. Phileas Fogg generously rewarded Mudge, whose hand Passepartout warmly grasped, and the party directed their steps to the Omaha Railway Station. The Pacific Railroad proper finds its terminus at this important Nebraska town— Omaha is connected with Chicago by the Chicago and Rock Island Railroad, which runs directly east and passes 50 stations. A train was ready to start when Mr. Fogg and his party reached the station, and they only had time to get into the cars. They had seen nothing of Omaha, but Passepartout confessed to himself that this was not to be regretted, as they were not traveling to see the sights. The train passed rapidly across the state of Iowa by Council Bluffs, Des Moines, and Iowa City. During the night it crossed the Mississippi at Davenport, and by Rock Island entered Illinois. The next day, which was the 10th, at four o'clock in the evening, it reached Chicago, already risen from its ruins, and more proudly seated than ever on the borders of its beautiful Lake Michigan. Nine hundred miles separated Chicago from New York, but trains were not wanting at Chicago. Mr. Fogg passed at once from one to the other, and the locomotive of the Pittsburgh, Fort Wayne and Chicago Railway, left at full speed, as if it fully comprehended that the gentleman had no time to lose. It traversed Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and the New Jersey like a flash, rushing through towns with antique names, some of which had streets and car tracks, but yet no houses. At last the Hudson came into view, and at a quarter past eleven in the evening of the eleventh, the train stopped in the station on the right bank of the river, before the very pier of the Cunard Line. The China, for Liverpool, had started three quarters of an hour before. End of chapter 31 Read by David Russell For Lit to Go Available on the web at fcit.usf.edu. Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne Chapter 32 In which Phileas Fogg engages in a direct struggle with the bad fortune. The China, in leaving, seemed to have carried off Phileas Fogg's last hope, and none of the other steamers were able to serve his projects. The Perrier of the French Transatlantic Company, whose admirable steamers are equal to in any speed and comfort, did not leave until the 14th. The Hamburg boats did not go directly to Liverpool or London, but to Havre, and the additional trip from Favre to Southampton would render Phileas Fogg's last efforts of no avail. The Inman steamer did not impart until the next day, and could not cross Atlantic in time to save the wager. Mr. Fogg learned all this in consulting his Bradshaw, which gave him the daily movements of the transatlantic steamers. Passepartout was crushed. It overwhelmed him to lose the boat by three-quarters of an hour. It was his fault, for, instead of helping his master, he had not ceased putting obstacles in his path. And when he recalled all the incidents of the tour, when he counted up the sums expended in pure loss, and on his own account when he thought that the immense stake, added to the heavy charges of this useless journey, would completely ruin Mr. Fogg, he overwhelmed himself with bitter self-accusations. Mr. Fogg, however, did not reproach him, and, on leaving the Cunyard Pier, only said, "'We will consult about what is best tomorrow. Come.' The party crossed the Hudson in the Jersey City ferryboat, and drove in a carriage to the St. Nicholas Hotel, on Broadway. Rooms were engaged, and the night passed briefly to Phileas Fogg, who slept profoundly, but very long to Aedo and the others, whose agitation did not permit them to rest.' The next day was the 12th of December. From seven in the morning to the 12th of the quarter of the nine before evening of the 21st were nine days, thirteen hours, and forty-five minutes. If Phileas Fogg had left in the China, one of the fastest steamers on the Atlantic, he would have reached Liverpool and then London within the period agreed upon. Mr. Fogg left the hotel alone. After giving Passepartout instructions to wait his return and inform Aedo to be ready in an instant's notice, he proceeded to the banks of the Hudson and looked out amongst the vessels moored or anchored in the river. 
for any that were about to depart. Several had departure signals, and were preparing to put the sea at morning tide. For this immense and admirable port, there is not one day that a hundred vessels do not set out for every quarter of the globe, but they were mostly sailing vessels, of which, of course, Phileas Fogg could make no use. He seemed to about to give up hope, when he espied, anchored at the battery, a cable's length off at most, a trading vessel with a screw, well-shaped, whose funnel, puffing a cloud of smoke, indicated she was getting ready for departure. Phileas Fogg hailed the boat, got into it, and soon found himself on board the Henrietta, iron-hauled, wood-built from above. He ascended to the deck, and asked for the captain, who forthwith presented himself. He was a man of fifty, a sort of sea-wolf, with big eyes, a complexion of oxidized copper, red hair, and a thick neck, and a growling voice. "'The captain,' asked Mr. Fogg. "'I am the captain. I am Phileas Fogg of London, and I am Andrew Speedy of Cardiff. You are going to put out to sea? In an hour. You are bound for Bordeaux.' "'And your cargo? No freight, going in ballast. "'Have you any passengers? No passengers. "'Never have passengers. Too much in the way. "'Is your vessel a swift one? "'Between eleven and twelve knots, the Henrietta. Well known. "'Will you carry me and three other persons to Liverpool? "'To Liverpool? Why not to China?' "'I said Liverpool. No. No. "'I am sitting out for Bordeaux, and I shall go to Bordeaux. "'Money is no object? None.' "'The captain spoke in a tone which did not admit of a reply.' "'But the owners of the Henrietta,' resumed Phileas Fogg. "'The owners are myself,' replied the captain. "'The vessel belongs to me. "'I will freight it for you. "'No. "'I will buy it off you. "'No.' "'Phileas Fogg did not betray the least disappointment, "'but the situation was a grave one. "'It was not at New York as at Hong Kong, "'nor with the captain of the Henrietta "'as well with the captain of the Tankadier. "'Up to this time money had smoothed away every obstacle. "'Now money failed. Still, some means must be found across the Atlantic on a boat, unless by a balloon, which would have been venturesome, besides not being capable of being put into practice. It seemed that Phileas Fogg had an idea, for he said to the captain, Will you carry me to Bordeaux? Not if you paid me two hundred dollars. I offer you two thousand. A piece? A piece. And there are four of you? Four. Captain Speedy began to scratch his head. There were eight thousand dollars to gain without changing his route for which it was well worth conquering the repugnance he had for all kinds of passengers. Besides, passengers at two thousand dollars are no longer passengers, but valuable merchandise. I'd start at nine o'clock, said Captain Seedy simply. Are you and your party ready? We shall be on board at nine o'clock, replied no less simply Mr. Fogg. It was half-past eight. To disembark from the Henrietta, jump into a hack, hurry to the St. Nicholas, and return with Aouda Passepartout, and even the inseparable fix was the work of a brief time, and was performed by Mr. Fogg with the coolness which never abandoned him. They were on board when the Henrietta made ready to weigh anchor. When Passepartout heard what this last voyage was going to cost, he uttered a prolonged O, oh, which extended throughout his vocal gamut. As for Fix, he said to himself that the Bank of England would certainly not come out of this affair well indemnified. When they reached England, even if Mr. Fogg did not throw some handfuls of bank bills into the sea, more than seven thousand pounds would have been spent. End of chapter 32. Read by David Russell. For Lit to Go. Available on the web at fcit.usf.edu. Around the World in Eighty Days. By Jules Verne. Chapter 33 in which Phileas Fogg shows himself equal to the occasion. An hour after, the Henrietta passed the lighthouse which marks the entrance of the Hudson, turned the point of Sandy Hook and put to sea. During the day she skirted Long Island, passed Fire Island, and directed her course rapidly eastward. At noon the next day a man mounted the bridge to ascertain the vessel's position. It might be thought that this was Captain Seedy. Not the least in the world, it was Phileas Fogg, Esquire. As for Captain Seedy, he was shut up in his cabin under lock and key, and was uttering loud cries, which signified an anger at once pardonable and excessive. What had happened was very simple. Phileas Fogg wished to go to Liverpool, but the captain would not carry him there. Then Phileas Fogg had taken passage for Bordeaux, and, during the thirty hours he had been on board, had so shrewdly managed with his banknotes that the sailors and stokers, who were only an occasional crew and were not on the best terms with the captain, went over to him in a body. This was why Phileas Fogg was in command instead of Captain Seedy, why the captain was a prisoner in his cabin, and why, in short, the Henrietta was directing her course towards Liverpool. It was very clear to see Mr. Fogg manage the craft that he had been a sailor. How the adventure ended would still be seen anon. Ayuda was anxious, though she said nothing. As for Passepartout, he thought Mr. Fogg's maneuver simply glorious. The captain had said, between eleven and twelve knots, and the Henrietta confirmed his prediction. 
If, then, there were ifs, still, the sea did not become too boisterous. If the wind did not veer round to the east, if no accident happened to the boat or its machinery, the Henrietta might cross the three thousand miles from New York to Liverpool in the nine days between the 12th and 21st of December. It is true that, once arrived, the affair on board the Henrietta, added to that of the Bank of England, might create more difficulties for Mr. Fogg than he imagined or could desire. During the first days they went along smoothly enough. The sea was not very improprietous. The wind seemed stationary in the northeast, the sails were hoisted, and the Henrietta ploughed across the waves like a real transatlantic steamer. Passepartout was delighted. His master's last exploit, the consequences of which he ignored, enchanted him. Never had the crew seen so jolly and dexterous a fellow. He had formed warm friendships with the sailors, and amazed him with his acrobatic feats. Although they managed the vessel like gentlemen, and the stokers filed up like heroes, his loquacious good humor infected everyone. He had forgotten the past, its vexations and delays. He only thought of the end, so nearly accomplished, and sometimes he boiled over with impatience, as if heated by the furnaces of the Henrietta. Often, also, the worthy fellow revolved around Fix, looking at him with a keen, distrustful eye. But he did not speak to him, for their old intimacy no longer existed. Fix, it must be confessed, understood nothing of what was going on, the conquest of the Henrietta, the bribery of the crew. Fogg managing the boat like a skilled seaman amazed and confused him. He did not know what to think, for, after all, a man who began by stealing fifty-five thousand pounds might end by stealing a vessel. And Fix was not so unnaturally inclined to conclude that the Henrietta, under Fogg's command, was not going to Liverpool at all, which is some part of the world where the robber, turned a pirate, would quietly put himself in safety. The conjecture was at least a plausible one, and the detective began to seriously regret that he had embarked on the affair. As for Captain Seedy, he continued to howl and growl in his cabin, and Passepartout, whose duty it was to carry him his meals, courageous as he was, took the greatest precautions. Mr. Fogg did not even know that there was a captain on board. On the 13th, they passed the edge of the banks of Newfoundland, a dangerous locality. During the winter, especially, there are frequent fogs and heavy gales of wind. Ever since the evening before, the barometer suddenly falling had indicated an approaching change in the atmosphere. And during the night, the temperature varied. The cold became sharper, and the wind veered to the southeast. This was a misfortune. Mr. Fogg, in order not to deviate from his course, furled his sails and increased the force of the steam. But the vessel's speed slackened, owing to the state of the sea. The long waves of which broke against the stern, she pitched violently, and this retarded her progress. The breeze little by little swelled into a tempest, and it was to be feared that the Henrietta might not be able to maintain herself upright on the waves. Passepartout's visage darkened with the skies, and for two days the poor fellow experienced constant fright. But Phileas Fogg was a bold mariner, and knew how to maintain headway against the sea, and he kept on his course. Without even decreasing his steam, the Henrietta, when she could not rise upon the waves, crossed them, swamping her deck, but passing safely. Sometimes the screw rose out of the water, beating its protruding end, when a mountain of water raised the stern above the waves, but the craft always kept straight ahead. The wind, however, did not grow as boisterous as might have been feared. It was not one of those tempests which burst and rush on with the speed of ninety miles an hour. It continued fresh, but unhappily it remained abstainly in the southeast, rendering the sails useless. The 16th of December was the 75th day since Phileas Fogg's departure from London, and the Henrietta had not been seriously delayed. Half of the voyage was almost accomplished, and the worst localities had been passed. In summer, success would have been well nigh as certain. In winter, they were at the mercy of the bad season. Passepartout said nothing, but he cherished hope in secret, and comforted himself with the reflection that, if the wind failed him, they might still count on the steam. On this day the engineer came on deck, went up to Mr. Fogg, and began to speak earnestly with him. Without knowing why it was a presentiment, perhaps Passepartout became vaguely uneasy. He would have given one of his ears to hear with the other what the engineer was saying. He finally managed to catch a few words, and he was sure he heard his master say, "'You are certain of what you tell me?' "'Certain, sir,' replied the engineer. "'You must remember that, since we started, we have kept up hot fires in all our furnaces, and though we had coal enough to get on short steam to New York to Bordeaux, we haven't enough to go with all steam to New York to Liverpool.' "'I would consider,' replied Mr. Fogg. Passepartout understood it all. He was seized with moral anxiety. The coal was giving out. "'Ah, if my master can get over that,' muttered he, "'he'll be a famous man.' He could not help in parting to fix what he had overheard. "'Then you believe we are really going to Liverpool, of course?' "'Ass!' replied the detective, shrugging his shoulders and turning on his heel. 
Passepartout was on the point of vigorously resenting the epithet, the reason of which he could not for the life of him comprehend, but he reflected that the fortunate fix was probably disappointed and humiliated in his self-esteem, after so awkwardly followed a false scent around the world and refrained. And now what course could Phileas Fogg adopt? It was difficult to imagine. Nevertheless, he seemed to have decided upon one, for that evening he sent for the engineer, and he said to him, "'Feed all the fires until the cold is exhausted.' A few moments later, the funnel of the Henrietta vomited forth torrents of smoke, and the vessel continued to proceed with all steam on. But on the 18th, the engineer, as he had predicted, announced that the coal would give out in the course of the day. "'Do not let the fires go down,' replied Mr. Fogg. "'Keep them up to the last. Let the valves be filled.' Towards noon, Phileas Fogg, having ascertained the position, called Passepartout, and ordered him to go for Captain Seedy. It was as if the honest fellow had been commanded to unchain a tiger. He went to the poop saying to himself he would be like a madman. In a few moments, with cries and oaths, a bomb appeared on the poop deck. The bomb was Captain Seedy. It was clear that he was on the point of bursting. "'Where are we?' were the first words his anger permitted him to utter. He had a poor man to be an apologetic. He would have never recovered from his paroxysm of wrath. "'Where are we?' he repeated with purple face. Seven hundred and seven miles from Liverpool,' replied Mr. Fogg with importunable calmness. "'Pirate!' cried Captain Seedy. "'I have sent for you, Pecaroon, sir,' continued Mr. Fogg, "'to ask you to sell me your vessel. "'No, by all the devils, no. "'But I shall be obliged to burn her. "'Burn the Henrietta, yes, at least the upper part of her. "'The coal has given out.' "'Burn my vessel,' cried Captain Seedy, "'who could scarcely pronounce the words, "'A vessel worth fifty thousand dollars?' "'Here are sixty thousand, replied Phileas Fogg, "'handing the captain a roll of bank bills. "'This had a prodigious effect on Andrew Speedy. "'An American can scarcely remain unmoved "'at the sight of sixty thousand dollars. "'The captain forgot in an instant his anger, "'his imprisonment, and all his grudges against the passenger. "'The Henrietta was twenty years old. "'It was a great bargain. "'The bomb would not go off after all. "'Mr. Fogg had taken away the match.' "'And shall I still have the iron hall?' said the captain in a softer tone. "'The iron hall and the engine. Is it agreed?' "'Agreed. And Andrew Speedy, seizing the banknotes, counted them and consigned them to his pocket. During this colloquy, Passepartout was as white as a sheet, and Fix seemed on the point of having an epileptic fit. Nearly twenty thousand pounds had been expended, and Fogg left the hall and engine to the captain, that is, near the whole value of the craft. It was true, however, that fifty-five thousand pounds had been stolen from the bank.' When Andrew Speedy had pocketed the money, Mr. Fogg had said to him, "'Don't let this astonish you, sir, but you must know that I shall lose twenty thousand pounds unless I arrive in London by a quarter before nine on the evening of the twenty-first of December. I missed the steamer at New York, and you refused to take me to Liverpool.' "'And I did well,' replied Andrew Speedy. "'For I have gained at least forty thousand dollars by it,' he added more sedately. "'Do you know one thing, Captain Fogg? Captain Fogg, you've got something of the Yankee about you.' And, having paid his passenger what he considered a high compliment, he was going away when Mr. Fogg said, "'The vessel now belongs to me.' "'Certainly. From the keel to the truck of the masts, all the wood, that is. "'Very well. Have the interior seats, bunks, and frames pulled down, and burn them. "'It was necessary to have dry wood to keep the steam up to adequate pressure, "'and on the next day the poop cabins, bunks, and spare deck were sacrificed.' On the next day after that, on the 19th of December, the masts, rafts, and spars were burned. The crew worked lustily, keeping up the fires. Passepartout hewed, cut, and sawed away with all his might. There was a perfect rage for demolition. The railings, fittings, the greater part of the deck, and the top sides disappeared on the 20th, and the Henrietta was now only a flat hulk. But on this day they sighted the Irish coast and fastnet light. By ten in the evening they were passing Queenstown. Phileas Fogg had only twenty-four hours more into which to get to London. That length of time was necessary to reach Liverpool, with all steam on, and the steam was about to give out altogether. Sir, said Captain Speedy, who was now deeply interested in Mr. Fogg's project, I really commiserate you. Everything is against you. We are only opposite Queenstown. Ah, said Mr. Fogg, is that place where we might see the lights Queenstown? Yes. Can we enter the harbour? Not under three hours, only at high tide. "'Stay,' replied Mr. Fogg calmly, without betraying his features that by a supreme inspiration he was about to attempt once more to conquer ill fortune. "'Queenstown is the Irish port at which the transatlantic steamers stop to put off the mails. "'These mails are carried to Dublin by express trains, always held in readiness to start. "'From Dublin they are sent to Liverpool by the most rapid boats, and thus gain twelve hours on the Atlantic steamers.' 
Phileas Fogg counted on gaining twelve hours in the same way. Instead of arriving at Liverpool the next evening by the Henrietta, he would be there by noon, and would therefore have time to reach London before a quarter of nine in the evening. The Henrietta entered Queenstown Harbour at one o'clock in the morning. It then being high tide, and Phileas Fogg, after being grasped heartily by the hand by Captain Seedy, left that gentleman on the level hulk of his craft, which was still worth half of what he had sold it for. The party went on shore at once. Fix was greatly tempted to arrest Mr. Fogg on the spot, but he did not. Why? What struggle was going on within him? Had he changed in his mind about this man? Did he understand that he had made a grave mistake? He did not, however, abandon Mr. Fogg. They all got upon the train, which was just ready to start. At half-past one, at dawn of day, they were in Dublin, and they lost no time in embarking on a steamer, which, disdaining to rise upon the raves, invariably cut through them. Phileas Fogg at last disembarked on the Liverpool quay at twenty minutes before twelve, twenty-first December. He was only six hours distant from London. But at this moment Fix came up and put his hands on Mr. Fogg's shoulder, and showing his warrant said, "'You really are Phileas Fogg. I am. I arrest you in the Queen's name.'" End of chapter 33. Read by David Russell. For Lit to Go. Available on the web at fcit.usf.edu. Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne Chapter 34 In which Phileas Fogg at last reaches London Phileas Fogg was in prison. He had been shut up in the Custom House, and he was to be transferred to London the next day. Passepartout, when he saw his master arrested, would have fallen upon Fix had he not been held back by some policeman. Ayuda was thunderstruck at the suddenness of an event which she could not understand. Passepartout explained to her how it was the honest and courageous Fogg was arrested as a robber. The young woman's heart revolted against so heinous a charge, and when she saw that she could attempt to do nothing to save her protector, she wept bitterly. As for Fix, he had arrested Mr. Fogg because it was his duty, whether Mr. Fogg were guilty or not. The thought then struck Passepartout that he was the cause of his new misfortune. Had he not concealed Fix's errand from his master, when Fix revealed his true character and purpose, why had he not told Mr. Fogg? If the latter had been warned, he would have no doubt given Fix proof of his innocence and satisfied him of his mistake. At least, Fix would not have continued in his journey at the expense and heels of his master, only to arrest him the moment he set foot on English soil. Passepartout wept till he was blind, and felt like blowing his brains out. Aouda had remained, despite the coal under the portico of the Custom House. Neither wished to leave the place. Both were anxious to see Mr. Fogg again. That gentleman was really ruined, and that at the moment when he was about to attain his end, this arrest was fatal. Having arrived at Liverpool at twenty minutes before twelve on the 21st of December, he had till a quarter before nine that evening to reach the Reform Club, that is, nine hours and a quarter. The journey from Liverpool to London was six hours. If anyone, at this moment, had entered the Custom House, he would have found Mr. Fogg seated, motionless, calm, and without apparent anger, upon a wooden bench. He was not, it is true, resigned, but this last blow failed to force him into an outward betrayal of any emotion. Was he being devoured by one of those secret rages, all the more terrible because contained, and which only burst forth with an irresistible force at that last moment? No one could tell. There he sat calmly waiting for what? Did he still cherish hope? Did he still believe now that the door of this prison was closed upon him that he would succeed? However that may have been, Mr. Fogg carefully put his watch upon the table and observed its advancing hands. Not a word escaped his lips, but his look was singularly set and stern. The situation, in any event, was a terrible one, and might have been thus stated. If Phileas Fogg was honest, he was ruined. If he was a knave, he was caught. Did escape occur to him? Did he examine to see if there were any practical outlet from this prison? Did he think of escaping from it? Possibly. For once he walked slowly around the room, but the door was locked, and the window heavily barred with iron rods. He sat down again, and drew his journal from his pocket. On the line where these words were written, 21st December, Saturday, Liverpool, he added, 80th day, 11.40 a.m., and waited. The Custom House clock struck one. Mr. Fogg observed that his watch was two hours too fast. Two hours! Admitting that he was at this moment taking an express train, he could reach London in the Reform Club by a quarter before nine p.m. His forehead slightly wrinkled. At thirty-three minutes past two, he heard a singular noise outside, and then a hasty opening of doors. Passepartout's voice was audible, and immediately after that a fix. Phileas Fogg's eyes brightened for an instant. The door swung open, and he saw Passepartout, Aoudou, and Fix, who hurried towards him. Fix was out of breath. His hair was in disorder, and he could not speak. Sir, he stammered, sir, forgive me, most... 
Unfortunate resemblance. Robber arrested three days ago. You are free. Phileas Fogg was free. He walked to the detective and looked him steadily in the face, and with only the rapid motion he ever made in his life, or which he would ever make, drew back his arms, and with the precision of a machine knocked Fix down. Well hit, cried Passepartout. Pablu, that's what you call a good application of the English fists. Fix, who found himself on the floor, did not utter a word. He had only received his deserts. Mr. Fogg and Aoda and Passepartout left the custom house without delay, got into a cab, and in a few moments descended at the station. Phileas Fogg asked if there was an express train about to leave for London. He was forty minutes past two. The express train had left thirty-five minutes before. Phileas Fogg then ordered a special train. There were several rapid locomotives on hand, but the railway arrangements did not permit a special train to leave until three o'clock. At that hour, Phileas Fogg, having stimulated the engineer by an offer of generous reward, at last set out towards London with Aoda and his faithful servant. It was necessary to make the journey in five hours and a half, and this would have been easy on a clear road throughout, but there were forced delays, and when Mr. Fogg stepped from the train at the terminus, all the clocks in London were striking ten minutes before nine. Having made the tour of the world, he was behindhand five minutes, and had lost the wager. End of chapter 34 Read by David Russell, for lit to go Available on the web at fcit.usf.edu. Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne Chapter 35, in which Phileas Fogg does not have to repeat his orders to Passepartout twice. The dwellers in Seville Row would have been surprised the next day if they had been told that Phileas Fogg had returned home. His doors and windows were still closed. No appearance of change was visible. After leaving the station, Mr. Fogg gave Passepartout instructions to purchase some provisions and quietly went into his domicile. He bore his misfortune with his habitual tranquility, ruined and by the blundering of the detective. After having steadily traversed a long journey, overcome a hundred obstacles, braved many dangers, and still found time to do some good on his way, to fail near the goal by a sudden event which he could not have foreseen, and against which he was unarmed, it was terrible. But a few pounds were left in the large sum he carried with him. There only remained of his fortune twenty thousand pounds deposited at bearings, and this amount he owed to his friends at the Reform Club. So great had he been the expense of his tour that, even had he won, he would have not enriched him, and it is probable that he would not sought enrich himself, being a man who rather laid wagers for honour's sake than for the stake proposed. But this wager totally ruined him. Mr. Fogg's course, however, was fully decided upon. He knew what remained for him to do. A room in the house at Seville Row was set apart for Aouda, who was overwhelmed with grief at her protector's misfortunes. From the words which Mr. Fogg dropped, she saw that he was meditating some serious project. Knowing that Englishmen governed by a fixed idea sometimes resort to the desperate expedient of suicide, Passepartout kept a narrow watch upon his master, though he carefully concealed the appearance of doing so. First of all, the worthy fellow had gone up to his room, and had extinguished the gas burner, which had been burning for eighty days. He had found the letter-box of bill from the gas company, and he thought it more than a time to put a stop to this expense, for which he had been doomed to bear. The night passed, Mr. Fogg went to bed, but did he sleep? Aouda did not once close her eyes. Passepartout watched all night like a faithful dog at his master's door. Mr. Fogg called him in the morning and told him to get Aouda's breakfast and a cup of tea and a chop for himself. He desired Aouda to excuse him from breakfast and dinner, as his time would be absorbed all day in putting his affairs to rights. In the evening he would ask permission to have a few moments' conversation with the young lady. Passepartout, having received his orders, had nothing to do but obey them. He looked at his imperturbable master, and could scarcely bring his mind to leave him. His heart was full and his conscience tortured by remorse, for he accused himself more bitterly than ever of being the cause of this irretrievable disaster. Yes, if he had warned Mr. Fogg and had betrayed fixed projects to him, his master would certainly have not given the detective passage to Liverpool, and then... Passport Ho could hold in no longer. My master, Mr. Fogg, he cried, why do you not curse me? It was my fault that I blame no one, returned Phileas Fogg, with perfect calmness. Go. Passport Ho left the room, and went to find Aouda, whom he delivered his master's message. Madam, he added, I can do nothing myself, nothing. I have no influence over my master. But you, perhaps, what influence could I have, replied Aouda. Mr. Fogg is influenced by no one. Has he ever understood that my gratitude to him is overflowing? "'Has he ever read my heart? "'My friend, he must not left be alone an instant. "'You say he is going to speak with me this evening. "'Yes, madam, probably to arrange for your protection and comfort in England. "'We shall see,' replied Aouda, suddenly becoming pensive. 
Throughout this day, Sunday, the house in Seville Row was as if uninhabited, and Phileas Fogg, for the first time since he had lived in that house, did not set out for his club when Westminster struck half-past seven. Why should he present himself at the Reform? His friends no longer expected him there. As Phileas Fogg had not appeared in the saloon on the evening before, Saturday the 21st of December, at a quarter before nine, he had lost his wager. It was not even necessary that he should go to his bankers for twenty thousand pounds, for his antagonist had already had his check in their hands, and they had only to fill it out and set into the bearings to have the amount transferred to their credit. Mr. Fogg, therefore, had no reason for going out, so he remained at home. He shut himself up in his room and busied himself putting his affairs in order. Passepartout continually ascended and descended the stairs. The hours were long for him. He listened at his master's door and looked through the keyhole as if he had a perfect right to do so, and as if he had feared that something terrible might happen at any moment. Sometimes he thought of Fix, but no longer in anger. Fix, like all the world, had been mistaken in Phileas Fogg and had only done his duty in tracking and arresting him, while he, Passepartout, this thought haunted him, had never ceased to curse his miserable folly. Finding himself too wretched to remain alone, he knocked on Adeoda's door and went into her room, seated himself without speaking in a corner, and looked ruefully at the young woman. Aoda was still pensive. About half-past seven in the evening, Mr. Fogg sent to know if Aoda would receive him, and in a few moments he found himself alone with her. Phileas Fogg took a chair and sat down near the fireplace, opposite Aoda. No emotion was visible on his face. Fogg returned what exactly was the Fogg who had gone away. There was the same calm, the same impassibility. He sat several minutes without speaking, and then in bending his eyes on Aouda, "'Madam,' said he, "'will you pardon me for bringing you to England?' "'I, Mr. Fogg,' replied Aouda, checking the pulsations of her heart. "'Please, let me finish,' returned Mr. Fogg. "'When I decided to bring you far away from the country which was so unsafe for you, I was rich, and counted on putting a portion of my fortune at your disposal. Then your exercise would have been free and happy, but now I am ruined.' "'I know it, Mr. Fogg,' replied Aoda, "'and I ask you in return, "'will you forgive me for having followed you, and who knows, "'for having perhaps delayed you "'and thus contributed to your ruin? "'Madam, you could not remain in India, "'and your safety could only be assured "'by bringing you to such a distance "'that your persecutors could not take you.' "'So Mr. Fogg,' resumed Aoda, "'not content with rescuing me from a terrible death, "'you thought yourself bound to secure my comfort "'in a foreign land. "'Yes, madam, but circumstances have been against me. "'Still I beg to place the little I have left at your service.' "'What will become of you, Mr. Fogg?' "'As for me, madam,' replied the gentleman coldly, "'I had need of nothing. "'But how do you look upon the fate, sir, which awaits you?' "'As I am in the habit of doing. "'At least,' said Aouda, "'want should not overtake a man like you. "'Your friends, I have no friends, madam. "'Your relatives, I have no longer any relatives. "'I pity you, then, Mr. Fogg, "'for solitude is a sad thing. "'With no heart which to confide your griefs, they say, "'though that misery itself, shared by two sympathetic souls may be borne with patience. They say so, madam. Mr. Fogg, said Aouda, rising and seizing his hand, do you at wish once a kinswoman and friend, will you have me for your wife? Mr. Fogg at this rose in his turn. There was an unwanted light in his eyes and a slight trembling of his lips. Aouda looked into his face, the sincerity, resistitude, firmness, and sweetness of this soft glance of a noble woman, who could dare all to save him whom she owed all. At first astonished, then penetrated him. He shut his eyes for an instant, as if to avoid her look. When he opened them again, I love you, he said simply. Yes, by all that is holiest, I love you, and I am entirely yours. Ah, cried Aoda, pressing his hand to her heart. Passepartout was summoned and appeared immediately. Mr. Fogg still held Aoda's hand in his own. Passepartout understood, and his big round face became as radiant as the tropic sun and its zenith. Mr. Fogg asked him if it was not too late to notify the Reverend Samuel Wilson of Marylebone Parish that evening. Passepartout smiled his most genial smile and said, Never too late. It was five minutes past eight. Will it be for tomorrow, Monday? For tomorrow, Monday, said Mr. Fogg, returning to Aida. Yes, for tomorrow, Monday, she replied. Passepartout hurried off as fast as his legs could carry him. End of chapter 35 Read by David Russell for lit to go available on the web at fcit.usf.edu. Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne. Chapter 36, in which Phileas Fogg's name is at once more at a premium on the change. 
It is time to relate what a change took place in the English public opinion when it transpired that the real bank robber, a certain James Strand, had been arrested on the 17th day of December at Edinburgh. Three days before, Phileas Fogg had been a criminal, who was desperately followed up by the police. Now he was an honorable gentleman, mathematically pursuing his eccentric journey around the world. The papers resumed their discussion about the wager. All those who had laid bets for or against him revived their interest, as if by magic the Phileas Fogg bonds again became negotiable. And many new wagers were made. Phileas Fogg's name was at once more at a premium on the change. His five friends at the Reform Club passed these three days in a state of feverish suspense. Would Phileas Fogg, whom they had forgotten, reappear before their eyes? Where was he at this moment? The 17th of December, the day of the James Strand's arrest, was the 76th day since Fogg's departure, and no news of him had been received. Was he a dead? Had he abandoned the effort? Or was he continuing his journey along the route agreed upon? And would he appear on Saturday, the 21st of December, at a quarter before nine in the evening on the threshold of the Reform Club saloon? The anxiety in which, for three days, London society existed cannot be described. Telegrams were sent to America and Asia for news of Phileas Fogg. Messengers were dispatched to the house in Seville Row morning and evening. No news. The police were ignorant what had become of the detective Fix, who had so unfortunately followed up a false scent. Bets increased. Nevertheless, in number and value, Phileas Fogg, like a racehorse, was drawing near his last turning point. The bonds were quoted, and no longer at a hundred below par, but at twenty, at ten and five, and a paralytic old Lord Arlemy even bet in his favour. A great crowd was collected in Pall Mall and the neighboring streets on Saturday evening. It seemed like a multitude of brokers permanently established around the Reform Club. Circulation was impeded, and everywhere disputes, discussions, and financial transactions were going on. The police had great difficulty in keeping back the crowd, and as the hour when Phileas Fogg was due approached, the excitement rose to its highest pitch. The five antagonists of Phileas Fogg had met in the great saloon of the club. John Sullivan and Samuel Fallentin, the bankers, Andrew Stewart, the engineer, Gauthier Ralph, the director of the Bank of England, and Thomas Flanagan, the brewer, one and all waited anxiously. When the clock indicated twenty minutes past eight, Andrew Stewart got up, saying, "'Gentlemen, in twenty minutes the time agreed upon Mr. Fogg and ourselves will have expired.' "'What time did the last train arrive from Liverpool?' asked Thomas Flanagan. "'At twenty-three minutes past seven, and the next does not arrive until ten minutes after twelve. "'Well, gentlemen,' resumed Andrew Stewart, "'if Phileas Fogg had come in the 7.23 train, he would have gotten here by this time. "'We can, therefore, regard the bet as one. "'Wait, don't let us be too hasty.' replied Sammy Fallentin. You know that Mr. Fogg is very eccentric. His punctuality is well known. He never arrives too soon or too late, and I should not be surprised if he appears before us the last minute. Why, said Andrew Stewart nervously, if I should see him, I should not believe it was he. The fact is, resumed Thomas Flanagan, Mr. Fogg's project was absurdly foolish. Whatever his punctuality, he could not prevent the delays which were certain to occur, and a delay of only two or three days would be fatal to his tour. "'Observe, too,' added John Sullivan, "'that we have received no intelligence from him, "'though there are telegraphic lines along this route.' "'He has lost, gentlemen,' said Andrew Stewart. "'He has a hundred times lost. "'You know, besides, that the China is the only steamer "'which could have taken from New York to get here "'and arrived yesterday in time. "'I have seen a list of the passengers, "'and the name of Phileas Fogg is not among them. "'Even if we admit that fortune has favoured him, "'he can have scarcely have reached America. "'I think he will be at least twenty days behindhand, "'and that Lord Abermill will lose a cool five thousand. It is clear, replied Gaither Ralph, that we have nothing to do but present Mr. Fogg's check at Barings tomorrow. At this moment, the hands of the club clock pointed to twenty minutes to nine. Five minutes more, said Andrew Stewart. The five gentlemen looked at each other. Their anxiety was becoming intense, but not wishing to betray it, they readily assented to Mr. Fellington's proposal of a rubber. I wouldn't give up my four thousand of the bet, said Andrew Stewart as he took his seat, for three thousand nine hundred and ninety-nine. The clock indicated eighteen minutes to nine. The players took up their cards, but could not keep their eyes off the clock. Certainly, however secure they felt, minutes had never seemed so long to them. Seventeen minutes to nine, said Thomas Flanagan, as he got the cards which Ralph handed to him. There was a moment of silence. The great saloon was perfectly quiet, but the murmurs of the crowd were outside were heard. With now and then a shrill cry, the pendulum beat the seconds, which each player eagerly counted as he listened with mathematical irregularity. Sixteen minutes to nine, said John Sullivan, in a voice which betrayed his emotion. One minute more, and the rager would be won. Andrew Stewart and his partners suspended their game. They left their cards and counted the seconds. At the fortieth second, nothing. 
At the fiftieth, still nothing. At the fifty-fifth, a loud cry was heard in the streets, followed by applause, hurrahs, and some fierce growls. The players rose from their seats. At the fifty-seventh second, the door of the saloon opened, and the pendulum had not beat the sixtieth second when Phileas Fogg appeared, followed by an excited crowd who had forced their way through the club doors, and in his calm voice said, Here I am, gentlemen. End of chapter 36. Read by David Russell. For Lit to Go. Available on the web at fcit.usf.edu. Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne. Chapter 37, in which it is shown that Phileas Fogg gained nothing by his tour around the world unless it were happiness. Yes, Phileas Fogg in person. The reader will remember that five minutes past eight in the evening, about five and twenty hours after the arrival of the travellers in London, Passepartout has been sent by his master to engage the services of the Reverend Samuel Wilson in a certain marriage ceremony, which was to take place the next day. Passepartout went on his errand enchanted. He soon reached the clergyman's house, but found him not at home. Passepartout waited a good twenty minutes, and when he left the reverend gentleman, it was thirty-five minutes past eight. But in what a state he was! With his hair in disorder, and without his hat, he rang along the street as never man was seen to run before, overturning passers-by, rushing over the sidewalk like a waterspout. In three minutes he was in Seville Road again, and staggered back to Mr. Fogg's room. He could not speak. "'What is the matter?' asked Mr. Fogg. "'My master!' gasped Passepartout. "'Marriage! Impossible! 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 For tomorrow! Why so? Because tomorrow is Sunday! Monday!' replied Mr. Fogg. "'No! Today is Saturday! Saturday! Impossible! Yes, 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 yes!' cried Passepartout. "'You have made a mistake of one day. We arrive twenty-four hours ahead of time, but there are only ten minutes left!' Passepartout had seized his master by the collar and was dragging him along with irresistible force. Phileas Fogg, thus kidnapped, without having time to think, left his house, jumped into a cab, promised a hundred pounds to the cabman, and having run over two dogs and overturned five carriages, reached the reform club. The clock indicated a quarter before nine when he appeared in the great saloon. Phileas Fogg had accomplished the journey around the world in eighty days. Phileas Fogg had won his wager of twenty thousand pounds. How was it that a man so exact and fastidious could have made this error of a day? How came he to think that he had arrived in London on Saturday, the 21st of December, when it was really Friday, the 20th, the 79th day only from his departure? The cause of the error is very simple. Phileas Fogg had, without suspecting it, gained one day on his journey, and this merely because he had travelled constantly eastward. He would have, on the contrary, had lost a day had he gone in the opposite direction, that is, westward. In journeying eastward, he had gone towards the sun, and the days therefore diminished for him as many times four minutes as he crossed degrees in the direction. There are 360 degrees on the circumference of the earth, and these 360 degrees multiplied by four minutes gives precisely 24 hours. That is, the day unconsciously gained. In other words, while Phileas Fogg going eastward saw the sun pass the meridian 80 times, his friends in London only saw it pass the meridian 79 times. This is why they awaited him at the Reform Club on Saturday, and not Sunday, as Mr. Fogg thought. And Passepartout's famous family watch, which had always kept London time, would have betrayed this fact if it had marked the days as well as the hours and the minutes. Phileas Fogg then had won twenty thousand pounds, but as he had spent nearly nineteen thousand on the way, this pecuniary gain was small. His object was, however, to be victorious and not to win money. He divided the one thousand pounds that remained between Passepartout and the unfortunate Fix, against whom he cherished no grudge. He deducted, however, from Passepartout's share the cost of the gas which had burned in his room for nineteen hundred and twenty hours for the sake of regularity. That evening, Mr. Fogg, as tranquil and phlegmatic as ever, said to Iota, Is our marriage still agreeable to you? Mr. Fogg, replied she, It is for me to ask that question. You were ruined, but now you are rich again. Pardon me, madam. My fortune belongs to you. If you had not suggested our marriage, my servant would not have gone to Reverend Samuel Wilson's. I should not have been apprised of my error, and... Dear Mr. Fogg, said the young woman. Dear Euda, replied Phileas Fogg. It need not be said what the marriage took place forty-eight hours after, and that Passepartout, glowing and dazzling, gave the bride away. Had he not saved her, and was not entitled to this honour. The next day, as soon as it was light, Passepartout rapped vigorously at his master's door. Mr. Fogg opened it and asked, What's the matter, Passepartout? What is it, sir? Why, I've just this instant found out what? That we might have made the tour of the world in only seventy-eight days. No doubt, returned Mr. Fogg, by not crossing India. But if I had not crossed India, I should not have saved Ayuda. She would have not been my wife. And 
Mr. Fogg quietly shut the door. Phileas Fogg had won his wager, and had made his journey around the world in eighty days. To do this he had employed every means of conveyance, steamers, railways, carriages, yachts, trading vessels, sledges, elephants. The eccentric gentleman had thought throughout displayed all his marvelous qualities of coolness and exactitude. But what then? What had he really gained by all this trouble? What had he brought back from his long and weary journey? Nothing, say you? Perhaps so. Nothing but a charming woman, who, strange as it may appear, made him the happiest of men. Truly, would you not for less than that make the tour around the world? The End Read by David Russell For Lit to Go Available on the web at fcit.usf.edu